Good morning, and uh, welcome to the August 11th City Council meeting. Uh, I think we've got everybody here. Uh, is uh, Councilor Woodson on the phone? Madam Clerk? Not yet? Okay. Well, we, uh, we uh, welcome you here, and we're going to begin today's meeting the way we begin all our meetings, and that's by asking God's presence uh, on our proceedings. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, Councilor uh, Valerie Thompson if she would lead us in prayer, please, ma'am. If you and by the way, we have new technology today. It may be terrible. Just push it once. Yes, ma'am. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your love, your kindness, and your tender mercies. And Lord, we pray for supernatural strength for this council and all of our city leaders. Father, we pray that you would raise us up so that we can be leaders of great courage. Father, help us not to fear the decisions we have to make because you, Lord, are with us. We ask that you will help us to be strong and of good courage and that we will always observe to do according to all you have commanded us. I pray, God, for this agenda that has been set before us. Father God, we pray now that you will give us wisdom and knowledge so that whatever decisions we make will be for the betterment of this, compu this community. Father God, we pray for health. We pray for mental health. We pay, pray for spiritual health. And Father God, we pray for physical health in this, this time of this pandemic. Father God, and we will be careful to give you all the praise and honor that you so rightfully deserve. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Counselor. And if you would, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And before we, before we even entertain the minutes, I do want to point out that our uh, resident uh, uh, counselor slash pastor slash community activist slash do a little bit of everything, Valerie Thompson, this is going to be her last meeting, I believe. And uh, we have been very, very fortunate in this community that she uh, agreed to step forward and uh, fill the unfillable shoes of, uh, of our former mayor pro tem. Uh, and uh, we just, we, we, we will, we, uh, in this COVID environment, it's difficult to do a proper send off. So we're gonna bring her back so that we can give her the proper uh, kudos that she has earned and that she deserves. But in the meantime, the rest of council would join me at least in giving her a round of applause for a job well done. Okay, I will uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion and a second to approve the minutes. Uh, any edits that need to be made? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Minutes are approved. All right, we'll give you a quick update on, uh, <clears throat> on COVID-19. It's, um, it, it, is, it is truly our new normal. Uh, and it is, uh, it's getting harder, I think, to try to anticipate a date when we won't, will no longer have to, uh, have to be as careful and mindful of our daily activities as we are right now. I will tell you, though, that this community has been rallying uh, behind the CDC guidelines, uh, the six feet social distancing effort. Um, I see it out in public. It's becoming second nature to people. Um, the, uh, the hand washing, uh, the, the uh, people paying attention to their own, uh, if they start having a, a, the sniffles, thinking, well, maybe for other people, I need to get checked and make sure I stay, stay inside. And then also these, these masks. Uh, I, I really want to thank the folks that live in this community for taking it seriously enough to commit to wearing a mask if you cannot maintain the six feet of social distancing. <clears throat> Our numbers continue to go up. We have had very robust testing in Muskogee County. Uh, we, um, we, are, we are currently, or as of yesterday afternoon, we are at 4,780 individuals that have tested positive since the beginning of, of this pandemic. Uh, we have uh, we had 32 new cases yesterday, uh, and that's that's down. We had had 63 the day before, and we were as high as 90 or 80 the next day. And and we don't focus a lot on the number of positive cases that come out every day, mainly because of the way they are reported. Uh, 
some of the some of the test taking sites may send all that batch in at one time, and so even if it has taken place over a period of three days, you may get most of them uh, most of the results posted on one day. <coughs> we are uh, we are also watching what we call our our new day, new cases seven day rolling average, and that's simply a way for us to try to monitor the trend line. Uh, our our seven day rolling average uh, as of today is is 59. So that's the average daily case we've had for the last seven seven days. <coughs> one of the more uh, significant numbers that we track, and and one that um, we're really doing our best, and our hospitals are doing a great job. All right, we are um, our amazing technology staff has has been able to get us back up and running. And I got I got to say too, before we go on, um, the fact that these individuals were able to turn this civic center into a council chambers that has done more than just help us get by. It has helped us keep the citizens informed. Uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll grant them a swing and a miss every now and then. So we just appreciate them getting it back on. And to council, uh, as we go forward, they were, uh, uh, IT was able to create a sit, uh, system where if you hit your button, your mic button, your name will pop up in the order. That way we'll be able to keep you all in order, just like the old system. So hopefully it'll work uh, a little smoother as we go forward. Um, we were in the midst of a, um, a COVID-19 update. I will circle back to that and mention that uh, we have had 98 uh, deaths in Muskogee County uh, for, of our residents. Uh, and that's, you know, one is a tragedy. Uh, 98 is, is absolutely dispiriting. So, uh, but I'll also tell you some good news. Um, our hospitalization rate, which we monitor very, very closely, because in our estimation, that's the most critical aspect of what we're doing to kind of deal with the pandemic. As long as our resources are capable of handling any kind of demand, uh, we feel reasonably good about our ability to take care of our citizens. And uh, the rolling average on that has really decreased over the last, uh, just over the last couple of weeks, it's gone from uh, close to 150. Uh, individuals, 150 individuals being diagnosed with COVID-19 that were hospitalized, down to about 73, 74. So um, while that doesn't signal that we're out of the woods, I think what it has done is it's brought that plateau down a little bit because it seems like every few months we, or excuse me, every several weeks we have a triggering event, whether that's a holiday like Memorial Day or the 4th of July weekend or whether it's um, the relaxing of standards, opening up the business, encouraging people to get back out and, and get back to some degree of normalcy, um, it, it is followed by a spike. Uh, my, my concern is, and I know the concern of, of people throughout Muskogee County, is that as we move closer to the opening of schools where children are going back uh, into the classroom environment eventually, um, I think realistically you can expect another spike. Uh, simply because, not because the children are susceptible to this, this virus, but because they become carriers as they go home and they interact with their family members. So we would really urge you to continue to do the things you're doing. Y use a mask, but use it correctly. You don't have to wear it all the time. Just use it when you're within six feet of another individual who is not cohabitating with you. Uh, if you go out and about, do so wisely. Do, think, think about what you're doing. Think about how you impact the people that are shopping next to you. And remember that the mask is not so much to protect you. It is a communal response that helps us protect one another. And if everybody participates, there's nowhere for that virus to go. So uh, also, I want to ask the uh, city manager uh, if, if he will touch on some really good news that the uh, that we were able to roll out yesterday, and that is the availability of some CARES funding uh, to help uh, help mitigate some of the financial impact uh, of, uh, of of this this medical disaster. Uh, and and Columbus, Georgia, has been afforded, and this links, by the way, to the census because they go uh, they give us uh, access based on per capita. So we're going to have about $34 million <clears throat> when it's all said and done that we will be able to apply towards COVID-related uh, costs 
uh, that are not reimbursable through another agency or another, another means. Uh, but what it does mean is it means that um, a lot of the expenses that we've gone through, Deputy City Manager Goodwin has done an incredible job. Every time we've had a, a, uh, an employee that, that has been diagnosed, we have sent a SWAT team of cleaners in there. And they've gone and sanitized and cleaned everything up. But that's expensive. So the good news is some of these costs will, will be able to be reimbursed. Mr. City Manager, did you want to touch briefly on the, uh, I know you have a CARES update. It might be a good time to bring it up and go through it. If you hit your button. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do have a CARES update uh, on my agenda, and uh, it absolutely would be a good time to bring it up. And uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin um, is leading the team um, to make sure that um, we uh, receive every penny of CARES Act funding that might be available to Columbus, Muscogee County. And um, she will mention the other members of the team and she will talk to you about where we are in terms of um, pulling the trigger, if you will, on the, the CARES Act funding. So I'm going to yield to Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin at this time. Okay, thank you, Mr. City Manager, and good morning. Good morning, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, for the last couple of months, we have been coming to you and providing you with an update on the, uh, the CARES Act. And uh, just for the viewing audience, uh, for those who uh, may not know specifically what that is, I know it's been an overkill. We've been talking a lot about it. Uh, but the CARES Act uh, is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, uh, which was passed by Congress on March the 27th uh, with over $2 trillion uh, in uh, a relief package that is uh, designed to protect the American people from the public health and the economic impacts of COVID-19. Uh, the team and I have been working very hard on uh, uh, pulling all of this together. And of course, the team includes myself, Deputy City Manager Pam Hodge, and Finance Director Angelica Alexander. Uh, and then, of course, we will talk a little bit more about the uh, additional team members that we have are partners who uh, are heading this now for us. We are now in phase one of the, of the process. And phase one uh, is uh, where we have until September the 1st to, uh, to expend and to submit uh, thing in the amount of $10,248,054. Uh, and so that's our phase one allocation. Uh, and of course, what we have already received, they have deposited the 30% of that, which is the $3,074,416. We have been waiting some time for that. A lot of other communities already had theirs and have submitted their quarterly reports. And uh, because uh, there have been some stalemates, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, but we have finally received it on August the 3rd. And again, all of that has to be submitted uh, and expended by September the 1st, so we have a very aggressive timeline in getting all these things done. That amount was based on the per capita basis of our population of 195,769 uh, persons. Our CARES Act contractor is Media Marketing and More, uh, led by Marquette McKnight. And of course, she has a, a team of people that are working with her and pulling all of this together on the community uh, effort side. And so they are uh, responsible for gathering uh, the applications and from the community organizations and um, in assessing all of that, looking at all of that submitting all of that information to me. So if you can imagine that just on yesterday, uh, we held a press conference. And that press conference uh, was uh, to talk about uh, launching and the, the community aspect of that. And so we launched the website. And I'll share with you that website in just a minute. Um, but we've launched the website. 
uh, and we've opened the application process up to the community. And of course, we're talking about uh, $34 million, uh, and, but in phase one, uh, of course, we're only dealing with the $10 million, uh, the $10 million through September the 1st. Uh, and so what we are looking to do on the community side is there are three categories that we are opening up the grants for. And those three categories include uh, medical and health, community assistance, and uh, small business arts organizations. And of course, on the small business side, that, that on the small business side, that is 100 employees or less. Now, who qualifies or what, qual what expenses qualify? Um, personal protective equipment, the PPEs that you've been hearing so much about, uh, where you have purchased uh, those for employees or customers or and those kinds of things. And so, of course, renovation. If you have retrofitted your business and uh, in order to um, to provide for social distancing, uh, that or safety measures, that qualifies as well. You know, if you've put any shields up or you've had to uh, get automatic doors, those kinds of things are COVID uh, eligible expenses. Uh, COVID-19 testing, mobile testing, contract tracing, any of those things that are health related that are directly uh, impacted as a result of COVID-19, COVID things that you've had to do technology expenses for teleworking purposes, hotspots, VPNs, all of those things are eligible. They qualify. Community assistance that we're talking about includes uh, the uh, food assistance, uh, housing, child care, uh, transportation, funeral expenses, legal expenses, or legal services, health services, uh, medical, mental health, and meal delivery services, and many more. But what we want you to do is to go on to, and at this time, I'm going to ask them to pull our website, uh, pull the website up, and if you will go to columbusga.gov backslash Columbus Cares. Again, our website, as they pull it up, is columbusga.gov backslash Columbus Cares. And I just want to be able to show you what that looks like uh, and so that you know just how easy it is to get there. This is the website that we have, the Columbus Cares COVID Relief Fund. Uh, and as we slowly scroll up, it talks about the application overview. Uh, it tells you exactly what you need to do. Continue to scroll. Uh, it tells you exactly what you need to do. The applications are available starting on yesterday. The deadline to submit those applications is August the 24th at 5 p.m. Remember, we have a September 1 deadline, so it's a, it's a quick turnaround. But this website tells you uh, who, uh, what organizations are eligible to apply, uh, nonprofits, business, medical. Uh, uh, then it talks about which ones are not eligible to apply. It talks about the CARES eligible expenses, continue to roll, uh, that I've just gone through. And then uh, we get down, continue, keep going. And then it talks about the application submission requirements. There is an expense template that we have on this website that will, it's a sample of how you need to submit your information because there is a portal that we've got to input everything in. And so we want to make sure that as you submit your information, it's in the format that we need it so that we don't have to come back to you or have any delays. So there's a template that you need to look to use. And then you see a button that says online application. That's when you go in then to submit everything online. And it's really just as easy as that. Um, you visit the, the website, uh, read and review the overview and the facts, download the template, determine which category you fall in, uh, gather all of your supporting documents, uh, visit the CARES website uh, and complete the application and then submit by August the 24th, not later than 5 p.m. Okay? All right, thank you for that. I do want to pause because, you know, oftentimes 
when we solicit or have a process for applications um, and we have a deadline, um, organizations will call the mayor's office or call my office because it was August 24th at 5 and they call on August 25th at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. and we tell them we can't help them. That's right. I, I don't want small businesses to sleep through the $34 million. Um, small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you if you contact Deputy City Manager Goodwin or me or anyone else at 501 on August 24th, we're sorry. Yeah. It's too late. It's too late. And so small businesses, shame on you if you don't go to this website, whether you're a barber shop, a hair salon, mm -hmm. a barber shop, a hair salon, an insurance agency, mm -hmm. whoever you are, you need to go to the website. There's $34 million. Um, and if you've purchased all this stuff that the deputy city manager has mentioned, and you don't go to the website, and you don't try and take advantage of the reimbursement by August 24th at 5, yeah. um, and then your friends who have a barber shop or hair salon or insurance agency or other businesses mm -hmm. take advantage, and they're telling you about it on the 25th, you're too late. So I just I wanted to pause mm -hmm. to really place emphasis Thank you. that people will hear us and go to the website. That's right. Also, I want to mention that um, expenses that are uh, already reimbursed by any other source, such as an insurance, uh, such as insurance or donors or uh, CARES funding in a, from another source, is not eligible. So again, those things that have already been reimbursed uh, and are eligible under another source are not eligible at this point either. I also want to thank our IT department so, for working so closely with us and with the team to, um, to get this up and going very quickly, and um, they did just that, and so we thank you for that. Go back to the presentation. The timeline again that we are working under, of course, on the on August the 6th, a media advisory went out regarding the press conference, which was held on yesterday. Again, the September 1 is our deadline for submission, uh, phase two submission date. We are still, it's still yet to be determined. We are waiting for them to tell us when that will be, but December the 31st is when the CARES Act's uh, funding closes out. So December the 31st, unless they come and give us something uh, different, some new uh, instruction. Now, we did have a significant update uh, that um, was from the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget that actually noted that public safety salaries, including payroll and associated benefits um, for law enforcement, fire, EMS, and EMA, uh, were appear to be eligible for 100% reimbursement. We are, again, continuing to research that to make sure that um, there, there are no gray, gray areas there, but we believe that to be the case. They, they're telling us that. But again, continue, just remember that we have been um, coming to you, and it seems as though every time we come to you, there's a new change or a new update because this process and this is very, very fluid. And so uh, as we get information, new, new updates, new direction, we, as we promised, will come to you and let you know. The state's response um, uh, or the request by the, associate, uh, by the Association of City and County Governments and the Georgia Municipal Association on July 31st, they transmitted a letter to Governor Brian Kemp requesting that that September 1st deadline for the expenditures in phase one of the, of the CARES Act allocation be extended to coincide with the date his office sets as phase two. Again, we still don't know what that date is, but we know it's past September the 1st, and we, uh, because they know that their cities and counties need more time uh, because of this rushed effort, they are now 
um, pleading uh, to move that date. And the request was made in part as a result of the delays in opening the CARES app web portal and the delay in providing the educational seminars. We have literally, uh, the portal just opened last week or so, uh, and we have been able to uh, do a test submittal of one uh, line item, one expenditure, and to date, uh, we still have not received any kind of approval or uh, response on that, so which lets us know the process is going to take some time, particularly for us to put in $34 million plus dollars of, uh, of expenditures. It's going to be lengthy. It's going to be very, uh, it's going to take some time. And, the, uh, and so our initial intent was to be able to come back to this council and to uh, let you know what those expenditures were let, before we submit anything. But because of the delay in the time, again, it's going to be August the 24th before we receive the applications. That team, Media Marketing Moore and her team, has to go through them before they then submit them to the city so that we can do our part and in inputting into the portal and then having everything in by September the 1st. We will not be able to then come back to this council and ask for approval or to share with you prior to submission what those expenses are going to be. And so the city manager is just going to proceed with the submittal and he will brief council after the fact unless otherwise um, uh, otherwise uh, coming from the mayor and directed by the mayor and council to do otherwise. Ms. Goodman, so, excuse me. Yes. Uh, mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Deputy city manager, would you uh, send to council sort of a snapshot of the website and other information we may need in case we get a call from a business that's interested in looking at this further. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you. we will. Thank well, you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and let me just uh, say, Mayor and Council, um, you know, I, I told you at the um, initial presentation that we'd bring all of this back to you and, uh, and you will give us to go to proceed um, thinking that immediately after the initial briefing with you that we would get the information we need, uh, the deposit from uh, the state of Georgia, that did not happen. And so uh, we just got our first deposit like last August flat, 3rd. On August, August 3rd. 3rd. <laughs> and, and we got, we received a deposit of roughly $3 million dollars on August 3rd, which is, I believe was on a Friday, mm -hmm. um, that was deposited into our account, but yet there had been and still has been no training. Uh, I received uh, an email from uh, Georgia Municipal Association that I haven't forwarded to staff yet, mm -hmm. that they are going to set up training on August 10th, okay? Well, we have a September 1 report deadline, and we've got a get feedback from the community with their reimbursable expenses, put it into the system, and try and do it. If we hear from them by the 24th, then we got to go to work getting it all into the system for September 1 report date. We don't have another meeting or an opportunity to brief you. So we are going to do as we do sometimes with grants. We proceed with a grant when the deadline is time sensitive, and then we come back and ask you for authorization to apply and accept after the fact. And, and so I'm, it appears that's what we'll be doing in yeah. this instance. And I'm just going to point out the city manager has been working, as has the city attorney, through the um, County Attorneys Association. And I have also been in contact with the governor's office, but also through GMA and ACCG. And this has been, we've been anticipating this deposit since about June because they were talking in June about the process and, the, and, and how it would begin to be deposited. And it kept, they kept trying to work kinks out, and it took a long time before the money was readily made available. And uh, the, the good news, though, I think, is that we have known this is coming, or, or we were hoping it was coming. So we've been, we've been putting together, under Deputy City, uh, City Manager Goodwin's leadership, uh, some potential uh, expenditures that would be eligible should be eligible for reimbursement. Uh, so, with the next two waves, I think we'll we'll still have time for some of the uh, some of the small businesses and some of the individuals to be able to 
be able to get their requests in. But, but don't wait because this is going to fly by. It's an incredible blessing and incredible resource that we've been given access to. And we need to try to get folks in this community to take advantage of it. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Deputy City Manager Godwin, I just want to make sure I heard this right because uh, it's, uh, again, extremely important. So walk through what you just said about the small businesses and their opportunities to uh, apply as it relates to the CARES Act criteria? Yes. Uh, again, uh, let me just mention uh, that deadline is August the 24th at 5 p.m. So the expenses that will qualify, and of course this is just a sample of those that qualify, if they go onto the website they'll see the whole, a whole list of those things that qualify, but what I have mentioned uh, are the uh, personal protective equipment uh, that I'm sure everybody has bought into and have, uh, have used for employees, customers, and the like. Uh, renovation cost, if you've retrofitted uh, your business or rehabbed in any way that provides for social distancing or safety measures for your people as a result of COVID-19. That does not mean if you go in and something that you had planned to do anyway and you're going to paint up, paint the building, or uh, you want to just spruce things up, that has nothing to do with COVID. But if you specifically have made uh, uh, repairs or retrofit things uh, as a result of that in order to be able to social distance, uh, then those things are eligible. COVID-19 testing, to include mobile testing or uh, contract tracing, any of those things that have taken place are eligible. Technology expenses for teleworking to include uh, computers or hotspots, VPNs, uh, and there are more things on the list. Community assistance in the medical side of that includes, and even from the churches, you know, we've had a number of churches that uh, I think it, almost every week uh, have feeding programs where they do provide food uh, boxes for, uh, for the community. Those things are eligible. Uh, again, food assistance, it's eligible. Housing, child care, transportation, funeral expenses, legal services, health services, utility assistance, uh, medical, mental health services, meal delivery, case management, and the list goes on. Again, all of these things have to have taken place. I'll say, had it not been for COVID, you wouldn't be doing these things. Well, this is, look, this information is extremely invaluable. It, um, like the city manager said, uh, I mean, this is a, a one-time opportunity to, to really help a lot of folks, a lot of small mm -hmm. businesses. I'm just wondering if we're, you know, our approach, are, are we reaching out to these small businesses? I mean, I'm concerned about getting the message out there versus them coming to us or listening to this presentation, this council meeting, and going to a website. Are we being proactive in trying to get the information out in the community? Because I just feel like somebody, this is good stuff. I mean, somebody's going to miss out on this. And like well, the city manager said, that opportunity won't come back. Well, let me tell you, our partners, the Media Marketing and More, and her team have been making personal phone calls. They have gotten um, the business license information uh, from um, our revenue department, so they have a list of all of that, and they have been beating the bushes. Uh, they have been, just yesterday, when the portal, uh, when the application and the website opened, uh, by the end of the day, I believe they had 12 already. Uh, that had submitted and so the word that they were getting this out even before the website opened and so they have been uh, beating the bushes uh, and um, and making this thing work so we have it all on social media the um, the uh, 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 press conference that we had on yesterday of course is out there and we ask people to uh, to like it to look at it to share it for others to see it uh, and although the website, this is where it starts, this is where you have to go, the word has already gotten out. And so we will then, uh, if you go to just even the Columbus uh, Consolidated Government Facebook pages, if you will please go there and share the information. Uh, that's assured that people will get it. And social media is one of the best mediums in order to make that happen. And so, yes, sir, 
they have been, they've been getting the word out. It's not just a matter of what you hear here today, uh, but we have a whole other group working on this, and that's what they're, that's their purpose. Well, and, if you would be so kind I, enough, if you would provide a little summary uh, PDF to the council members that we can sure. post and get out the information. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, this is, it's invaluable. It's this is some good stuff. And, yeah, yes. it is. And if, if I may, uh, Councillor, um, that's why I, I want it. I want you and the community to understand the timeline that we have been working with. We did not have information, and so uh, this is a, a short time frame that we are uh, working in. And uh, the finance director just provided me some of the organizations that um, they've uh, reached out to, and and. And there's a reason media marketing and more is a marketing media organization and we figured they would they know how to get information out to the community and would be able to assist us in that regard and that's one reason we're proud to partner with them but organizations outreach some of them i'll just mention continue continuum of care partners e-news chamber of commerce Coronavirus Recovery Fund, the Columbus Rotary, news conference uh, with all the media, social media, e-news to master database, United Way executive director to get the word out, WRBL, Ministerial Alliance, Housing Authority uh, are just a, a few. And, um, and, and Councilor Davis, I, I do agree with you. The reason I tried to be dramatic earlier and I mentioned small businesses like barbershops and hair salons and other small agencies. I don't want them to think that they don't have an opportunity. And, and the deputy city manager um, uh, over finance and plan development uh, sent me a note a second ago and said, make sure they understand that the $34 million includes all of the city's expenses too. Mm -hmm. So if you don't apply and you don't want it, we're going to eat it up. The 34 million. So just know that uh, from setting up this room as a council chambers, all of this equipment, we went and bought. Mm -hmm. You know, and and those people that repaired the system uh, in that short notice, those are city employees. They're not hired employees. And you saw that they were able to get us back up because they are technically savvy. They know what they're doing, but. Um, we are looking at every opportunity to collect from a city standpoint, and we hope that small businesses, especially small businesses, will do the same and make sure you take advantage of your portion of the $34 million, uh, because the city government, you heard me say that every penny, we are going to take advantage of getting the city government's portion mm -hmm. of the $34 million. So small business out there, do what you got to do, and we're going to do what we can to get the word out to everyone. Call your friends, post it on your social media, Facebook, so that your friends and the businesses that you patronize that are small business will know that this money is out there, and they will go to the website, and they will do what they need to do to take advantage of the opportunity. August 24th at 5 o'clock p.m., not 5.01, they got to get it done. So we hope you'll help us, all of those listening by television and those here in the audience today. Mr. Mayor, you know, we talked about trying to do something for our community to stabilize it going through this as far as economic development goes, and especially with the, uh, the small businesses that have been impacted. But you know, back in March and April and May, a lot of people were on the edge. I mean, they were on the edge getting evictions, uh, just being put out of business, and Probably some of them are out of business today, but uh, this is an opportunity, and I just hope that we do our best to get this message out. We will, and I think that our partner was chosen in large part because of their success rate at getting kind of these types of messages out to the community and because they know so many of the nonprofits mm -hmm. and so many organizations that have been out there working. Uh, Councilor Thomas. It would seem to me, Mr. City Manager, that if I have a small business and I'm not sure that my expenses qualify, I ought to go ahead and submit those because all they can do is say, no, you don't, that doesn't qualify. So don't, don't submit 
uh, just because you think maybe, you know, uh, it's not, it doesn't qualify, go ahead and submit it. And uh, it may be that it does qualify, um, but don't miss out because you've said, well, you know, maybe it doesn't. Right. Very good advice. Absolutely. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal, and it's uh, it's going to be important, and we think we've got the right partner that's going to get the word out. Um, <clears throat> I think if it's if, if somebody misses out on this, it's because they weren't looking for opportunities. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna do our best. I also had told Councillor uh, House that I would make mention of one very important uh, aspect of the masks that people have been wearing throughout the community, and remind people that the government does not have, and we're not allowed to uh, under the current executive order, <clears throat> a mandatory uh, ordinance or requirement that masks be worn. However. Business owners that own their facility and own their business, they have absolute control over their domain right there. So just because we don't have a mandatory mask ordinance, one of the things I've been pleased to see is a number of businesses are posting signs that you must wear a mask to, to enter their store and enter their place of business. So if you see those, get your mask before you go in. Don't, don't get in a shouting match with the owners. They're just doing what they think they need to do to protect their protect their employees so all right and then the one other thing we wanted to mention today and I know we had a lot of stuff that we're just kind of walking through real quick but um, the uh, the census you know, we, we keep talking about <clears throat> how important it is for the census but I mean there are still a lot of people not just in the hard to count areas but there's still a lot of people that have put it off if, if you're in this room and you've got your cell phone and we hit a boring patch that you're waiting on that one hot topic, just go to uh, 2020census.gov. It takes about five minutes, and it'll walk you right through it. Uh, there are so many things that we're trying to do and try to get across to people in this community. The door knockers are going to be out, but, I mean, this, this pandemic that has impacted everything is making it a little difficult for them to get out in a timely manner to try to find the hard-to-count areas. So, so I beg you. Uh, you have no idea how significantly important it is that we get as close to an accurate count as we can. It impacts so many things. I'm going <clears> to <throat> turn it over to our city manager. Uh, I know he, I, I was unable to attend the last meeting, but I know there's some things that are going to be going on within the city government. And then he also has, I think, another announcement to make uh, on my agenda. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to attend a virtual uh, census meeting uh, several days ago, and um, and we talked about the fact that we are only at like 55.6 percent um, of our population has responded uh, to the census, 56 uh, percent, and that is not good and so we were trying to come up with some creative ways that we could get uh, people to go ahead and uh, complete the census and participate so that it will benefit Columbus Muskogee uh, County and uh, one thing that I offered uh, to the group was to create uh, a CCG Columbus Consolidated Government uh, Census Friday and, uh, and I'll briefly explain, uh, and I've asked um, our HR director, Aretha Hollowell, and our planning director, Rick Jones, to work together to put together uh, CCG Census Friday, but also put it together in a way that we challenge the rest of Columbus, Georgia, to join us in participating on that day that we can get our percentage up in terms of completing the census. And so, Mayor, I, I'm actually going to request uh, that you, Mayor, um, do a proclamation um, for um, Census Friday, uh, Columbus, Georgia Census Day. Um, and so that proclamation in my mind would proclaim Friday, September 4th, 2020, um, as Columbus, Georgia's Census Day and would call on all private businesses, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, agencies, and every citizen uh, to join us in Columbus, Georgia, 
census day. And so uh, we would expect uh, these uh, businesses, nonprofits, or agencies to do something that works for them. And what I've uh, proposed that will work for the CCG uh, is that our day, September 4, 2020, would be CCG Census Friday. And so at 12 noon to 1 o'clock on Census Friday, and we know that Monday the 7th is Labor Day, it's a holiday for us, but from 12 to 1 uh, on Census Day, September 4, 2020, we would call on our employees to spend that hour completing uh, the census online. And I've asked the HR director to do some kind of something that would, if they've already completed the census or if they do it on Friday, September 4th, between 12 and 1, that they can go online and um, through a survey monkey or some other whatever they set up can respond to say that I have already completed the census prior to this date or I have completed the census uh, during the designated hour of 12 to 1. And, um, and once they go online or sign the form out where they don't have access to a computer, uh, then uh, all but emergency and essential personnel would be allowed because we appreciate them and it's a part of employee appreciation uh, from uh, one to five, they would take the rest of the day off. Um, but they will take it off and they're having completed the census would be their ticket for that rest of the day off. Uh, and so um, they will get that rest of the day off and then they're off Monday and it makes for a long weekend and it want to show them that we appreciate them, but we want to get our census numbers up. And so we would be um, calling on private businesses to do their own census day. For example, they could give an extra 30 minutes for lunch to allow that 30 minutes for their employees to complete the census. And then I really want it to be some kind of competition. So we've got CCG um, census day that Friday. Uh, and based on the percentage of our employees who respond saying they've already completed or completed it on that day, let's say we've got 3,000 employees. If we get 50% of our employees to say that they completed the census, and let's say another organization, whether it's Synovus or AFLAC or W.C. Bradley, um, you name it, uh, based on the school district, based on the percentage of their employees, if they can outperform us from a percentage standpoint, then we know who has been most successful on Columbus, Georgia Census Day in completing the census. And all we're trying to do is get the number up. And, and I'll end with this, Mayor, to remind all of us that the census is about the distribution of more than $675 billion in federal funds to states cities and counties, $675 billion. Uh, it is used to reapportion the House of Representatives, determine how many seats uh, Georgia will get. It is about redistricting the boundaries of congressional and state legislative districts and city council and school board districts, redistricting. It is about determining if we, Columbus, Georgia, will be the second largest city in Georgia or if we will fall to the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth position. And I submit to you because of a com competitive spirit in me, we are the second largest city, and we, through this census effort, will remain the second largest city in Georgia. And I hope, Mayor, you will do the proclamation, and I hope that uh, Columbus area businesses will join us in Columbus, Georgia Census Day on Friday, September 4th, uh, 2020. Thank you, Mayor. We will absolutely issue that proclamation and we'll absolutely issue that challenge to all of the businesses uh, in, uh, in, in Columbus, Georgia, to try to encourage their folks to get on. Uh, it's, it's so simple. Uh, and, and, uh, and try to make sure we get an accurate, an accurate count. Uh, I'm also going to allow the city manager to call up uh, uh, another item uh, on my agenda because he's the gentleman's been patiently waiting. Uh, uh, Mayor, um Thank you for um, 
allowing uh, me to call this up to your agenda. Uh, I've got, um, uh, I've, I've come today to request confirmation uh, of uh, a candidate for Director of Public Works Department. And um, I know that a number of Public Works employees are here. And so it's my honor, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, I'm pleased to bring forward Ms. Mr. Michael J. Criddle, C-R-I-D-D-L-E, as my choice to fill the position Director of the Public Works Department. He's present this morning and accompanied by his wife, and I'm going to ask them to step forward. And I know the Public Works employees, they can come towards the front, uh, those who are here um, at this time. And so, uh, Mayor, just to tell you and the public something about uh, my candidate, um, Mr. Criddle uh, comes to uh, the CCG with over 13 years of experience with a solid and diverse background in all aspects of public works, personnel management, economic development, community planning, FEMA, flood plain management, budgeting, site development, and project management. Uh, he has proven experience with complete streets, transportation collaborations, zoning and master planning as well as policy development. Um, Mr. Criddle successfully completed the largest economic development project in the history of West Georgia as a project manager uh, for Kia Motors manufacturing and related suppliers. Uh, he developed a GIS location marking protocol for public utilities for accuracy and time to maintenance of stormwater management systems virtually eliminating localized street flooding in high-prone areas. Uh, he negotiated a complex public-private partnership with uh, Great Wolf Lodge for regional tourism attraction, the first of its type in the region. Uh, he worked and utilized a local tax allocation district to redevelop and expand the LaGrange Mall. Uh, Mall. He directed and completed the rebranding and digital marketing campaign for the city of LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, his knowledge, background, and experience in public works operations and project management is what we need at this time in Columbus. Um, his background and experience will allow for a good transition and will prepare us for where we need to go in the years ahead. He is currently the public works director for the city of West Point, Georgia. Uh, he currently serves as president of the Middle Chattahoochee Water Coalition and as a governing board member of the ACF, that's the Appalachia, uh, Cola, Chattahoochee, and Flint Stakeholders Group. Uh, he is a, uh, F, an FF, FAA certified instrument rated uh, private pilot. Uh, he comes highly recommended by my selection team composed of Deputy City Managers uh, Lisa Goodwin and Pam Hodge and our Finance Director Angelica Alexander and our Human Resources uh, director Rita Hollowell. So I believe uh, Michael will be a good fit for our community. Uh, he and his family reside uh, currently in LaGrange, Georgia. He's a graduate of Lu Louisiana Tech University where he earned a bachelor's degree in English and a minor in engineering. Uh, he, is also, uh, he also received his graduate degree from Troy University in public administration. Uh, he and his wife uh, Cornelia of 31 years they have two sons. And so, Mayor and Council, uh, I am proud uh, to present for confirmation for the position Director of Public Works, Mr. Michael Critter. So I'm requesting your approval and confirmation at this so time. So motion to approve? Motion and a second to approve. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Mr. Criddle, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. I look so forward to coming to the second largest city in the state of Georgia. Thank you. And I um, hope I can bring some innovation and positive change and look forward to the feedback I get from the, the mayor and council. And again, thank you for your vote of approval, and I, I really appreciate the show of support. It means a lot. Looking forward to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I know you need to get back to work. <laughs> 
you're joining a pretty impressive team, and we look forward to working with you. All right, and that is, uh, at last, we're through my agenda. And uh, I'm on, Mr. Uh, City Attorney. All right. What's your agenda? Thank you, Mayor. Again, welcome, Mr. Criddle. Look forward to working with you. The We've got several hearings to get through, Mayor, this morning. The first couple are zoning public hearings. First property up is 0.89 acres at 5377 Veterans Parkway. It's going from neighborhood commercial to general commercial for a veterinary clinic. It's recommended for approval. Michael Wright is the applicant. Is he present? Okay. Let's see if anybody around the council table has a question or anybody in the audience. Anybody at the table with a question? I don't see any. Okay, um, anybody in the audience want to be heard on this petition? This is for a veterinary clinic, Michael Wright. Okay, Mr. Wright, you don't have to make a presentation. We're going to vote on this rezoning in two weeks at a 530 council meeting. Thank you for being here. Mayor, next item up is 0. .16 acres at 530 Walnut Street. Going from general commercial to residential multifamily one for neighbor works, residential use. It's recommended for approval. Anybody from neighbor works present? All right, sir. Anybody around the council table have a question or anybody in the audience? Doesn't appear okay. so. All right, we will bring this back in two weeks for a vote. Thank you for being here. Next items, Mayor, are continued mm -hmm. items. These are, again, open for discussion. The first one is an ordinance sponsored by Councilor Barnes that would allow the Public Safety Advisory Commission to review closed investigations of the police department and issue subpoenas in connection with investigations. Uh, the item following that is an ordinance sponsored by Mayor Pro Tem Allen that would simply allow the Public Safety Advisory Commission to review all use of force reports in a closed investigation. But they're all up again for public discussion and, and Mr. City Attorney, before we turn it over to public uh, for discussion, um, I want to make a quick comment. Um, these, uh, both of these ordinances were on first reading in two weeks ago. And I think there's some very passionate discourse uh, from the audience and also from folks around the table. But I have to clean up, uh, clear up some uh, misinformation. Um, during the discussion two weeks ago, uh, I didn't get engaged in the give and take because I have too much respect for the folks that sit around this, this table, as well as for the folks that were here talking about this, this item. But there was, some, um, there was some insinuation that somehow the administration and or the staff uh, withheld information about a, um, an excessive use of force video that made its way onto, uh, onto social media. And uh, I, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments about that. One, uh, when that video was viewed by my office, we immediately took action. We contacted the chief and the city attorney. And upon learning that uh, uh, from uh, it, it was a fireable offense, although it was determined that suspension uh, would, would work uh, for this particular case, city uh, attorney had mentioned that because there had already been some uh, disciplining uh, due to that, that incident, there could be no further or should be no further uh, punitive action against the employee. Uh, so we did what we could do, and we that very next day we sent it up to the GBI. Uh, well, we had a an executive session, and so I, I can't go too deeply into the details uh, with this group. In fact, there were about 20 people in there. It was all of us, and uh, and we we walked through uh, a couple of videos that had hit the uh, social media airways, uh, and um, we gave an accounting, a pretty detailed accounting, of what happened in this video. I think the only difference from what was in the paper this morning with what we had put out 
was, was a, a, an article, a, a piece about a taser. And quite frankly, that's because that taser was not either, either wasn't in the clip I saw or I didn't see it. Regardless, it still rose to a level where we felt like we had to take action. But when I looked at the paper this morning and it had words in there like misled by the mayor, uh, I was lied to, that I cannot let slide. Uh, to, to cast aspersions on my character uh, is, um, is just wrong. What I would encourage the writer of that article uh, to do is what they should have done in the first place, and that's ask anybody else sitting around this table. Uh, they got one perspective on that meeting, and I feel completely confident that if any other individual is asked about don't ask me, go ask some of the other council members, ask some of the staff that was there. Did we walk through and did we tell what an egregious uh, sight that we beheld? In fact, once it was over, we encouraged council and the others to go out online, find that find that video and then view it for themselves. So um, I would encourage the, uh, the author of the article to do just that and, uh, and maybe try to find some corroboration for the, for the uh, comments that were made uh, about, uh, about the mayor withholding any information. I think also if you ask these, this council, they'll tell you that this administration, we don't always get it right, but we, we work very hard to try to make sure the council is kept up to date uh, and, and knows what's going on so that they aren't blindsided when they, uh, they are in the, in the public. So I just want to make that statement, wanted to make sure that, that I set the record straight, that there was no, uh, there was no misleading by the mayor, uh, there was no misleading by the city attorney, there was no misleading information given by anybody, and there was certainly uh, nobody that was lied to. So with that, we'll move forward. Uh, Councilor Barnes. Well, first of all, I take exception to that. Um, you, with what the paper wrote, you need to see the person who wrote the article. But yes, I take exception to that, and let me tell you why. From what I heard and from what I saw are entirely diametrically different accounts of what happened. Now, you can take a personal if you want. I, I hate it if you do, but I'm just going to call it like it is. I was not informed. It was not until somebody from the community informed me and I looked at the video that I saw the full extent of what occurred. Now we have council meetings, regular council meetings, and we also have called meetings when there's something important. At any time within that, from what I heard and from what I saw, it could have been corrected. And that's my statement and I stand on it. And it comes from, and I'm a member of council. And so I, I said exactly what I meant and what occurred. I did not know anything different until I saw the video. And I'm not going to stand up here and argue with you because I'm, you know, I'm telling the truth and I'm just not going to get in a, a give and take. But it highlighted, highlighted to me that there's a, a big gap, a chasm, when a member of council cannot know and has to have, to have somebody from the community to tell me to look at the tape. This administration could have said something about the tape. No one, no one from this administration mentioned it. It was the community. And we have scheduled meetings, and we also have called meetings. It could have been a called meeting. And so, you know, this is not uh, anything directed against you. It's directed against the process, and I made that plain. And so I'll say again, I don't lie. And whatever your interpretation is, you need to call the paper. I told them exactly what I felt and exactly why I think we need to have a Public Safety Advisory Commission with subpoena power. And you want to know something? When, when clothes get cleaned, it's not solely the washing powder, it's the agitation. And so I do see now where um, whenever there is a use of force after the closed investigations, then now the Public Safety Advisory Commission is going to be informed. That's a step in the right direction. It's not where I would like it to be, but full transparency. And, and you know, I like, to, I like to say something else, because I figured something like this was going to come up. You know, I figured uh, no one likes to, instead of accepting something which occurred and correcting it, um, I hate that we have to go through this back and forth. That's one. But you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, 
was very prophetic in a lot of the things that, um, that he said. And one of the things that he said was that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I'm a sincere believer in that because I love this country and I love Columbus, Georgia. And another thing that he said is that he spoke about the fierce urgency of now. The fierce urgency of now. And that is what you're seeing nationally on TV, a multicultural, multiracial, where people are, are, are screaming for transparency. And to be perfectly honest with you, Mr. Mayor, I said last time that my heart and my soul feels good because of this. Because the fierce urgency of now is not going to go away. And there will be other individuals and other organizations because of the fierce urgency of now is going to want to have transparency. And so that's my, um, I hate that you're taking it personally. And if you do, that's your call. I can only control the message that I send. I can't control how you receive it. And I reported exactly what I experienced. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Councilor Crabb. Thank you. <clears throat> I was called by the reporter. And um, my recollection was we did have an executive session where we did discuss this. And I was not sure if that was an executive session that um, Mr. Barnes was in because he had been missing some meetings due to the health of his wife. And so I wasn't, I couldn't remember if he was there. And um, so I brought that up. I also brought up in our conversation with the reporter that I felt that our policy and our procedures work very well because in, in, um, in effect, you subpoenaed what had happened. You had, you know, you contacted the police chief and wanted them to go further. So I believe that we have subpoena powers already in effect, and in this particular case, they worked very well. And I mentioned that to the reporter, and I mention it again here to this body. Thank you, ma'am. Hit your light, sir. Councilor Barnes. Um, the information about all this was in the community. The individual called me about it. And, and this was all out, I mean, in other organizations that had called me, asked me if I knew about it. And I could only report what I heard. And so when I saw the video, it, it gave me a complete, I, I, was, I was really disappointed that when I found out exactly what happened, that in the interim of time, it was an expanse of time, that that wasn't corrected or we were not um, called to look at the video. We, we were not alerted to look at the video. This is really what happened. And so I heard from the community that it was also a little aggression on the part of the officer, but you need to look and see at what actually happened. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, that issue. Okay, well, I, and I don't want, and I pref I'm not going to get in the back and forth, Councilor. No, I, not, I, not I, I won't do that, but I will tell you that um, when, the, when the incident happened, there was a lag uh, before I saw the video. From the time I saw the video to the time we took some action was about 24 hours. Uh, and then the executive session took place just a couple of weeks later. So as soon as I knew about the video, we acted on it. And, uh, and I have no doubt that when I started it, um, I probably did say it's just it, it, that um, we have three videos to show. The first one is not good. We had a guy that got a little aggressive. And then we went into talking precisely, blow by blow, in the description I gave of what happened. Uh, in fact, some of the things that I mentioned happened in that video didn't make the paper this morning. But um, we gave a detailed account. And we finished by saying, I'm not sure you can it would do it justice. You need to try to get a copy of that tape and go on 
on and, and take a look at it. Uh, I, I, and I wasn't taking it personal, sir. I just, it's just if, if somebody says that the mayor misled them, and I know I didn't mislead anybody. I know I gave a full account of every piece of information I had at the time. And uh, so that's, that's not personal. That's just clearing up a piece of misinformation. Ms. City Attorney. All right, Mayor, on these items uh, three and four, the floor is open for discussion. If anybody wants to come up and discuss either ordinance for or against, please um, raise your hand, get in line, and then um, socially distance as you wait and give your name and address when you come up for the record. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. And City Council members. Could you give your name and address, please? Pamela Watson. And, and your residence, I'm sorry, it's for the record. 8078 Wellington Trace, Midland, Thank Georgia. Thank you. I am Pamela Watson, the chapter president of the Columbus chapter of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated. As we all have seen for many, many years, and most recently, the senseless shootings and killing of people of color. In the name of justice and fairness, as women, mothers, professionals, and active citizens, we must come together as a community. We must hear, listen, respect one another, yet have the courage to come to a resolution that will benefit all citizens. We can no longer remain silent, and perhaps while it's not at your doorsteps, impacting your loved ones. Personally, it impacts us all. We support the ordinance, and we ask that you will vote yes to the resolution. Therefore, let's be proactive, not reactive, as it relates to policing. We are a better community for this. We can do better, and let's have the courage as we stand and unite in solidarity to make our community better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. City Councilors. I am Vicki Williams Wiley, 1448 Grove Park Drive, Columbus, Georgia. Two weeks ago, women representing 13 national African American organizations stood before you, asking you to seize the opportunity to make a positive change locally. Today, I return and stand representing those women once again. We are mothers, college-educated, professionally employed citizens of Muskogee County. We stand in the gap for our children and the safety of our families. We do not come with a personal agenda separated by any zip code or political party. We come for the love of our children and our families. We have been long standing residents in this community and we support the positive initiatives of this community. Today I am proud to stand once again for Sisters United to ask for your support of the resolution and the ordinance 
that Councillor Barnes has presented. My counselor failed to respond to me several emails and phone calls. I'm sure that was because he was extremely busy trying to figure out what to do. So I stand before you today letting you know I will continue to stand. We will continue to support. We will continue to look out for what's best for our community as a whole, not one particular group, but as a whole. So I ask you, counselors, House, Thomas, Garrett, Woodson, Allen, Crabb, Thompson, Huff, Davis, vote for what's best for this community not a particular group of people, not a particular political party, but what is best for our community. Thank you in advance for your support. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Justin Good morning. Allen, 4381 Burt Drive. So, Mayor, you said you didn't withhold any information and that you didn't lie, but you told them that it was a little force. You keep saying a little force. That's a lie. If you saw that video, you know that was excessive force. A slight push is a little force. If you were handcuffed and I came behind you and I punched you in your back, you would think that was excessive force too. So let's start with the word play of a little force. Then the video released October 19th, right? His father was elected to be put on the review board on November 1st, right? If I read the article right, it was Councilwoman Crabb that selected him. Is that correct? I, the, so can I Councilor not? Crabb. He was reinstated on November 1st. So are you the council person that reinstated him? Or is that a group process? It's I nominated him. The process and doesn't then work. We, and then we... Um, all voted on yep. him. The process doesn't work. If you saw the video, right? Saw the video, you said you received in, what, 24 hours? After October 19th, which is October 20th, I'm sure you would have had time to notice that, dog, they have the same net last names if y'all would have paid attention. Maybe they're related. I can't go anywhere without me saying, anybody in Columbus, Georgia, that says their name is Allen is probably gonna be asked, who are you related to? Period. The process does not work. That's why we are here. The process does not work. I what, have what there are city are... council members on here to this very day that will inbox you because of what you post on your Facebook page, but will not bring that information to the public. I have had Councilman Walker has inboxed me a number of times on different topics but will not post them in public. We are tired of the behind closed doors meetings. We are tired of you all putting out a little bit of information and not letting the people know what's really going on. We still have not seen that full video. We still have not seen that full video. Put it on CCG TV. Put the full unedited version of that video on CCG TV so that we can determine whether it was a little force or not. We are sick and tired of being treated less than. And we are, and, and, and if you're asking who am I talking about when I say we, anyone that lives south of Macon Road, period, unless they live on the other side of Brown Avenue. It's, ama it's amazing how all we want is the opportunity to request documents and videos after city council obviously has missed it so that we can present it to, 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 our, to, to the citizens of Columbus. And you all don't want it to happen. And before I leave, I want to make sure that I stand here and boldly say this that I am calling for the immediate resignation of Chief of Police Rick Bourne immediately. 
We cannot continue to have these lapses and our CPD and our other enforcement agencies continue to go on. And he's going to continue to collect money until October or unless he wants to extend his retirement again. It is time for you all to be the leaders that you all say you are and to lead this city in the right direction because we are tired of it and we will continue to show up and speak out. And I know y'all only see me, but there's a lot of us. And we all stand behind one message, and that's we want better for our city, for our entire city. My name is Justin Allen, and I'm full support of the ordinance and resolution brought by Pop Barnes. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you, sir, Mr. Allen. And, and by the way, nobody in that meeting said a little force. I don't you, know where you, you got your You just information. said it just now that it was no. a little force. You just said it. No, we gave a full description of exactly what happened. But what I'm saying thing. is you, you just there. said during this meeting that now, it was a little force. You just said it. What? Just watch the no, scene. No, and, and that's inaccurate. I said he got a, he, we had a guy get a little aggressive, and then we went, into the, we went into the details of what he did, and we, we expounded on the fact that it was an egregious act, that it didn't rise to the level of the standards for the CPD. But he wasn't fired. Is he getting paid right now? He, he on leave with pay with a uh, paid leave? He's on administrative. My understanding, he's on administrative leave until the GBI finishes their investigation. He should be fired. What investigation do you need when a old man, again, mayor, if that was you, handcuffed, slammed into a police car, punched, then slammed onto the ground so hard that your tooth was knocked out? I and y'all said with these smug, smug, smirks on y'all face? It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Once again, we will continue to show up to these city council meetings, we will continue to show up to these polls, and we will continue to put facts, facts, in the face of the residents so that we can make our own decisions. Thank you, sir. Councilor Garrett. Am I on? You're on. Since my name has been brought up, I want to bring clarity to this. I think it is very important, and I think it will shed light on how wonderful our Office of Professional Standards is. I was falsely accused on Facebook of representing an officer who was accused of something that did not involve force. It was a white officer and an African-American officer who happened to be under investigation and left our department before their investigation was complete. That officer had 5% window tint. If you aren't familiar with what window tent means. I know what window tents are. Mr. Allen, I'm speaking right now, and we, you know, I have the right to speak just as you do. Yes, sir. There was 5% window tent. As, if you're aware of window tent, the maximum allowed is, is in the 30s to 40s. The lower the number, the less you can see someone. This officer and her husband have both served faithfully in our department. Officer Blackman did a thorough investigation, bringing them before the Officer of Professional Standards. I did not represent this person. I talked to our city attorney, and there's no need for representation in an Officer of Professional Standards conduct meeting. My partner at the time, Travis Hargrove, in case it had to go to court, did take the case. I sat there as any other counselor can in the back of the room without uttering a word. My partner couldn't even utter a word, and the case was dismissed. Officer Blackman did a wonderful job. There was a lot of evidence that this was a, a meritless claim. There was no force involved. She pulled over an officer who had windows so tinted, there was no way you could tell the race. That was impossible based on the, co uh, the color and the darkness of these window tints. So I'm not gonna post on Facebook, Facebook about something that would besmirch another officer's name or besmirch our department, but I think it's, it is important for people to know that is how thoroughly our department investigates. And the officer who accused the person and was under investigation left our department before their investigation was completed because they had other issues that they were being faced with. The officer that, that was represented by my firm in an advisory capacity only, we received no money. In fact, the PBA actually uh, said they paid attorney's fees for that, which was not true. Uh, they told the officer that the officer was attorney fees were paid for when it was asked as a favor if we would come pro bono just to give her advice. I could not say anything. I sat in the back of the room, and no, I don't get into Facebook wars. 
and I think most of the counselors do not get into Facebook wars, but I want to clear my name, I want to clear the name of our department because Officer Blackman did an incredible job. It was something that was clearly not a very, a very well brought investigation. He did an absolutely fantastic job of getting to the bottom of it. There was a full hearing process and it could have been appealed and it wasn't. The officer who brought the accusation is no longer with the department and his, inve that, his investigation was never concluded because he left prior to that. Thank Thanks, you. Um, again, you know, this is why subpoena power is so important uh, for this review board. Um, I would like, you know, to pull the the file for and, and if that you know is a part of these powers i'd like to pull that file you know and see what were the details that led during that you know that happened during that stop because i guarantee you we don't know all of them and that is again why we want the subpoena power we still have not seen this full video we need subpoena power because obviously city council misses a lot of things and does I'm not gonna say withhold information, but the full story is not always told. And I did uh, misspeak or mistweet, mispost when I said Councilman uh, Garrett uh, represented uh, that officer. I do apologize for that misrepresentation of information. However, I would like to see all of the facts from that case. I would like to see all of the facts and all, not just use of force statements, but complaints, disciplinary actions, and use of force statements. Because we could get use of force statements and we'll say it's validated. But if, if there's a use of force statement backed by complaints, okay, backed by other information that shows that this is a continual nuisance, why would we not want to get the bad officers out of CPD? Why would, if city council missed something, why would we not want our citizens to bring up this information so that we can know what is going on in our city. I guarantee you, I live south of Macon Road. Guarantee you, every officer is not a great officer, but there are some highly, highly respectful, respectable officers just as there are highly respectful, respectable city council members. But again, we are not afraid to bring the truth to light. I'm not afraid to stand here before each and every one of you, and I'll say my name, my address, and my phone number time and time again, because I am not afraid to stand for my brothers and my sisters that live in Columbus, Georgia. I will not be quiet. I will not sit down. And I will not be pushed aside. Again, I stand in full support of the ordinance and resolution brought by Pop Barnes. Hope you all have a blessed day. Councilor Crabb. Thank you. <clears throat> we take, us counselors take um, the, elect, you know, the appointment of people onto committees extremely seriously. I do a lot of vetting um, on the people that I choose and if I want to reinstate. Um, the fact that there's a relationship between the officer and one of the people on the review board, um, I, don't, I don't see that as a problem unless they, have, they will be given subpoena power. As, as it is right now, I look at it as a positive because we want people on that review board that understand the inside workings and, and of public service um, and law enforcement. So it's a positive that they're related. If, however, they were given subpoena powers, then I think that something would be different. He would have to recuse himself and certain things like that during a subpoena. But right now, there is no conflict of interest in my mind. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, my name is Byron Hickey. I reside at 532 Honolulu Drive, Columbus, Georgia, 31906. 
I'm a retired police detective with the Columbus Police Department. After serving over 30 years uh, with the department, um, and I currently serve as an appointed by C Councilman Barnes on the Public Safety Advisory Commission. And as I stated two weeks ago, I am in support of subpoena power for the uh, commission. I'm here today to speak to you again about the subpoena power issue and also the incident that led to this moment. Um, it seems to be um, a trust issue from council, members of council, as well as members of public safety as to uh, whether or not the members of this advisory, public safety advisory commission, uh, whether or not we are qualified to have subpoena power. Well, uh, I stated my position on that two weeks ago, uh, but I'm here today to tell council this. You have options as council men and women. You have options, and one of those options is under the city charter, you all have sub subpoena power. You have that. And all it takes is one council person to request to review any deadly force and use of force issues with our law enforcement community. Just one of you. All you have to do is request to see that video. Request to see it as soon as it happened. I think that the mayor should be informed when these things take place by department heads to let them know that we had a situation last night. We had an officer who had to apply deadly force. And immediately, there should be a call meeting for all the, for the mayor and council into executive section to review that footage so that you all will be, have firsthand information about what actually took place during that particular incident. Then, after you review it, and they tell you that it's under investigation, that means that with it being held in executive section, you're not privileged to talk about it outside there, and they can keep you informed, and you can help oversee the process of what's taking place with that investigation. You can still call people and ask questions back into that executive section and where you can hammer this thing out. But the way it's happening now is that these incidents take place as it did in my 30 years of law enforcement and the information never gets to council. But council, you have that authority. You have the power to say, I want to see the video. Don't let nobody tell you what happened. Don't depend on that. You have constituents that you represent in these districts, in the city. Ask to see it for yourself. Formulate your own opinion because you're all educated and you know right from wrong. Look at it. Then ask questions. Oversee what they're doing. And if you request some information and they refuse to give it to you, exercise your subpoena power to get it. It's real simple. That's an option that you have as counsel. And what we're going to do as citizens, we're going to hold each of you accountable for what the actions that, 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 that is taking place with these different departments. We're going to hold you all accountable because you're obligated to your constituents to make sure that what is being done is being done properly and correct. So, do we have dispar disparities inside the department? We sure do. They're, they're there, it happens. Which brings me to this. In 2014, Officer John Allen Jr responded, got a call from his mother, who was at home, sick, that somebody was trying to break into her home. Police responded. They gave foot chase, apprehended two juveniles. These two juveniles was taken into custody in handcuffs. When Officer John Allen Jr., who was a part of the Fugitive Squad unit at the time, got on the scene, 
upset about what happened, went in and allegedly struck and choked the juveniles. He was later placed on administrative leave, the case given over to the GBI, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation found that he had violated the law and charged him with violation of oath of office, two counts, which is a felony, and two counts of simple battery. He was charged. Let me repeat that. He was charged. Two counts of violation of oath of office, one count each of the people of the, 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 of the two juveniles, one count each of simple battery. He got out on bond, hired our attorney Stacy Jackson to represent him. In this case, with Officer Clay Watkins, clear on the video, a person is in his custody, and he strike and beat him while he's in handcuffs. And it goes through this process, up through the chain of command of, 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 of six supervisors, all the way to the chief of police. He's a corporal, it went to his sergeant, it went to a lieutenant, it went to a captain, it went to a major, it went to the ch assistant chief, then the chief of police. And through that chain of command, they said that six days suspension was enough. Now, I've raised a question here to you all today. John Allen, Jr., responding, puts his hands on two juveniles in a car, handcuffed, bring in the GBI right away. The GBI charges him. He later resigned from the police department. This situation with Officer Clay Watkins, GBI was not called. The question is, why? That's why we need oversight people. The question is, why wasn't the GBI called for that? Then, it wasn't until it were released nine months later, the video hit social media that everybody thought, oh, this happened? Oh, let us call the GBI. Oh, so now we're calling the GBI in to investigate. The question that you need to be asking yourselves as counselors, why wasn't the GBI called initially? That's, your, that's a huge concern. That's a huge disparity. Very huge. So now, the GBI is called in once again to investigate this. The question is now, is Clay Watkins going to be charged? I don't know what their fine is going to be. But I think that if you charge John Allen and he resigned from the department, that we need to be consistent in what we're doing to make sure that if anybody strike and beat people in handcuffs, they need to be brought up on the charges as well, just like John Allen was. That's what needs to happen. But to say to the city attorney that, you know, we've already applied disciplinary action, six days, but John Allen was charged? And we say that, well, he's already been disciplined, so we can't come back and discipline him again. Counsel, let me say something to everybody here today. You all have the right and the authority, along with the, the head of public safety, Mr. Mayor, to call for someone to be terminated in this city government. You all are the governing body of this municipality. You have the right to do that. And I'm going to say this. That was a huge concern on the part of my fellow uh, uh, law enforcement uh, community that when this video got out, that they were concerned that the city was going to get in an uproar and that worried about innocent police officers getting hurt and, and citizens getting hurt, rioting and all this stuff. Well, let me say this to everybody. We don't need to kill the messenger. We need to deal with the person who did this because those are the type of people that we don't need on the police department. People who are out here 
commend these types of acts, this type of behavior, we don't need those type of police officers on the police department, uh, police department or in law enforcement. Because when they do something, you're absolutely right. Their actions can have a negative effect on other officers, for other officers, and as well as citizens. Let me say something to y'all right now. We're sitting on a powder keg, and we're one YouTube video away of this city. People coming in this city want to burn it down. But we got a chance to get it right now. I thank Chief Bourne for his 49 years. But we got an opportunity now to set our standards even higher with a new chief of police. We got this opportunity. And, and you, know, you know what's said all the time, uh, that I hear a lot of time about Columbus, Georgia, that we always miss the mark. We always miss the mark, the opportunity to seize a moment and to do the things that are right, to put things in place so that we can assure our citizens that we're on top of things and doing things the way that they need to be done. But we always miss the mark. So I'm here today to say to you, Let's be consistent. Let's do the right thing. That's all that I'm saying. If you treat one officer one way, treat the other one the same way. Don't charge one with violation of oath of office. I'm sure if beating somebody in handcuffs in John Allen case was a charge of violation of oath of office, do y'all, and I'm asking counsel, do y'all think that Clay Watkins doing the same thing? Is that a violation of his oath of office? Then it raised the question again, is this. Did this happen to John Allen because he's black? And Clay Watkins got favor because he's white? See, these are the things, these are the questions that are out here in the community that people are talking about. They see the different treatment. This is what people are saying. But you as council people, you all can correct that. You got subpoena power. You can, oh, you can be the oversight committee. Oversee these investigations. Mr. Mayor, when, let it be a policy that when there's a deadly force or use of force, you want to see it. Bring it into the, the executive session. Share it with council. Review it. Hold these people accountable. Because you know what? We're going to hold y'all accountable. And we're going to do it at the polls. Because you have an obligation to your constituency to do right by them. But I say that, and I leave everybody with this. All we want as a community is great performance, accountability, good service, and trust. That's all we're asking. Great performance, accountability, good service, and trust. And if that's asking too much as a citizen, as a taxpayer, then I don't know what else there that, that we could do. But I agree with you, Ms. Crabb, Councilwoman Crabb. You all have subpoena power. You don't need, if, if y'all choose not to give this to this commission, you all take care of it. Oversee it. Oversee these investigations. Make sure that you don't get blindsided by something that shows up in social media. Go into your executive session and talk about it. And if it's an ongoing investigation, no, you can't talk about it in public, but hammer it out back there and make sure that the right thing is being done. Make sure that a black officer is not being treated one way and a white officer is being treated differently. That's y'all responsibility. And we, the public, we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to hold you accountable. So I say that, and I thank you. Uh, uh, once again, for having me and allowing me to speak before you today. And uh, uh, I will hope that uh, we remember that we have an obligation to every citizen in this community, everybody, and that we will continue to strive to treat everybody fair and equitable. 
Thank you very much for your time. And everybody have a blessed day. Thank you. Good morning. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Manager, uh, City Attorney, and City Council. My name is Marvin Broadwater Sr. I live at 3004 Slippery Rock Court, 31909. And I wasn't going to say anything because usually I come here with a prepared statement. However, I heard the mayor say it's such a passionate issue. You got to understand this. I'm a black man in America. I've seen a whole lot. Grew up with Jim Crow. Went to my mother and asked, why can't I use that water fountain? It's not for you. So that's why this is passion. The gentleman before me talked about equality. That's why this is so passionate. For me, uh, uh, Councilman Garrett stole one of my words that I like to use. I'm not going to besmirch anyone's character while I'm here. But I'm going to talk to you about a system, a system that every black man in this country has probably gone through. Police officer comes behind you, blue lights you. Immediately, something goes over you. Let me tell you why that goes over you. Because you've seen videos. You've seen police brutality. Not all policemen are bad. Not all law enforcement are bad. But there are a few, just like anything else. You're going to have some good. You're going to have some bad. I know Chief Bourne. Been to many social events with him. Many. He's tried to do a lot for this community. But he's got some bad apples. And it's the good apples that needs to eliminate the bad apples. I saw a video on the day that we last, that marathon council meeting that you all had. And I sat here at 1030. After all and everybody had left, I saw the last presentation. I saw a lot of, I heard a lot of stats. I heard a lot of conjectures that were made while all these folks were gone. I sat here and I listened. And I called it, I told someone yesterday, it's called a chess move. All that we're asking. In the preamble of this Constitution of the United States of America, it says, justice, domestic tranquility. What you all have to do right now is have transparency with these folks behind me, this community. The gentleman before me said there's a lack of trust. You got to prepare. It's your job. That's why we put you in office. It is your job. It is your responsibility. You got two ordinances. I can't, can't say a bad word here, and I won't. But sit down. Work them out. Then bring the ordinance back to us. You got two ordinances from two different councils. That makes no sense to me. You guys are the ones that represent us. You have constituents out there that will not come to this meeting because they figure that they will not be heard or cannot be heard. So I'm proud of these ladies. That's why I'm standing here. I'm proud of them. This entire arena should be filled. And like the gentleman said before, you got a chance to get it right. I'm going to leave you with uh, something I want to say about Kenny Walker. I asked, I called someone and said, hey, look, tell me about Kenny Walker in case, because I just want to know about it. He said, Brother Broadwater, he's a, he was a son, he was a father, 
He was a church member. He was a husband. And he was my fraternity brother. But his family never truly got justice. So I'm going to continue to stand every meeting that I'm in town. If I got to come to this mic every time to y'all vote on this, I'll do that. But I want you to remember something. I talked to a returning brother by the name of Ben Crump. He said, you know why a lot of folks are afraid of subpoena power? I said, no, I need to know. He said, because in law school, they teach us that you can indict a ham sandwich. I said, come on, man, what does that mean? He said, that means I can indict you if you come before me. So a lot of people are afraid of that. So I said to you, Columbus City Council, do not be afraid. If you got to stand by yourself, go ahead and stand and do the right thing. Thank you all very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adrian Chester, and I reside at 2620 uh, 17th Avenue. This morning, I stand in multiple roles, one as a pastor here in the city of Columbus and also standing uh, as the current president of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance, uh, better known as the IMA. And we do have uh, some of our members and our executive committee here uh, this morning. And so I want to thank you for your time. I want to uh, thank the Sisters United uh, for leading this effort and building a coalition amongst community groups. On June 5th, 2020, in our June meeting of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance, uh, we passed a resolution of support and a position statement uh, that outlined several things in which we desired uh, to see uh, here in our city, and many of our elected and appointed officials have received that document. And if you need another copy, uh, we'll be sure to send that to you uh, so that you know where the IMA uh, stands. And one of those items was the advocating for the Citizens Review Board to be equipped uh, with subpoena power uh, so that this particular body would be able to bring in those who may be in question of a faulty or uh, not applying or complying with policy. And so we stand firm uh, in that resolution and in that uh, way of support, of fully supporting uh, from the clergy standpoint uh, here in Columbus, Georgia, the resolution and the ordinance uh, that is being brought forth by uh, the gentleman from District 1, uh, Jerry Pops Barnes. But as I uh, prepare to finish my remarks, I want to uh, lift up a quote from a classic book uh, by Charles Dickens, uh, which says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief and the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, and it was the winter of despair. That although Dickens penned these words, about two cities long ago, they still hold true in 2020. That no matter how we try to attempt to make Columbus or other cities and paint it in the light of a perfect city that has no problems, we are only one incident away from being on CNN. We are only one incident away from being the topic of discussion or someone from our local community, such as the Kenny Walkers of the world, being a hashtag. And we have an opportunity as a city. You all have an opportunity as the legislative body that has been elected by your respective districts and those two serving at large by the entire city of Columbus to realize that there are people who are crying in the streets with despair and hopelessness. That although we may not have the problems as other persons have within our police department, we are only one incident away. And you have an opportunity with this resolution and this ordinance to let those people who feel 
as if their voices are not being heard to say that through legislation, we hear you, that through legislation, through this ordinance and with this uh, movement that is bubbling up here in Columbus, Georgia, this will be our public record and our public statement of saying that we hear the voice of the voiceless. For at the end of the day, you all are elected not to protect the privileged, but you all are elected to be the voices for those who don't sit at these tables. That you all are elected to be the voice for the voiceless. And I have a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that this vote is going to be divided amongst racial and economic lines on this council. That I kind of have a feeling of who's going to vote yes to support Councilor Pop Barnes and who's going to vote no to support Councilor Barnes and potentially go with the other ordinance. But in knowing that, I want to speak to the heart of our two at-large city councilors. That as you all being elected by the entire city of Columbus, Georgia, it would be a downright disgrace that those who are crying for this particular legislation to be passed, that they do not get the support from one, their immediate counselor, and their two at-large city counselors. And as I've said before, it would be a downright disgrace with our population looking as it looks here in Columbus, Georgia, for those African Americans and those non white bodies who live here and who pay taxes here to know that those who have been elected to represent them at an at-large level does not stand with what they are asking for. So I ask and I plead with you, let us move past our personal preferences or, or what we think the people of, Co of Columbus need, but let us listen. I encourage you all to listen to what the people are asking for. For just as it is a spring of hope for some, this season in which we live in is a winter of despair for many who are oppressed, ostracized, and marginalized. I ask for your full support to the ordinance and the resolution that's being presented by Councilor Pop Barnes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Reverend. Oh, Councilor Thomas. Uh, Reverend Chester, before you leave, could you uh, tell me again the date that the IMA took its position? June 5th, 2020. June 5th? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Alton Russell. I live in Columbus, Georgia, 1425 Autumn Ridge Drive. I've been here um, off and on a long time. Um, first thing is um, I want to make sure that you understand that I am absolutely opposed to this ordinance that gives any committee or board that is appointed by this council subpoena powers. I think that if you go back to what um, retired Detective Hickey said a few minutes ago, he is absolutely 100% correct. You have that power right now. You have that power. Now, I also heard some conversation that, that there was a video and that nobody knew about it and the council or a council member heard about it from the general public. Well, you know what, I, I understand that, but listen, no matter what happens, no matter who it happens to, and no matter where it happens in Columbus, Georgia, somebody, somebody has got to tell somebody. Now, then after that person tells a council member, each and each and every one of y'all, or only one of you, and that council member comes to the public and starts telling us what's going on instead of going to the rest of the council. And if I understand it right, a council member can call a meeting of the council or they can at least get on the phone and call each council member and, and tell 
whatever it is they heard that they heard from this public to make sure that everybody hears about it. And if I understand about that video, if there's a video out there, and somebody from the general public saw that video, and they saw it, that means it's somewhere that anybody can see it. So, you know, we have to accept the responsibility that it's there, and if it's there, everybody has the opportunity to see it. Now, what's done about it, what's done about it ultimately falls on this council. Each council person has that responsibility to report it, to act on it, bring it to the rest of the council or to the police department or whatever has to be done. It's not a secret, it's, and it's not a back room thing. It's something that everybody has that opportunity. So for me to hear, hear something or think something and call my council member, and I do that, well, then if, if it um, deserves to be go further, well, then that council member needs to start doing something about it and set it in action, not just go to the newspaper or not come out in public and criticize everybody because they didn't know. Because, you know, not knowing in this country and in this time with cell phones and pictures everywhere that's available by everybody, there's not any secret that goes on. Somebody's going to know something. Now, saying that, I think that what Detective Hickey said about the responsibility and the subpoena powers of this council is absolutely true. So if something happens and this council does not act on it, well, you know, that's, that's a problem that we can address at the ballot box. It has nothing to do with a, with a citizens committee having subpoena powers because if the citizens committee has subpoena powers, somebody's got to tell them something for them to act on it. There are no secrets. Everybody knows everything if they want to know it. So I think that this council has those powers, subpoena powers, to do and carry out the actions that need to be carried forth. And I don't think that we need anybody else that's appointed by you to have those subpoena powers. Now, the other thing that I have a problem with to some extent, I understand part of it, but to, for this committee, Public Safety Advisory Committee, to have the ability to go back on closed cases, I mean, I don't see any purpose in that. I see no positive in that. All I see is bringing up something from the past that you didn't like what happened, so now you want to bring it back and have it and go forward and, and go through the whole process again. I just don't think that's necessary. There's no positive in that. It's only a negative. So I just don't see why having the power and the ability to go back to a closed case has any merit. So subpoena powers and the powers to go back to a closed um, case. I, I just don't think that's a good thing for the committee, for the Columbus, Georgia, and for a committee to have that ability. Now, as far as, I guess, um, I want to make sure that, 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 and I'm probably, I'm, I'm here, and I'm the only person standing up here, so I'm telling you, I do not speak for everybody in Columbus, Georgia, but I believe that nobody else does either. I'm speaking to this council as Alton Russell, and I'm telling you there are people out there that feel the same way I do, but I'm not here to speak for them. So I'm telling you that Columbus, Georgia does not demand or require this motion to pass and this ordinance to pass. I don't think that there's any requirement that's got to do with whether you're black, green, purple, or white that has to do with how you vote. I think to do the right thing for Columbus, Georgia, is for the council to do the things that you have the ability right now to do, and that's to have subpoena powers. So if you act on those subpoena powers that you have now, you will be doing the right thing. To give somebody else subpoena powers is not the right thing. I appreciate y'all's time. I appreciate you listening to me, and I um, um, hope you will vote no on these ordinances that give subpoena powers to any appointed board or, or committee. Thank you very much. I appreciate all y'all do every day. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Christy Pape. I represent the Fraternal Order of Police, 1222 Broadway here in Columbus, Georgia. I initially had my, my speech 
that I'm, I'll, I'll go over different parts of it, but Mr. Hickey came up and spoke, and he told you a story. He told you a story about John Allen, the officer that did assault those children, and he twisted it. He's one of your public safety committee members, and he's standing here before you twisting the story to fit his narrative. There's a huge difference in Clay Watkins and John Allen. John Allen got in his car and drove to that scene with the intent to harm those children who broke into that home. Clay Watkins was aggressive in doing his duties, trying to get the gentleman's hand open. And just like Lance LaRusso spoke two weeks ago, you could have anything in a closed fist. There's a huge difference in getting in your car, driving to the scene of a burglary, and beating juveniles, and trying to get someone's hand open to make sure they don't have a needle, a blade, drugs that they could take in the back of that police car and OD on. And then we're still responsible for the death of that person when we take them into custody. So I want you to know, as your public safety committee member stood here and told you a story, but twisted it. That is what we worry about. That is our concern, is the people who are on this committee have their own agendas. And what I will urge you to do as council members is if you do have someone who is on that board, do a background check on them, do a financial check on them. If they were a city employee, pull their personnel file pull their internal affairs file, check to see if they filed a lawsuit against the city. Not everybody on that board is there to help you. They have their own agendas. Look at who you put on that board. Do your research before you recommend them. That's what I have to say about that. As far as these ordinances and this resolution, clearly they are hastily written they were written without proper research into state laws and our current policies and procedures that we have. It's almost as if they were a cut and paste from what's being done across the country. Chief Bourne has already shown that everything in that resolution, we already do. Our own policies and procedures caught the incident with Officer Watkins that everybody's talking about. Our chief of police caught it. His policies and procedures. The gentleman's never made a complaint. Supervisor responded to the scene, still didn't make a complaint. Our department caught it and handled it. And what you also need to understand is that officers are human beings. People seem to think, I guess we're robots. We don't have, we don't have emotions. We're not going to make mistakes. But we will. And not every infraction requires a termination. Not every infraction requires for you to go to jail. Sometimes it's a training issue. Sometimes it's training in conjunction with a punishment. And sometimes it's a failure of the department to train you properly. It's not always that officer's fault. In your request for these ordinance, you have that these members attend the Citizens Law Enforcement Academy. That simply is not enough. Our officers endure over 400 hours of training at an academy. They come back to the department. They have four to six weeks of training in-house, and then they go to a field training officer for another eight weeks at a minimum. A Citizens Law Enforcement Academy is not going to teach someone to sit on a citizen review board and to decide what we did or didn't do correctly. We also have to endure being sprayed with pepper spray, being tased, so that we don't abuse those weapons. Are you going to make your committee members go through that process as well, so that they understand? By the time an investigation is closed, as far as in civil, criminal, in, inside the department, that officer's already been punished. 
whether it's they're on admin leave without pay, they've been suspended, they've been ordered to go back through training. This committee that you're wanting to give these powers to are going to recommend another punishment. I don't get to arrest someone multiple times over because I don't like the punishment the DA gave them or a judge handed down. Why do the officers have to endure the same thing? At the time this committee would get these investigations, it's done, it's over. You speak to the ordinance that it creates a climate of mutual respect and partnership between the citizens and the police department. And if you issue the subpoena powers, that will not be the case. Officers are not going to be protected under Garrity, and they will not speak to this board under a subpoena power. Because whether a use of force, if it's a homicide, if it's a justified homicide or not, there is no statute of limitations on homicide. These officers will not speak to you. And that is going to harvest a feeling of distrust between that board, the officers, the citizens, and possibly counsel. There's no reason for a citizen to have subpoena powers when counsel already has it. They also have the Freedom of Information Act. Once an investigation is closed, you can file a Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act and get anything you want on that closed investigation. There's no reason to compel someone to come and try and speak. I'll leave it with this. If the intent of the committee and this council is to improve the relationship with citizens and police, creating another level of prosecution is not the way. If you want to effectively foster this relationship and create a higher quality police department, raise the standard for application, increase our training and our funding for training, give us better equipment not just what we can afford, but the absolute best that is out there so that we don't have body cameras that fail. We don't have body cameras that fall off of our uniform or malfunction, won't turn on. Give us the money that we need to buy the equipment and to have the training. You have this public safety board and what they can do is review things review incidences, re re review use of forces, and make recommendations to policy changes, things we may not see that we're doing wrong, and that's okay. I'm asking that you vote no on these ordinances and this resolution. And if it does go forward, I am asking that there be very strict guidelines on who you choose to appoint to be on this board because I promise you there are snakes and there are individuals that do not have this city's or this department's best interests. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so you can hear me, I'll remove my double mask for a moment, Mr. Mayor, city council members. Uh, I am union forever, 100%. The fraternal order of police is one step away from being kicked out of the AFL-CIO because they create this them and us image when they are supposed to be protecting and serving. They come in here proudly wearing their guns. We count on them to protect and serve. They stood here on the 28th demanding to use the killer chokehold. That's who the fraternal order of police is. Ms. Selamine, would you, would you, I'm sorry, would you state your name and address? Oh, I am so sorry. No, Forgive okay. me. 
<laughs> uh, Teresa Elamine, Southern Anti-Racism Network, 3911 Steam Mill Road. Thank I was just so incensed by the fraternal order of police person. The people we trust with guns to serve and protect, and they treat us like it's them and us. And it needs to stop. That's why people don't trust the police. That's why when that guy put his knee on George Floyd's neck and killed him, the same way all those officers gathered around Eric Garner in New York, put a chokehold on him and killed him. Police kill people. And they say they do it to protect themselves. And then the police chief says, well, we don't train them in the chokehold. We don't. But they demand to use the chokehold. So I say absolutely we need oversight on the police, and I've been saying it for some time. I had to get that part out, because I didn't want the FOP to leave here not knowing that we know what they do in protecting their officers, wrongfully protecting them. Because all those officers that stood there and watched somebody being kneed to death they should have spoke up and said, stop, brother. We don't need to be killing people out here. Same thing in the Eric Garner case. But can you count on the police officers to police themselves? I say, absolutely not, which is why we need, as Councilmember Crabb says, random citizens. You were quoted on calling folks random citizens and why should they have that kind of power before you were sitting up there you were just a random citizen i do believe random citizens are smarter in some cases than many of you up here quite frankly Ms. I mean if you would if you would confine your comments to the, to to me i'm sorry no 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 not to you this is a public hearing yes, mr mayor and i'm very disappointed with you let me say that if you want to comment from me based on the reports that have come out i think that but no these city council members interrupted the public hearing to interject into it crab and Walker Garrett injected into the public hearing. This is a highly unusual process. And I understand the public hearing. Everybody has come here and said what they want to say. Now, please don't try to muzzle me, Mr. Mayor, because I'm going to say what I need to say because I came here to make good trouble. As my friend John Lewis would say, we need to make good trouble. And I came here for that because I have been investigating the Public Safety Advisory Commission for months, months. And the ordinance, Council Member Barnes, I am so proud of you. I'm in District 1, and it's been a long while since I've been able to say I'm so proud of you. And you know we have had our conversations. But what you have done here is standing up in this situation where you're looking to get six votes. <laughs> you know, we have an interesting dynamic here, and I've spoken with uh, Council Member House about it. Who are the six votes, okay? So there's a block of six votes on here. And as people have brought up the race question, all them six votes, white six votes, interesting. Interesting. Four people of color, six white votes. I hope you recognize the gravity of this situation. It is highly politically charged. Like I have not seen people stand up in this town in the nine and a half years I've been here. The subpoena power fundamentally 
changes the Public Safety Advisory Commission. When I listened to City Attorney Clifton Fay, he said they're the only ones who can be given subpoena power. When I heard that on the 28th, I took that as a legal opinion based on him knowing state law and other laws. Well, I do want to thank Tyson Bagley and Pete Timmonsgen. I believe Pete is your appointee, Mr. Mayor. I believe Tyson Bagley was your appointee when you were District 10, and then John House, just like Council Member Crabb, said, ditto, I'll take them too, without anything. See, first of all, people need to understand that this is a patronage system like you wouldn't believe. So let's have a little civic education here. You got 44 boards and commissions that you appoint people to. How do they get on there? They come up and ask you, say, I want that plum, I want to be on that board, I want to be on that commission. Is that how it happens? Because that is fundamentally part of the problem. I know patronage when I see it. In addition to the 44 boards and commission that all of you get to appoint people to, there's also the mayor got his little special things, the unity, diversity, blah, blah, blah commission, and the reentry commission. Those are commissions that are just out there doing whatever. They function on their own. But these boards and commissions, the 44, and I'm speaking so the citizens understand what this is all about, politics. And I do want to thank Tyson Begley and Pete Timmonsgen for spending well over an hour talking to me yesterday. Because I come from the school of no investigation, no right to speak. So I investigate. So I asked <laughs> Mr. Begley, what is the mission of the public safety? Advisory Commission. The mission of the Public Safety Advisory Commission is to recommend resources, public safety practices and policies, and citizens' responsibilities needed to achieve a safe community. Recommend this to the mayor, the council, and our public safety departments, so it says. And there's a long, long list of duties. So people got to understand this Public Safety Advisory Commission. There's something that is interesting. Notwithstanding the duties outlined above, and there's a long list of them, the commission shall have no power or authority to investigate, review, or otherwise participate in matters involving specific public safety personnel or specific public safety related incidents. Maybe this has been revised, but that's what's in here, Mr. Barnes. So it's important to understand that that patronage scheme called the Public Safety Advisory Commission, as I said before, citizens review boards must be independent from elected officials. If you want subpoena power, you want a separate civilian review board, Mr. Barnes. I support this, but I don't think you have the votes, actually. Uh, but 
if you do have the votes, that would be great because all those nice ladies who came here on the 28th with the pocket knives in their purses to a gunfight because when the police and their lawyers came out, they came out with the big guns. And I watched that. I watched that. That's what we're up against. Mr. Barnes, and I am so proud of you for standing your ground. You were disappointed in the mayor. Yes, we should be disappointed because the public safety director shouldn't be talking about a little aggressive. I know, love you, Mr. Mayor, you're just one of the nicest people I know. But the police don't come nice. Major Blackman, I've had numerous conversations with him. He sent me a brochure on police misconduct complaints, how a citizen can do that. If you're still alive after you go through a problem with the police, they do have a police complaint procedure. Guess what? They are always exonerated, Mr. Walker Garrett. They are always exonerated, in my view. Every now and then, you can get a captain who will listen to you, and he'll go back and he'll act like a real supervisor. That's happened on a couple of occasions when I complain because they're training. Some of them don't respond well to training, I want to tell you. But these ordinances are not dueling ordinances, as Mr. Begley seems to counterpose them. You got the Mayor Pro Tem's ordinance, and you got Council Barnes ordinance. There's no reason you can't vote for vote for vote. Vote for both. The um, chair of the Public Safety Advisory Commission, and he's somewhere here, and I hope he'll wave at me at some point. He told me he was going to be here. Um, but he says the commission wants greater oversight. So I know he supports the mayor pro tem's uh, uh, ordinance. Uh, I support subpoena power because when the FOP comes before you, if you subpoena them, they can always take the fifth, Mr. Walker Garrett. They can take the fifth and we'll know. Or they can say, I will tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. They can say that or they can take the fifth. There's nothing wrong with subpoena power. You should use it. You should use it in these incidents, incidents that I've heard about. The death of Tony Carr, I've lived through that. I've been here nine and a half years. And I do know that there have been some problems with the police getting the treatment that they need to get. And we're not just random citizens. We are people who care, and we are organized in some cases. And we're going to stand up. It seems like the incident happened in District 3, if I know the address correctly, the incident where the cop punched somebody. I envision that person to have been maybe homeless or mentally ill because I have watched the police beat up on the mentally ill and the homeless. We don't want police carrying guns doing that to citizens who can't quite comprehend what you're asking them to do, so you're going to start punching them and hitting them. I envision that person to be a person who needed more support from social services than being treated the way he was treated by the police. So let's be clear what we're up against, Council Member Barnes. One, three, five, seven, and nine, 2022, 2022. The 2020 is done. But we have to, as citizens, use the power that we have. 
and that power is the vote. We want to make sure that we elect people that are truly representing our interests. One, three, five, seven, nine, twenty, twenty, two. Because these kind of fights don't happen in an instant. You have to really organize, you have to work hard, you got to find people to run, and you have to get the kind of counsel you need to get. So here at this public hearing on police safety, public safety, we have to be real clear. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon, Council Member Barnes. Keep standing up, keep standing up. Over the next two years, let's work it. You're my council member, District 1. Let's work it, because I don't think you have the votes, actually. It would be a real surprise if you do. I think the Mayor Pro Tem thing might pass, but hey, we keep working it, because Open records, they try to give you a hard time in the police department as the city attorney knows. Uh, they want you to pay for everything and all like that. But hey, we use the open records request because if they come with the subpoena power, she just told you they're going to take the fifth. They're not going to testify before you. They're going to exercise their right to take the fifth. So. Either they, we're going to find some good police officers who are going to speak the truth and nothing but the truth, or we're going to have the FOP saying we're going to take the fifth. So it's in your hands. But I'm a community organizer, and I take a lot of pride in helping people understand that they are not just random citizens, but they have a lot of power. Citizens have a lot of power. We're not just some random nobodies. We're ready to fight, and I hope you hear that. So proud of you, Council Member Barnes, so proud of you. Check. Thank you, Ms. Salamine. My name is Evelyn Montgomery. I live at 2805 Roswell Lane, Columbus, Georgia. Before I, I share it quickly, I just want to let you know that I was born here in Columbus and I've lived here all my life. My father joined the Army in Puerto Rico in order to feed the family. So uh, that's where I came in. My four brothers and sisters are born in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was raised in South Columbus and was a great place to grow up during that time. I want to thank the city council for what you do. I know that many times this is a thankless job, but I appreciate you. And when I say I appreciate you, I'm not saying that we're without fault because tell me one city council that's without fault. And if you do, then I will tell you, you are telling an untruth. The past few years, I'm sorry, the past few months with coronavirus and what I've seen in some of the cities that are experiencing a lot of turmoil, I've told my husband, I said, here we are in Columbus and it's been relatively peaceful. Why is it peaceful? It didn't happen overnight. It's because we have a foundation here, because we have a system, not perfect, but why we are, why we are at peace is because of what we have right now. So yes, we need improvement, but at the same time, I think we need to be thankful for what we have because too many times we point fingers and look at this is terrible and this is terrible and justice and this. Yes, we want justice. That's what our democracy is based on. But you have to think about this. When George Floyd was brutalized as he was, we all came together as a nation and we condemn that. There's not one person in this place that can say they were for that or thought that was right. We came together. That's a good thing. 
So what does that say? Nobody wants police brutality. But when you see police brutality and you see a, 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 a section of it, maybe on the news or on Face, FaceTime or whatever you see it, excuse me, uh, I don't do social media, so I, I, I get some of those uh, names wrong. But anyway, sometimes you got to look at the context of the situation before you make a judgment. But anyway, I want to say this. I'm thankful for you, City Council. I'm thankful for police officers. There's many out there that criticize police. And, and, and you know, they have, they have valid points. But at the same time, those that are criticizing are the first ones to call police when their houses are being broken into. Or even some of the rioters, when things happen, call the police, and they're out there brutalizing police. It doesn't make any sense to me. Mr. Barnes, I respect you greatly, but I have to say no for that resolution. Let me tell you why. Because we already have systems in place. I do not believe that unelected officials should have subpoena power. The problem with our nation is that we have too much overreach as it is. We have too many councils, too many this, too many that, that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Council, I've heard some people say that there's not any trust. Well, if that's the case, then that's one point. That's one place we should look at. Why? If somebody feels that way, why don't we have trust? Now, this, the lady before me said that people don't trust police. Well, that's a blanket statement, and I don't like blanket statements. That's not true. Some people don't trust police. So again, we have a system in place. Council, use your subpoena power. Let's dig in here and see what is the temperature of our police force? How healthy is it? Do we have anybody in the police force that maybe has used excessive force too many times and has a reputation for this? Then we need to look at those types of things. But we do not need any more, I would say the advisory committee is a good thing but they do not need subpoena power in order for us to get the job done. So I vote no. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. My name is uh, Rodrigo Ariola. Uh, I live at 189 Timberloop, Midland, Georgia. I'm accompanied today by my beautiful daughter. Um, and i uh, got some points here I want to make. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for all the people in law enforcement uh, who have served and currently serving. Uh, thank you for your service. I understand service. Spent 37 years in federal service myself. I'm still serving as the DA civilian at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, I, I, I've heard a lot of statements today and a lot of valid points on, on everyone's behalf that's spoken before us. I want to bring this home. I want to bring this back to the foundation of why we're here in the first place. I want to reflect back to the Constitution, signed in 1787. The Constitution where the government is broken down into three branches, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch. Uh, for purpose of this meeting here today, I'll, you know, uh, been the, the commission, the council as the legis legislative uh, branch, the mayor as the executive, and the CPD as the uh, judicial branch. Uh, I don't see why the number of votes will matter today. Based on this constitution, on, on these branches being broken down into three categories, is to divide power, to not let one branch hold all the power. So subpoena power, power to the people, is the distribution of power. That's where our Constitution is based on. If, if anyone in this council votes no, you're going, you're going against the Constitution. Those are, that's the Constitution, the foundation of why we are here today. I got a couple of key points that I want to make, and then I want to tell you a story. 
First, I want to address the issue of chokeholds. No type of chokeholds should be allowed, dot, period. Should be prohibited. There should be no, hey, I'm a police officer, I feel my life's in threat, uh, I'm going to leave that loophole in case I have to use it someday. You know what? No. Chokeholds of any type should not be allowed, dot, period. Body cams. You know, you heard a police officer, I assume she was a police officer when she was up here speaking, and she talked about body cams, she talked about equipment, she talked about dash cams. Completely agree. We need to resource the police department with the right tools, with the right resources, with the right technology, with the right people. We heard the term bad apples. Do we have them? Absolutely we do. What are we doing about it? Are we going through a screening process? I want to believe that we have more great officers out there serving the front lines than bad ones. But we do have some bad ones. So it's up to the good ones to stand up, take a stance, and push those bad cops out of the way. Get them out of the force. They're, they're an embarrassment to the good police officers that are out there sacrificing their lives, sacrificing doing the hard duties that they're assigned to be, to be doing. Those body camps should always be highly maintenance. They should be serviced and they should be logged. Those cameras should be remotely controlled. Police officers should not have the option, hey, let me turn my camera off while you know, I uh, apply a little bit of force to this individual. Those body cams should be on all the time. And they should be remotely controlled and fed back to the station. We shouldn't have to wait 24 days to view body cam video. We shouldn't have to wait 18 months to view body cam video. It should never happen. We should resource that, uh, that area very well. The commission should have the authority to receive and review all cases of use of force and should be able to provide the findings and recommendations to the mayor. Not only provide those, those uh, findings and recommendations, but the mayor should action them. You know, there's a lot of verbiage in these uh, documents here and none of them speak to any action. The word action needs to be part of these documents. Words without action mean nothing. Then we're wasting our time up here speaking if there's no action behind the words. Now I'm going to tell you a story. I've heard a case from two, October 2019, this morning. I heard of a case 2014. We heard the name George Floyd mentioned a little while ago. Well, this community has the George Floyd case right now that is open, not actioned on. The case of January 2017, Hector Ariola, my son, was a victim of police brutality. My family right now are victims of police brutality. It's been over three and a half years, three and a half years, and nothing has happened. There's people in this community who don't even know the case of Hector Ariola. Did not hear his name spoken today. Do not hear his name spoken from any officials. Why is that? We're not going away. We're going to see this all the way through. We're going to stay focused. We're going to be relentless until the end. His death certificate re recently got changed to a homicide after three and a half years. A lot of people say, well, what's new? What caused that autopsy doctor to change her position? Well, I'm going to tell you what. Why new evidence slash old evidence exists the body cam videos. I said before, 18 months. We shouldn't have to wait 18 months before we get body cam videos. 
Those body cam videos were not available to that doctor performing that autopsy. She did not have all the facts, all the findings, all the recommendations at the time that she rendered her initial verdict on the cause of death. After viewing and seeing the findings and recommendations, the body cam videos caused her to change her mind, change her point of view. That certificate has been changed in the last five or six weeks. Very little mention of that made. Changed to a homicide. Mr. Mayor, there's three police officers responsible for my son's death. There's been no action. There's been no feedback. There's been no acknowledgement. There's been no compassion shown to my family. So today, I want to challenge you. These three police officers that caused my son's death after applying excessive use of force while he was in the prone for over six minutes, after being handcuffed for an additional two and a half minutes, when he was showing no signs of uh, re uh, fighting back, that pressure continued. You had a police officer weigh 300 pounds, sit on his upper back and his torso in the prone after being handcuffed, after crying out 16 times, I can't breathe, continued to apply force. You had another officer weighing approximately 250 pounds around his neck area with his knee to his neck and to his upper back. My son cried. He pleaded, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, 16 times. How many times does it take for a professional to acknowledge that the individual cannot breathe? His response was, he's all right, he can breathe. Unacceptable. His mother stood there and watched this incident. The horror that goes to her mind every day, watching her son getting his life sucked out of his body. I believe those are the similar words you used in reference to George Floyd. Yet nothing happened. So I'm going to challenge you today. Those three police officers in question should be fired today, immediately following this meeting. Failure to do that is just that, failure. Those police officers don't get fired today. You have failed the position you serve in. You have failed the people in this community. And how can we have trust? We talked about the essential word of trust. Trust is earned. It's earned by actions. It's earned by due diligence. It's earned by mutual respect. Where is the respect to my family? There has been none. There's been no compassion shown. So I ask the council, everyone listening right now, to put yourselves in these shoes right here. Shoes of anger, frustration. The last three and a half years have been held. And they continue to be held until we have justice. Put yourselves in, in the situation of your son and daughter, regardless of color, going through the same situation. It's not a true feeling until it hits home, I know. It's hit this home, and it's, I'm, I'm telling you, it hits hard. Don't want anyone else to experience that. So, Mr. Barnes, I applaud you for your uh, courageous act today in pushing subpoena power. I think it's clear in the Constitution, very clear that division of power is, is required. And you have to ask yourselves, who serves who? Do we serve police officers? Do we serve law enforcement? Do we serve you? No. Sir, you serve us, the voters. You serve the people. People are in power. 
you should have no problem with Mr. Barnes getting the votes. It's in our Constitution. I want to pass it over to my daughter. She's got a couple of words, and uh, we'll be out of here. Thank you. Thank you so much, for everybody. Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi. My name is Patricia Reagan. Um, I live at 5201 Litchfield Road, Columbus, Georgia, 31904. Um, with my dad, 100%, it's been hell. Um, George Floyd, what happened to him was tragic. We had our own George Floyd here three and a half years ago. Nothing was done. No apology, no nothing. Every day we wake up hoping that justice will be done. We all suffer from, I mean, in our different ways. I don't know how my mother survives every day with her graphic pictures of her son dying right there before her and not being able to do anything. Mayor, I ask that you take, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is all so emotional for me still. I ask that you take accountability. Um, I know there's going to be a new chief of police and I, there must be a standard in our chief of police. We must be able to confide in him. We, he has to have duty, honor, dedication, and leadership to provide the necessary to sustain a professional force. He or she should ultimately be accountable for the actions of their police force. So I challenge you, you talk about um, transparency. We need action. We need to see action. And no talking about, we can talk all day, but something has to be done. And we will fight till the end until this does not happen to another family. We do not want this to happen to anyone's children, their loved one, someone they know. We have to stand up and have our voices heard and for our lost loved ones that have suffered a tragic death like my brother. And that's all I have to say. Well, Ms. Reagan, Mr. Ariola, thank you for coming and making your comments. Obviously because it's still an open um, case, there's, we're limited to what we can say, but what I can tell you as a father and as a brother, uh, my heart breaks for you. Nobody should bury a child. I don't care what the circumstances. And um, with all sincerity, my thoughts and my heart and my prayers go out to you for healing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's the first words of compassion we've heard three and a half years. Um, we truly appreciate that. Um, unfortunately, it comes, you know, a bit late, but better now than never. So uh, I thank you. Uh, uh, thank everyone who's listening today uh, for listening to us. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Stan Montgomery. I live at 2805 Roswell Lane, Columbus, Georgia, 30906. I've been in Columbus a little over 40 years. I've lived south of Macon Road. Residence is there. I, uh, I have a residence north of Macon Road. Uh, I can't say that my experiences have been much different depending on where I live. Um, I'm going to cut this real close to the, to, uh, to the topics at hand and in my mind, my, my concerns. Uh, I do not think a unelected uh, body should have subpoena power. Therefore, I vote no against the uh, advisory committee having subpoena power. I think that should remain and reside in the council uh, because I have a vote to, uh, that I can express to whether I want to retain or uh, to replace someone on the council. Um, 
so that's that's my opinion there on the chokeholds. I'll leave that to the combination of both you as the elected officials and the police chief and, and whoever he might designate, he or she. Um, I have uh, no experience in police matters, so I can't really speak to those, but uh, I would certainly rely on, uh, on the police chief and, and this body to make the right decisions in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Good Mayor afternoon. Henderson, council members. My name is Kathy Scott Likes. I have came to three or four council meetings, sat, listened. I wanted to speak, but I couldn't because I was too emotional. I was so emotional because of the fact I am the mother of a son that was killed by police violence on December 29, 2017. Here, right here in Columbus, Georgia. I met the Areolas at one of the protest march this year, I had been seeking that family because I had been here by myself trying to understand what is going on with our police force and what is it gonna take for us to see equality and justice. You all do not understand the pain that a mother feels when their son or their child is killed by someone who is supposed to protect and serve. It's a heartbreaking, devastating, painful feeling. It is very emotional. And the only way that you all don't understand what I'm saying or what Mr. and or what Pat or Sergeant Major is saying is because you haven't experienced it. You haven't experienced this pain. And it takes us every day to be able to get up and move and do what we need to do in order to survive. Yes, the struggle is real. Just like coronavirus is a severe sickness, the struggle is real when it comes to the, lo the loss of a child due to police violence and brutality. It's a pain that it never, never is going to heal. And then what makes it so bad is it continues to happen. Every time you turn around, another life has been taken by police violence and brutality. When is it going to stop? When? When? But until you all, and God, I hope and pray, you never, ever have to live with this pain that we live with. I hope and pray you never do. I hope and pray you never do. I appreciate what you said. A, a parent should never have to bury their child. Never. My son's name was Jarvis Likes. He was on his way to work on December 29, 2017. And en route to work, there was a DUI checkpoint on Casita Road. My son turned around before he got to that DUI checkpoint to go another route so that he could get to work on time. But a Georgia State Trooper by the name of Officer Michael Nolan saw him when he did this, and he got behind Jarvis. And Jarvis turned into a residential area. And when he turned into that residential area, he ended up on a dead-end street. And Officer Nolan was still behind him. And when he got out his vehicle, he got out with his gun drawn already on my child. He blocked Jarvis in. The narrative I'm telling you is the narrative that they told me, because I wasn't there. So all I can go on is what they told me. When my son got out of his car, they said that there was words said between him and Officer Nolan. And Jarvis proceeded to go back towards his car. As he got to his car, 
he reached inside the window of the car, and as he was coming back up, Officer Nolan shot my son in the upper right shoulder. When he shot my son, he handcuffed him from the front of his body. And when he did that, he went and got back in his cruiser to move his cruiser back because it was too close for him to render aid, medical aid to my son. Time is of the essence here, people. You have a, someone you just shot, but you gotta go move your vehicle in order to render aid. When he got there, my son, come to find out again that the object he had in his hand was his cell phone. Who do you think he was about to call? When he know he hadn't done anything wrong. Why, why are you behind me? Who do you think he was about to call? Because he reminds me of George Floyd at this point, when I think about that cell phone. And to hear George Floyd call for his mama twice. Who do you think he was about to call? His mama. That's what I hear. Well, by the time the ambulance got there and transported my son to the medical center, the doctors and the staff, they continued to try and work on my son to save his life. But the bullet that the officer shot my son with ricocheted. It hit his lungs and it hit his heart. And my son died. My son died. Could this have been prevented? Absolutely. If the officer would have de-escalated the situation instead of taking matters like this so that was unnecessary excessive force. My son should have been here right here today. But because the situation wasn't de-escalated as it could have been, I no longer have my only son. When I asked, when, I asked the GBI in the corner when they arrived to my home on December 30th, 2017 at 5.30 to inform me of my son's fatal tragic death, I lost it. I completely lost it. I can even hear nothing that they were saying because their words were muffled to my ears. Who in their right mind would ever think you would wake up at 5.30 in the morning with some news such as this? And then when I asked them, can I please go and identify my son? Because I knew my son was supposed to have been at work. You got the wrong person. You got the wrong guy. I want to go identify my son, but I couldn't because they had already transported my son to the GBI lab for an autopsy to be performed. And when I saw my son again, it was in his casket on the 6th of January, 2018. I have fought for justice and I will continue to fight for justice until my son received justice. I say again, for you to understand my pain, you got to experience it. And I wish this on nobody, nobody. I come forward, I finally got bold enough <laughs> to confront you all today and tell you my story. Because I approve what you are doing, Pop. I give you my support for what you are doing. Police reform is very important. Changes need to be done. Again, like they said about the use of body cam, let me tell you about body cam. Officer Nolan did not have one on that night. And he did not have a dash cam either because he had reported that his dash cam was working improperly. It wasn't functioning like it should. But his supervisor told him he could drive the vehicle anyway. It's okay. How can it be okay if you're going out on a mission and you're going to at a DUI checkpoint where you check ID, you check tag numbers. You should have videos so it could be seen in case something should happen. But there was no videos. There was no footages. How would you feel, you know? And how would you feel when the DA decide to put it in front of the grand jury and 
the grand jury finds it to be a no bill because there's not enough evidence to go any further with the criminal case. Hmm? And the only word you have is what the officer said that, act that killed my son. You have the GBI agent and you have the DA investigator. The only three that testified. No expert witnesses, no outside witnesses, just those three. You think justice was served to me and my family? No. And then I heard this man say something about, uh, about reopening the cases. What do you know? You haven't had this pain. I don't feel I was adequately uh, represented by the DA. I don't. And I know I wasn't. So yes, reopen my son case. I request my son case to be reopened because now we have a new DA that will be taking office as of January. And yes, I would want him to reopen that case and review my son case, just like the areolas. We deserve that. We deserve that. So when I hear people talking about know this and know that, that you all don't need to do this, y'all don't need to do that, you have to experience something in order to understand. And I am highly upset. Yes, I am. I'm very angry. Because people talk about things that they don't even really understand what's going on. And that's not right, and it's not fair. So I'm asking you all to please, please approve what Pop Barnes is asking to do. Because we need the reform. We need those police to have the proper body cams. We need to have the police to make sure their dash cam works as it should. We need for them to know the meaning of de-escalating de a problem. And another thing I feel that we need to do is every time a police officer is involved in a shooting, that they should be drug tested and alcohol tested at the time of that shooting. I do. We got to come up with some changes. We have to do better. And every time we see another person being shot and killed by police violence, we can't even heal. We can't heal because we keep going back over the same thing. The same thing. And I hope you all understand where I'm coming from. I hope you understand. I don't expect you to feel me, but I do hope you understand. And I thank you for your time. I thank you for listening. And I appreciate everything that you all have done. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council. Thank you for listening to us again. My name is Joyce Dent Fitzpatrick. I reside in Columbus, Georgia. I am the president of the West Georgia chapter of the po Police Benevolent Association. I have with me the vice president, who is Captain Larry Parker from the Marshals Department. I also have our chaplain, uh, Corporal Larry, Mar I'm sorry, Larry Marshall from the uh, Marshals Department as well. Larry Parker is the uh, captain. Um, we spoke two weeks ago, and I'm not going to rehash or go over everything that we discussed, but some things have come back up that I really want to talk about and to clarify. Uh, to Garrett Walker, uh, we did, the PBA did uh, provide an attorney for that officer you were talking about. She did not want to go with the one that we had, so she has a right to choose who she wants. And she chose you, which we were fine with it, and you, and you worked it pro bono. And we really appreciate you representing our member. However, I need to bring this. Distance brings destruction. Proximity brings clarity. 
we need to come together on what we're about to do here, what we're about to embark upon here as citizens and police officers and government officials in Columbus. We do not want a powder keg. We do not. But on behalf of our 800 plus members, and, and half of those members live in Muskogee County, I have to tell you some things that we've been doing and what I've come to you to say. Again, we are against a public review board with subpoena power. We are totally against it. And I'll reiterate why. When an officer in Columbus or an employee in Columbus is in any trouble or discipline, we have parameters in place where they can appeal that process. If they do not agree with the sergeant, lieutenant, captain, major, assistant chief, and the chief, they have an appeal process where they can go to the city council, which is you. To my knowledge, no one has ever went to you. Is the system broken? Has it failed? Has it ever been used? No, it's not broken. If they feel that they have been mistreated, their governing powers, which you, city council, can subpoena us to come and testify, we've never had to do that. By putting another step into our process, this mechanism is already working. I think it's going to be expensive. I think it's going to be more time consuming. And a lot of the people up here have said, we can plead the fifth. We don't have to testify. So what, what has that done? If you feel that we need a citizen's review board, and we, we, we agree with you on a citizen's review board, we really encourage that. However, in the past two weeks, I've talked to a retired GSP supervisor. I've talked to some people from the GBI. I've talked to several people who are retired from the Sheriff's Department, Marshal's Department, some judges, the Police Department, who said they will be more than willing to serve on this board. I also implore you to get someone with some supervisory experience, because there's a different take, and there's a lot of policy reading and not emotions when you have to discipline someone. Nobody wakes up and say, I think I want to suspend somebody. I think I want to uh, terminate somebody. It's a hardcore decision to make. I, myself, when I have to suspend somebody, I go into a deep prayer because I don't want it to be Joyce Dent Fitzpatrick doing this. I want them to understand that this is to correct a behavior. We're all entitled to mistakes. I'm not here to justify or to clarify anybody's past doing. I'm only asking you to let us do our job. We already have parameters in place. Let's use them. And my final note is, when a nurse or a doctor, he or she, comes home from work, they get to take their steth stethoscope off. They get to take their white jacket off. They don't have to perform surgery in their neighborhood. When a soldier, he or she, gets off duty, they can take off their BDUs, their fatigues. They don't have to run out to war in their neighborhood. But when I get home, and when we get home, we can't take off our uniform and say, oh, well, there's a shooting out in front of my house, or there's a kid that's been ran over. We can't do that. We're on duty 24-7, 365 all the time. And yet, when we make a mistake, and we make plenty, we have to go through so many loops and hoops and so many boards to justify our actions. If we're going to justify our actions, let's have some more people that are more well-rounded on your board who understand. And taking a CLIA class for 11, 14 weeks is not the answer. Let's get some people with some, some background in police work, judges, officials, who can tell you not one-sided on how they were treated, not one-sided on what they believe to be true, but a whole hodgepodge of all the entities that we're going through, policy, emotions, and everything else. We want you to understand 
that we're people just like you. We don't feel that just because we chose to be a police officer, a law enforcement officer, that we should be held all the way up here when you don't hold a surgeon who has botched up your surgery accountable. When we lose a war, we don't go after the soldiers. But when we do something wrong, everybody's looped in and every police officer in the United States gets locked into that bad apple barrel. And that's not the case. That's not the way we should be treated. We should be treated fairly and based on what we do here in this community. And I can tell you that most of the police officers here that I know, that I know, really endure joy and in, will endure their job. And they'll do it to the best of their ability. But when they make a mistake, and I can tell you, I could be the poster child for when you make a mistake at the Columbus Police Department, because I'm going to read the policy, I'm going to send it back to you, and I'm not signing it. And I will never be forced to sign something that I feel that is not fair and that's not right, if I know about it, if I know about it. So with that being said, I feel the West Georgia Police Benevolent Association, we all feel that we will have to go through numerous steps to justify our jobs, justify our behavior, if, we are given, if you all give subpoena power to a citizen's review board. It's not that we're trying to hide anything. A gentleman came up here and said, we have two choices. We can either say, I plead the fifth, or we can testify. If we choose to plead the fifth, it's going to be inferred or misconstructed that we have something to hide. No, it's simply because we've told three or four different agencies or three or four different entities what we've done, and we still have to go back and forth. I left with you, uh, I'll leave with you um, the contents of what I've spoken about. I sent it to every city council member yesterday. I sent it to the mayor. I reiterated it last night. You all have what was proposed by the, by the West Georgia Police Benevolent Association. We implore you to please not give this police citizens review board subpoena power. Have the board, but put some more people who represent us on it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, city attorney. Okay, Mayor, those, um, these ordinances will come back in two weeks for council action. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll move on to the next item. Up, oh, Councilor Thomas. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, um, I guess I need some uh, advice and, and counsel here. <laughs> Um, we have, we've heard an awful lot in the last two meetings, um, probably 10 hours worth of testimony. Um, and one of the, the statements that has stuck with me was one of the speakers today, well, several of the speakers today, said they were going to hold me accountable for whatever comes out of this whether it passes or fails, whether it's changed or what. And at our last meeting, when this first came up to us, uh, I asked that we postpone this so that we could take a look at uh, the contents of these two ordinances and what they mean and uh, how they should be implemented. Um, and we've had two weeks to do that. Um, there are so many nuances about this issue that I'm not sure that I am um, fully prepared uh, to be held accountable to make this decision. Um, this ordinance was, according to um, the IMA, they knew of this ordinance June the 5th. Council did not know of this ordinance until after 7 p.m. on the Friday before the council meeting that was held June the 28th. So we have had that kind of timeline to try to 
decide what, if anything, we're going to do. There have been a lot of um, uh, stories today, and as each one is um, told, um, I can't relate to that. I have never had a child who has been killed. I have never been a black man who has been stopped by the police and is in fear of their life. It's hard for me to do that. But I can say that I believe that we have the resources in Columbus, Georgia, to put together a top-notch, a number one uh, group that is made up of citizens from throughout this community to take a look at this issue and to come up with a policy that, while we may not all agree with every part of it, it would be something that we could live with and that we could have our community take a look at. I, I uh, just happened last week um, to be watching the NBC Nightly News, <laughs> and there was a article, uh, a story about Milwaukee and all of the problems that they were having. And part of that story said there are approximately 18,000 police jurisdictions in the United States. Of those 18,000, there are 165 that have citizen oversight committees. They didn't name them, but I thought, ah, Columbus must be one of them. And that, was, that made an impression on me because I felt like if there are 165 oversight committees, um, we ought to be able to put together the best um, oversight that there is. And so uh, I've said all of that to say, to ask you um, if at this point in the uh, process um, it would be uh, parliamentary correct <laughs> and um, to postpone any action on either one of the two ordinances and the resolution until we get a study committee named and put together and uh, processed. We are about to have some major shakeups in the Columbus Police Department and the leadership of that department. And I think that it is important that we pull, um, that we give that new leadership all of the support that she or he needs um, to lead the department. Um, I think that there are people in this community of every persuasion that would be willing to serve on such a study committee. Uh, one of the people that I talked with about this idea, um, we said we, we like the idea, quite frankly, that the uh, Community Foundation has done for the last several years where they've had um, on-the-table talks where people have gotten together, and you don't sit with the people that you always talk with. You sit with someone else and hear some other um, opinions and ideas. That could be part of this, to come together as a community um, and make sure that the Columbus Police Department continues to be the number one police department in the United States of America. And I happen to believe that. But my question then is, is it is now the time to make that motion, or do we wait until the next uh, meeting and vote on these two 
and then if the mayor and the rest of the council um, thinks it has any merit, put together some kind of a group, whether it passes or fails, whether they pass or fail, I think that we still need a lot of work on this issue in our community. I, I don't want our community to be divided. I want us to be solid. That does not mean we can't disagree. My grandmother used to say, uh, and you all know that I quote my grandmother quite a bit, she used to say, um, that's why they make chocolate and vanilla ice cream. I don't understand those people who don't like chocolate ice cream, but they are there. Um, and we will have our differences, but we also should have a way of working through those differences so that we do what is the best for Columbus. I don't know if I'm the only one that feels, the only one of the people around this council table that feels like we ought to take a much deeper uh, dive into this issue, but I personally would like to see us put a hold on this so that there's not a stigma, it was not passed, it was not defeated, but we are going to look at what we need to do. And so I guess my, my um, request for uh, your services, Mr. City Attorney, is when can and should uh, that motion come before the council? Well, uh, Councilor, you do not have to wait. When there's an ordinance on the council table on first reading, any ordinance, any councilor can move to table that item uh, indefinitely if you want to appoint a committee to study it that's fine uh, and you just simply take up a motion to table it um, I, I would not want to just um, leave it out there uh, that we're going to appoint a committee uh, I would want something done um, in a timely manner but I also would not want it done you know, uh, by two weeks from today, you know. Right. Um, you, you can put any length of time, 90 days, uh, on a motion to table and study or whatever the council desires. Of course, it needs a majority vote. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, um, I, I would love to hear from some of my other fellow councilors. Am I... And I'm, I think you shall. I'm, Councilor I'm not in left field, am I? <laughs> Again. Well, I happen to be thinking the same thing when um, Mr. Hickey came up. I thought that he brought up some really good points that I hadn't um, considered before. And then there were some other people that spoke that brought up some, some items that aren't even in either one of these ordinances. And so I do think that having some kind of a exploratory committee or something like that, and I agree with you not to prolong it, but I do think that it would be important that the next police chief would be involved in that um, because the next police chief that comes in may have some ideas already on how to make improvements and so I just feel like out of respect for the next leader of the police department to be involved in those discussions so if you're making a motion I'll second it Councilor Huff thank you Mr. Mayor <coughs> I've had several conversations with uh, people in the community over the past couple of weeks, <clears throat> and everyone has heard from me that I am in support of both sides. I had gotten to a point that I was probably going to abstain because I agree with both sides. It's not a good place to be. Uh, in this climate at this time, it's been brought up by the PBA along the way that if you had to have a, a citizen's review board with subpoena power, 
then you should have citizens on that committee, and you should also have some retired uh, public safety people, judges and people of that nature to kind of balance things off. But my overall point was to Councilor Thomas's point and others today, uh, if we're going to have the best uh, uh, citizen review board, and if it's subpoena power that you want, then it should be an open discussion with the community and the police, public safety people <clears throat> at the table to hammer it out. So the citizens, the way I put it was this way. We're at a, at a point in this discussion where the citizens don't trust the police department and the police department doesn't trust the citizens with their career. So it needs to be an open discussion in the room together to understand what they do, how they do it, uh, the results of the Citizens Review Commission. And uh, I had mentioned yesterday, uh, I went searching. Uh, they're doing some things in Las Vegas. They're doing some things in San Diego, California. But most of all, Senator Karen Bass uh, brought forth legislation in Washington. And it came down with subpoena power. But that subpoena power did not go to a group of citizens. It went to the uh, judiciary, uh, judicial department. So if we're going to do this in Columbus, uh, I have friends on both sides. <clears throat> I'm part of the, the, uh, the Divine Nine. Uh, and I just put it bluntly. I am a black man in Columbus, Georgia. I've been able to navigate, experience some things in life, and I understand what this discussion is about. But at no time in my plight, be it here, Florida, or elsewhere, have I ever been in the middle of something that we didn't have open discussion. Uh, I applaud all of the uh, women in the Sisters United. I applaud all of the fraternities that came forth to support. I'm also in support, but I've had several conversations with some of you all in the movement. I've had conversations with people in the uh, public safety career path and the police officers and things, and it just seems like we're talking at one another and not to one another. And I think it's something that can be accomplished. Uh, I just think that, me personally, I've said this, and there are people still here in the audience that I said it to, that it needs to be an open conversation. It's not that you can't have it, but it's a little harder to get there. It's divided the community, and for all of you all that are here, you pretty well figured it out when you came in today that we were probably split. So even my support was not going to get you there today or next week or two weeks from now. But I think my support and others around the table can get you there in a period of time. And you could end up with this great Citizens Review Board. You may end up with subpoena power. But that should be after a discussion with all the public safety and all the citizens of Columbus, Georgia, and all the organizations. And Sisters United <clears throat> that led the charge should be at the, at the head of the table and coming in to lead this and uh, help navigate this so that the mission is not lost on what it is you want. I've had the experience of worrying about my children and things of that nature over time, but I just had a real difficult time with the whole process and the fact that you have uh, public safety police officers that are members of the Divine Nine. And in talking to the police officers that are members of the, of the Divine Nine, uh, not many of them were invited into the table, talked to about it, or even asked their opinion. And it's something to be gained from both sides. 
So I'm sure there's uh, some disagreement with what I have to say, but anyway, I would, I would really, really ask council if we are to get Pop Barnes ordinance where it needs to be, it needs to be open discussion and for us to put this together the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Council Barnes? Well, there you go. I, I had a sidebar conversation with Councilor Garrett, and I think everybody knows what my feelings are. I, told, I said that my trust in the system has been shattered, and it has. And I've said that directly to you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll say it time and time and time again. We're not going to agree on that one instance. I know what I experienced. And so uh, I am for further discussion, but I want to commend, and my suggestion with Councilor Garrett is the the brave ladies that brought this here. We need, you've heard time and time again, the word trust. And it's not only on my part. You've heard it time and time again, Mr. Mayor, from the community, they have come up. It's that area of trust that the citizens need to have in the process. And so in my conversations with Councilor Garrett, I would like to, um, what we spoke about, is extending the conversation, inviting individuals from the community um, that would have input in whatever is organized. And um, as long as the citizens, and, and this is the one thing that I want to say, I know it's very difficult for some individuals to understand the level of anxiety, but also the level of distrust that may be in quote unquote the system. Now I think I made it clear to you, Mr. Mayor, and to the public safety, that I, everybody knows I have a reputation and I'm not a Johnny come lately to supporting the police. I believe in them. And I'm looking at you, Mr. Mayor, because you and I got to either have a conversation or, I, or we're gonna have hard feelings and if either way it goes, I'm comfortable with. The bottom line is, is understanding. You and I spoke that. And you even were honest enough to mention to me, Pops, I can't imagine. That meant a lot to me, because it was the truth. What means a lot to me and a lot of people that spoke is that one element of trust and reassurance. And you only get trust and reassurance when you actually apply and work for it. And so I am for what Judy talked about. I'm definitely for what um, Walker came to me just now. And harnessing citizens, bringing them into this input of a discussion of how to formulate an organization that they will trust, that will be able to have oversight. I'm for that discussion. And so, to Walker, I'm going to pass it to you. But I want to make say again, I want to thank um, the ladies again for initiating this here. And also, Byron Hickey um, gave me a lot of information. No one knows everything, but he what he said today made a lot of sense. And what Walker just came over and told me um, made a lot of sense as well. And I spoke to him, as long as the citizens are involved, because you know, all of us work for, there's not one of us here who does not work for every citizen in this Columbus community. From the mayor, to the city manager, to us counselors, we all work for the citizens, so therefore, who should the citizens trust? The citizens should trust us, and there should be open channels of communication. And so I think in that area, what I just got finished saying, so I saw you shaking your head, yes, Mr. Mayor, we're all in agreement on that. And so I think we just, we just need to be a, a, among the task of making that happen. Judy, I'm glad you opened up the conversation to that, because as I said at the tail end of my conversation, what Dr. Martin Luther King verbalized so, so prophetically, that we've got to, it's, it's, it's a case of now. Now is the time. And if you look at the national news, I mentioned before, we have a rainbow. Every culture, every race, feeling this urgency of now to make things happen and make things change. And so, Walker, if you can expound on, and I would also like for, out of courtesy, because one thing that I noticed last time, 
I just felt that the ladies who came up here very professionally, I just felt that they were attacked and they should not have been. It came out in a conversation with my friend, the chief of police. Um, and I want to reiterate something else too. I'm, I'm going to extract. The chief of police has been a friend of mine since before I was elected to council. And I, and I mentioned it um, last time. When he retires, he's going to be my friend. And so my concern was not for, for being kept in the dark, was not on the chief of police, was on this administration. I want to make that clear. And, um, and so, Walk, I'm going to start by, uh, do, do any other ladies have anything to say? Because it's only right for them to come up because they are the ones that took that initial step and contacted me. And it's all, it seems like it's always, and I like to thank a lot of the men that came up, uh, uh, Reverend Chester, but it always seems, even in some of the churches, that the ladies are the ones that step up to the plate fearlessly. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you, Councilor Barnes. I'm Pat Hughley Green, I live at 1360 Kevin Court in District 1. I just want to have some clarity. I heard Councillor Thomas said to delay the ordinance and the resolution. That's what I said. That's what you all are getting ready to vote on. The ordinance, because there are two of them, clearly you all need to go back and have some discussion and get a clear understanding of where we need to be to present one. The resolution, as your police chief that you summonsed two weeks ago, came up here and gave it to you chapter and verse, listing the current police policies for all seven of those items. So why would you delay something that you already do? Why is there a concern or a question about something that you already do? Why would you forfeit an opportunity to say to this community that we hear you? As I, as I said to the police chief when we met with him, we applaud. Thank you, ladies, for bringing this to the forefront. We're already doing these things. Let me tell you the, the policies that we have currently that supports not one, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those items on the resolution. So to delay it is saying that you don't even support your own current police policies and practices. You guys no. vote on resolutions all the time. Not on that, the resolution. That simply, she just, she confirmed it. She wants to delay the resolution part. No, I, I think we were talking about the ordinance. Miss, I'm talking about Councilor Thomas. Oh, okay. We're, no, okay. She Councilor. wants, and if I'm wrong, clear, clear it up. But if you're, if you are getting ready to consider delaying the ordinance and the resolution, I wrote it down, Walker. Um, then the that's why I'm speaking to this. The ordinance, because the ordinance speaks to what you currently do. You vote on ordinances all the time that highlight and uplift what you currently do. All the time y'all vote on it. In fact, when we had that marathon meeting, you had the audacity to vote on a resolution honoring C Congressman John Robert Lewis. We're, we're not that. I'm talking about the ordinance. The resolutions are no reason why we shouldn't. I, okay, I, I just need to make it clear. And, you know, y'all you, need to talk up here because my understanding was she said very clearly the ordinance and the I, resolution. I, was and I just asked that she confirmed. And I'm glad you did, Pat. I'm referencing the conversation that... Uh, Councillor Garrett and I had for the ordinance. There's no reason why we, we shouldn't, because you took the time to go to the chief of police and we went item by item by item. And the reason that I, I made the uh, remark initially when we brought it, there was such a knee jerk reaction to what you all were doing and you were actually in support of current practices. The, the police department. And when we sat down uh, with the chief of police, and the, his command group, it, it became obvious why were people attacking you when you were, in essence, reinforcing what the police were already doing. 
And we had that conversation with the chief of police, the assistant chief of police, and other people in his command group. And it became obvious that what you were doing were helping, reinforcing, what's the word you use? Affirming. Affirming. Affirming, but you all, were, to me, in my estimation, in the estimation of a lot of people who emailed me, you all were attacked for, for no reason. And now we're asking to be delayed again. And so, Councilor the, the, Barnes, I appreciate The you. ordinance mm -hmm. is what I spoke to Councilor Gary about. Well, there's a motion on the floor. <laughs> Well, there was, never, there was never a motion made. So it, it was just so, a discussion, and I think Councilor Crabb had said if that was a motion, she okay. would second. But I, I have to agree with, um, with, uh, with Councilor Barnes. I, I had hoped we could have gotten the resolution voted on two weeks ago, because I think go. based on what the uh, police chief uh, walked us through during his presentation, with, with a few very minor modifications, I think it was, as you said, it was reaffirmation of what the police department already does from a training and, a, and, a, and a, uh, even a screening and hiring perspective. Uh, so I think after, I understand y'all met, so I, I, my understanding was that you were able to kind of fine tune it and get it to, uh, to where everybody should agree on it. Exactly. So, Every council member was contacted. So let's, meeting. let's, uh, I'm going to, now Councilor Garrett is next, Got but I'm going to go to Councilor, Councilor Thomas because she, I think, had, had in, initiated the conversation about the ordinance. I just want to clear up what I am talking about. I am talking about um, holding off on the resolution because the resolution requires that this go into the policy manual. And if you were here last time and you heard me speak the last time, my objection to that resolution is that I do not believe that this council should mandate what goes into that resolution. Every one of those items on there that, that you're talking about, one through seven, absolutely we still do it. The chief said we do it, we do it, we do it, we do it. My objection is I do not think this council should take the authority to mandate what is in the training manual. That's my objection. I guess. And so that's why I would, um, we can say, um, I don't understand this is that a good idea, but the resolution says this will be in the training manual. And I don't believe that we should do that. It, it says this council supports and affirms the following policies. So I just wanted to make sure you had the current language. Well, I don't see the... Councilor, is that I'm okay. Else? Go ahead. Okay. Councilor Garrett. I would just uh, like to make a motion to delay the both of the ordinances proposed by both Councilor Pops Barnes and Councilor Allen, just those ordinances. Uh, the reason being I want to make this comment, if I could get a second so we can discuss it. Okay. And the reason that I, I say that is because I think you know, this is kind of like mediation. When the mediator comes in, I'm a lawyer and everybody, they, they tell you, neither side's happy when you leave a mediation if you have a good compromise. If you've got a good compromise, then everybody gives a little bit and everybody takes a little bit. And not everybody gets 100% of what they want. Detective Hickey brought, brought up something that was very, very uh, important and stuck in my mind. And I agree with Councilor Pop Barnes. There's a way where we can combine the two resolutions. Uh, Councilor Allen's resolution is broader in nature in that the Public Safety Advisory Committee does not have subpoena power, but they do have the power to review all of the use of force uh, instances. That's a citizen board, and then they would refer it back to either the Office of, office, making sure I get this right, Office of Professional Standards or possibly the GBI. What I would propose we look at 
would be because council does have subpoena power, that possibly we have an executive session once a month that is dedicated to reviewing those forms and allowing it to be done in private so that the officer, if, it's a, if it is a meritless claim, their name is not besmirched, and they also have an opportunity for the police to come here in private with executive session, bring it to the counselors, and any counselor would have the subpoena power. Counselor Barnes, if he had a concern, could bring it up. Counselor Allen could bring it up. I could bring it up. If we have a concern, we do already, as a body, have subpoena power. So it would give the best of both ordinances to our community. It would in broaden what is reviewed, but it would also protect our officers because they don't have to worry about a public witch hunt that may not turn out to be accurate. But at the same time, council, we would never be in a position where we could say we did not know what happened. We didn't know about this video or we didn't know about this use of force. And if it's appropriate, once we've gotten input from experts, from our police officers and from whoever possibly might be representing whoever is, has brought the claim, we've got the opportunity, we have the power as a council to subpoena. But I, I do have some very serious concerns about a non-elected citizen review board having that power. I think the PSAC who is appointed, with them making recommendations, would work out very well. And then once we, they make a recommendation, we handle it in executive session. At that point, we can make a decision whether or not a subpoena is warranted, and council has that power. But that way, there's no public witch hunts going on, which I think a lot of our officers are concerned about, because the main issues I hear from my constituents, I, I've, I've had very few folks who have reached out to me that have not been one way or the other and not had something in, in between. But the folks that I represent, they're more concerned about officer morale and making sure they've got enough officers on the streets. I have some of the best areas in Columbus. I have some of the most dangerous areas in Columbus that I represent. And to me, their safety is more paramount than anything. And I hate that we do have some bad apples. And I hope that this process might allow us to catch those bad apples. But at the same time, we also have to balance the interest of our police officers, keeping morale up, and making sure we actually have enough officers on the street to protect people. because. 99.9% .9 of the police officers are there to serve and protect. No matter the, the color, creed, race, whatever it may be, they are here to protect our citizens. We've got to make sure we put their interest. But there is a way to do this where we also protect our citizens for that 0.01% of bad apples that will occur in any organization. And then council can say, we have seen it. Maybe we need to do a subpoena power, and we can discuss that privately without the officer's name being bes besmirched. We can also get things through subpoena power. The, honestly, the police department would turn over most of the stuff to us. So we could really thoroughly review some, uh, something like this, a, a very serious situation, and I think this is something we need to look at where we could possibly combine the best of both worlds of these ordinances and look at whether or not we can make that happen where we have council subpoena power, but then we have our citizens on the PSAC that are appointed by council. Uh, Councilor Crabb. Um, <clears throat> well, did somebody second what, what Walker just brought up? I'll second it. Okay. Councilor House just seconded it. Okay. Um, then, then I was going to talk about the resolution, so I'll wait. All right, Councilor House. You need to hit your light one more time, sir. Well, we're having a little bit of a problem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, the reason I hit the light was I wanted to second what <laughs> Councilor Garrett was saying, too. I okay. do think it's, I, I think there are some concerns about trust in the community. I think we need to address those, and I think we need to look at these two ordinances and, and, and uh, given the input that we've received today, uh, discuss changes that may or may not ought to, uh, sh should be considered. So I was just trying to second Councilor Garrett. All right. Well, I believe Councilor Barnes would like to be listed as a co-second. Sure. Fine with me. All right. Uh, there is a motion and a couple of seconds. Uh, any further discussion? <clears throat> the motion was to delay for two weeks to allow uh, the opportunity to develop, I believe, a, a group that would be able to look at this and have uh, uh, some citizen input, some discussion. Is that correct? Okay. Any other discussion? Any other questions? Councillor Huff. 
Uh, I, I was hoping we'd have a little bit more time than that. Uh, Sisters United, some of the members are still here uh, to put together a good group to have open discussion with Sisters United leaving, leading the way along with public safety and the, and, and the general public, the citizens, to uh, take a look at both of the ordinances and have some input. So this will be uh, basically a community issue to the end. I mean, we can put it off, I mean, modify or, or amend the yeah. I mean, we, I, I, I'm thinking two weeks would be too soon. It doesn't have to tarry, but I would ask, uh, since Sisters United have been involved since from the beginning, to make sure you get them to the table for this discussion and other citizens, and then if it only takes two weeks or four weeks or whatever, as long as as long as Columbus, Georgia has input. And I would I would be surprised if Council Barnes didn't make sure that that the Sisters Inc. were Sisters involved. Inc. and the citizens and public safety. Thank you. All right, Councillor Thomas. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a substitute motion that um, in two weeks we come back, um, we, uh, it would be brought back to us a plan of developing such a study group committee uh, and timeline and all of the, um, uh, I don't know, uh, things that go along with making this committee work. Uh, that it be brought back to us in two weeks. And after that two-week time period, that committee then would work to put together the kind of thing, you know, I'm looking at this committee uh, to know what groups are we going to make officially part of the committee, that sort of thing. But my motion is that we come back in two weeks with a plan for a committee to study this issue. All right, motion second to amend to have a, at, least, at least the beginning of a plan within two weeks. All right, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Up with Mayor Pro Tem. Um, yes, I would like to ask. I, the, I, under, I agree with the direction you're headed, but who is going to put this together? Who, who's going to do that work? We'll get, we'll get, a, um, we'll get an infrastructure put together on what, the, what it should look like and then where it grows from there, I think should be up to the citizens and the people who have interest and input. Okay, thank you. We'll do that, all right? Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? All right, we'll be back in two weeks with um, the beginnings of a plan. Uh, push the mic button. Yes, one. There you go. Yes, sir. I think we're heading in the right direction because that was my intent when I called up the um, ladies of the Divine Nine who initiated this here, that we do have a broad spectrum of individual citizens interplay with discussing how those all this is going to work. And I do want to thank, um, again, um, Byron Hickey for that suggestion because I, I was thinking along the line and then Councillor Garrett took the initiative to uh, formulate what I think is, is excellent. Uh, if, if this had, had gone on and evolved, I would not have been happy at all. Not said anything against my esteemed colleague, Councillor Allen, but I was not in favor of that. But something was better than nothing. But what Councillor Garrett is saying is going to, I think it's going to materialize in the community having more input into what's going on. I do like to plan, and I appreciate you stopping me and coming over here and visualize. I guess that being an attorney in that mediation, you, your mind runs that way. But it's excellent what you're talking about because the one thing that I'm, I want is I want citizen input, getting more people even, even involved in formulating how this is going to work because we all work for, and the only reason that we're in existence is for the citizens. And so I am... Um, I'm in agreement that it's going to take longer than two weeks, but if we come back in two weeks and we have some type of framework which is inclusive of individuals who will help formalize this here, I think it's a win. It will be a win-win for, for everyone. 
Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, before we leave this topic and get into the uh, public hearings for the rezonings, I'd like to go on and, and with all due respect to Councillor Thomas, I'd like for us to bring up the resolution and go ahead and talk about it. Uh, I have an amendment I would like to offer for consideration. Uh, Councillor Barnes and I have talked about this already, and we've, we've agreed to it. Several of you I was able to get to and talk about it, and we met, Councillor Barnes and I met with uh, the ladies earlier before Council and, and agreed to it. And it's, it's minor, really. It's just a text change. Uh, in Item 5, it talks about uh, CPD will require de-escalation and unconscious bias training for all officers. Uh, actually, this is state law. So my, my minor text change is consistent with Georgia law, CPD will require de-escalation and unconscious bias training for all officers. So I would like to put that in the form of a motion on the resolution. Uh, and the resolution that I'm referring to is the one that Councillor Barnes worked with the chief and uh, the ladies uh, last week uh, on. So that's the one that I'd like to bring up Mr. That, that would be item nine on our agenda. Item nine, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. All What's right. Up? There's a motion to amend item nine, number five, and it's seconded by Councilor Barnes. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. It, we can take a motion. Now I'd like to make a motion that we pass that item nine resolution. All right, there's a motion to approve and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Councilor Crabb? I'm just really a little bit confused about this resolution because we just sat here for, uh, what, two hours more? And in the meantime, I have a grandson, Hatcher Lee, so whoever, Congratulations. so whoever was thinking that he was not going to be born until after this meeting was over, you lost. <laughs> but anyway, going back to this, um, a lot of the comments that had been made and, you know, the distrust and the activities of the police, they were actually going, uh, they were saying that these things didn't exist and so I guess I have mixed feelings because I don't know why we have to have this resolution now supporting these policies um, that have been in place since the 1990s but I guess there's another part of me that wants to thank the ladies for bringing all of this up because through this process we were able to disclose, and I guess through this resolution, we're able to disclose to the citizens, because I think that there's some confusion amongst the, amongst the citizens, and a lot of them were here today speaking to us, um, that these policies and these procedures don't exist in the Columbus Police Department. So, um, I just, I, I just have mixed, fe mixed feelings about this, and I wanted to express them. Okay. Any other discussions or any other questions about item nine? Uh, Councilor Davis? Mayor, I'm going to support this resolution, and I'm going to give a brief explanation why I'm doing it, because I'm somewhat proud. I'm proud. I am proud. I'm proud of our community. I'm proud of our city. I'm proud of what our law enforcement agencies do because basically what I'm about to agree to is in full support of what our agencies and law enforcement, well, CPD in this case, because we've, <laughs> you know, we probably just had one of the greatest public safety review commission meetings that was ever held right here. I mean, We've been discussing this and getting things done far quicker than a hand-appointed body by this council could ever get done. So, and then I do question what a hand-appointed body from this council is going to do quicker than this body is able to do uh, 
when it really comes down, when you understand the charter, when you understand the powers that are have been delegated to the di different branches of, of the government, uh, we've got several checks and balances in place. And, you know, we're talking about a law enforcement agency here, CPD, that is CALEA certified. And those of you that don't know about CALEA certification, you ought to look and see what it takes to be certified and how that review takes place, uh, it, it's, it's extensive. State certifications, I mean, I'm just glad that we're already doing these things. I think we're so far ahead of the game when you talk about the subject matter today and you look at the rest of the country and some of the things being, being brought up. I do have concerns too, and I'm just gonna say this. I mean, I'm listening to everybody, but it feels somewhat like we're just singling CPD out. Does everybody realize we've got so other law enforcement agencies in Columbus across the board? Some we don't even have jurisdiction and government over. I mean, and this resolution is basically supporting what we already do with CPD. I've always talked about, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I've always talked about, uh, you know, the reflection on parity. I guess this really kind of shows that there's a lot of pressure that's being put on our uh, 911 responders, and I'm talking about CPD, and I'm certainly not not trying to make anything less of any other public safety agency, but, you know, it just seems like we're, uh, we're, we're picking on one group somewhat right now, but, you know, I still question, personally, I still question, you have, we have the Georgia Highway Patrol, we have the Sheriff's Office, we have the Marshal's Office, I guess at the end of the year it's going to be all combined. Uh, you have Columbus State University Police, you have a Muskogee County School District Police. I mean, we've got correctional uh, officers and institutions that are around, and they all, <laughs> They all are involved in public safety. So uh, I just want to make it clear. I just hope everybody really tries to grasp what we're trying to accomplish here. And, and I'm in support of this resolution uh, because it's supporting what we already do. And that's something, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's something you can be proud of about your city and the things we do. And, you know, I come from a field where you fail. You just fail. Okay? You fail three out of ten times, you're one of the best there is in what I used to do. And nobody's perfect. I learned that a long time ago, and I learned a lot of mistakes coming up through the minors and still had to learn those lessons over and over in the big leagues, but you never quit. And I'm just thankful that we have people that there's so much pressure that's being put on them to quit. And one day, you know, you ask the question, <laughs> When you're really in trouble, who are you going to call if, you know, we, we just can't have the, the, the relationships and the unity and what, uh, what keeps our democracy solid in this country? So um, that's kind of in a nutshell why, why I'm supporting this resolution. Okay. I guess before we call the vote, I know the chief has been here for the entire uh, meeting, and I'm going to ask him if he wants to come up and make any comments because... Uh, I know they've had a productive meeting uh, at his office uh, with the leaders of some of those uh, sororities and the uh, women's organizations. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, and we did. We did have a productive meeting in my office. Uh, Councilor Barnes uh, brought the ladies there um, to talk with us about it. We sat down and we went through these line by line to find out that we already have every one of these in policy. Uh, the Columbus Police Department already adheres to all of these. Um, I think the desire may be to put these in our manual. They're already in the manual. 
Uh, they're not in the manual like one through seven. Uh, we could put these, uh, I guess, on the front of a website uh, saying that we already do these things. Um, but keep in mind, some of these may change. Uh, if, if you lock us in to these seven things in a resolution, if law changes, uh, if something else, policy and procedure changes, then some of these may change. Now, is the intention of the council to get us to come back any time that there may be a change and request permission for a change? No. Well, I, you know, Chief, I think, I think as we're working with the community, uh, I think as a, if for no other reason than from a transparency and notification standpoint, should any state law or anything change with regards to some of these, I think, I, I, I think some type of public comment on that is probably appropriate. Because uh, the way I read this, this is, uh, again, we keep saying affirmation. It's a reaffirmation by the council that we're in lockstep with the police department in, in what, what is in their manual now. And, um, but I, but I, mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for the council. It's entirely up to them with their vote. But I would think that uh, having an opportunity to, to make public any state law changes or anything that would impact these might make sense. There could be more mandatory training that could be set forth by the state. Now, of course, firearms is one of them. De-escalation is one of them. And um, community policing is one of them that were required by law to train each year. And we do that. And we record all of the information. And we also record the man hours or the training hours that each officer uh, attends. Uh, during this time frame, and I think last week or two weeks ago, I showed you my manual, the one that I've actually gone through and been uh, tested on the last two years, and well, and that'll come about again this year. Yes, sir, and I think it's I think it's a great opportunity for the public to hear what the police department actually does from training perspectives. Uh, I think it's a I think it can only be a good thing to to allow the <clears throat> police department to come up and, and talk about the things that they do on a regular basis. If you have a department that is state certified and nationally accredited, you have an excellent department. Uh, out of, uh, and, and I went through this last year, I, I mean last week, two weeks ago, go through it again. We meet 463 standards every day. And we have to prove to the agencies that we meet those every day. And we do that with policy and procedure, and we do that with um, offense reports that we take on the street as to what we have in those reports. Um, there's 729 agencies in the United States uh, out of 18,000 agencies that are in fact accredited and the Columbus Police Department is one of those. There's 137 agencies in the state of Georgia out of 650 agencies that are state certified and the Columbus Police Department is one of those. We have an extremely professional police department. Mayor, if I could. Uh, uh, Councilor Davis. Yes, Mayor, I just wanted to add again, I know the, the, if you read the resolution, it basically s says supporting policy, we're supporting the policy and guidelines that are already implemented. The command staff and police chief will update from time to time and keep on a website which governs, it basically puts on the, your, your uh, that governs the behaviors and duties and dis disciplinary rules. Uh, the other is just that the, the intention of the council is that the policies implemented by the police department set forth in the manual shall be designed and implemented, which protects the dignity and ci ci uh, civil rights of individuals during arrest. And that, I, I mean, I think that gives the CPD the flexibility to continue to make the changes whenever necessary. and do what they need to do to keep their policies and procedures in place and also meet the certifications and accreditations. Okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> without being redundant, uh, Council, I agree with what Council Davis said. It, it, it's not the intent of the resolution to require you to come to us for approval of any policy you put in. It gives you the complete authority and autonomy to do that on your own, just as you're doing now. 
we don't want to meddle in your business. Councilor Thomas made that point at the earlier meeting. We don't want to start setting your policy for you. You've been doing that, and we want you to continue to do that. And I think all this resolution does is say we agree with the seven items that are already in your, your policy and procedures manual. Okay. Thank right. you. We'll, we'll take care of it. Councilor Thomas. Uh, Chief uh, Boring, um, given the, some of the conversation that we've had here this afternoon about uh, resolution item number nine on the city attorney's agenda, um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay, now wait just a minute. I don't have, are, are you talking about the resolution itself as being item number nine? Yes. Okay, all right, I have that. Okay. I was I was looking for an item nine, and I only had seven. No, no, no. The no, resolution is item number nine on his agenda. I have, I have. Um, and do you think that this, the wording of this resolution, gives you the um, tools that you need to develop this policy manual and to keep it up to date and to, uh, all of those kinds of things? We already have a policy manual, and these are already in the manual not one through seven as you see it here. It may be located in different places within the manual. Now, we have, uh, and, and we're working on a program that will allow the citizens to get into, um, get into our computer and our policies and what we call Power DMS. But we have to do that with a generic code. Now the officers are given a code where they can get in and they can review things in the policy. Now, if we do that and put it on, say, for instance, a web, um, then we'll have to give the citizens a generic password in order to get in it, but they still can't monitor it all. There's things in there that you don't put out uh, into the public, and that could be the responses, the different ways you respond maybe to a armed robbery of a bank or SWAT practices and procedures or undercover drug investigations that's in our policy manual that we don't want to put it out to an individual that may come back later and use it against us. Are you okay with me voting yes on this? Yes, ma'am. You, okay. you, you vote the way you want to vote. <laughs> I, I'm just here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Councilor Davis. That is an interesting question. I, um, Chief, I, <laughs> with the website there, uh, I think you got your hands full as it is, but um, does that mean you're going to need somebody to, to uh, do all your IT work? Well, we've got it spread out around the department now uh, in the um, Bureau of Administrative Services, also in my office with the Office of Professional Standards. Everybody has a little piece of the pie, and it's all orchestrated around the staff table to where we know what everybody else is, is involved in and the policy or the procedure they're taking to make it happen. Uh, there's. We've got some really good folks in the department that can do some amazing things with a computer. Me not being one of those. But they know what they're doing, they can make it happen, and we're putting it out there for our citizens to see as well as the officers themselves to see. So I would have to get a little further into that and see exactly what we would have. Now, could we have a, a person dedicated to that solely? Yes but we may can handle it with what we already have. And I'd have to get a little deeper into it before I could tell you yes or no to that. But I do know that we've got a uh, budget hearing coming up September the 29th, so I might be able to let you know at that time. Thank you. Councilor Crabb. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to make a small, a minor change to this, just very small, where it says, this council supports and affirms the following policies which are addressed in the Columbus Police Department policy manual. I think it was you, Mayor, who said reaffirms, and I would like to make that, that um, small change to this to where it says supports and reaffirms the following policies. 
That's a motion. That's a motion. All right, there's a motion to amend. Is there a second? There is a second by uh, Councilor Thomas. All right, any discussion as to that change? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Anybody opposed? All right, passes. All right, do we have a motion and a second already to pass the ordinance as amended? The resolution, I'm sorry. A motion and a second to pass the resolution as amended. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? That's unanimous. All right, Mayor, that is item nine, the yes. Barnes substitute, which has passed as amended. And we've still got a couple of other items on the agenda, Mayor. Hold on just a second. Uh, Mr. City Manager, you have a comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to, um, yeah, I've heard a lot of discussion, as has been said, over the last two weeks. And um, really, just from city manager's um, seat, uh, want to um, say that I, I believe uh, what I've witnessed and what they've witnessed, those present here and watching by television, is a real uh, civic lesson. Um, I, um, you know, I had some real concerns about earlier, some things uh, said about how the vote was going to go, uh, which I think surely would show a split around the table and throughout this community. And and um, I was really um, happy when uh, I heard uh, Councilor Thomas um, at least throw out her thoughts or idea about um, how this might proceed in a way that does not uh, create further division throughout our community. Um, it's an opportunity to um, bring the community together. And uh, I, I was really excited to hear that come from uh, Councilor Thomas. Um, and it, 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 it made me know that our community um, is different in that it could have gone um, the, the full distance and that split, that divide um, uh, would have been even more apparent. Uh, but, um, but it came out on the table and, and I think what I witnessed and we all witnessed was a, a civic lesson uh, the way legislation is done. Um, Sisters United uh, had something that came down from their national level that they went to a, a city council with, and that council member um, had the city attorney to draft some legislation, uh, brought it to council, and then here as a public hearing, there was public discussion, much of it, and in the second meeting, you started to see the compromise come together. Uh, you started to see uh, minds start to open uh, that resulted in Councilor Thomas bringing to the table what she brought uh, that will bring about a study committee or a plan uh, that um, you might move forward with. And that plan will allow for public input uh, that plan, as I have listened, will have some give and take. Uh, that plan will allow for more discussion, further compromise, uh, and then a decision and a conclusion eventually. Uh, but the lawyer and uh, Councilor Walker Garrett uh, getting together with Councilor Barnes uh, and then Councilor Thomas coming up with what she did shows how it can all come together. Uh, when everybody's willing to give or take a little bit. And I think 
at the end of the day when you go through the process as you've outlined, um, I believe something good, uh, good for the community, good for um, all will, will come out of this. And I just couldn't pass up the opportunity uh, to say that I'm, I'm proud of the way I see it coming together um, when people give it and take it so a little bit. So to Pops Barnes and Walker Garrett and to Judy Thomas and to each of you who ultimately voted on the resolution and and support the way it's going to go forward with coming back with a plan. Uh, thank you. That's how we get it done in Columbus, Georgia. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Um, the City Attorney. All right. As I said, Mayor, we still got some business items on the agenda. Item five is the uh, first reading of an ordinance to amend Chapter 3, the Alcohol Code. This would create a new on-premise category for senior living facilities, and it would also uh, clear up a housekeeping matter with non-alcohol retail sales establishments like your beauty salon who might want to serve wine. They cannot do that on Sunday, but may do it Monday through Saturday. So this can, be, this can be yes. voted on today. I know Councilor Davis has some folks that he wants to bring up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. City Attorney. I really uh, would ask Council if we can uh, vote on this today and expedite it. And the reason being so is that we have a, a business here in our community. It's kind of unique. Uh, we just don't have anything in our UDO that covers it. I'd like to ask Ms. Laura and Ms. Carrie Joe if y'all would come up um, and let them tell you a little bit about it, but I'm thrilled. Uh, the Legacy Terrace uh, is in the district I represent. It's in Old Town, and a lot of you, you may not have heard of it. Legacy Reserve. Did I get that right? Legacy Reserve, not Terrace. Um, I had the chance to ride back there the other day and see it. I didn't even know it was back there in the beginning, but I had a chance to to drive back and take a look at it. It's absolutely beautiful, and it's going to provide a wonderful, wonderful uh, service and contribution to our community, especially with our with our seniors and and the things that they do. And I don't want to like go deep into it, but I think this is a model that's been going on around the country and what they do. It's kind of unique, but uh, they have a way that they like to take care of their uh, uh, residents and it involves this request today and certainly this is just a small this, this has got to get done but they've got a long way to go still they have to go to the state they have to go local to, to make all this happen as far as uh, uh, alcohol beverage license request on this so uh, in expediting this this would really help them to get their business where it needs to be because I think they're planning on opening soon. Why don't you ladies just tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on there? Thank you for having us. Um, Legacy Reserve at Old Town is independent living, assisted living, and memory care. So we serve the senior community 62 years of age and older. Um, the majority of our community is independent living. Um, I like to call it a cruise ship on land because there's so many different things that seniors are going to be allowed to do. Um, Clearly, during this pandemic, we're on some restrictions. So we don't open until August 31st. That's when we move in our first residence and independent living. Assisted living probably won't open until um, the end of September. Um, so we desperately need this to move forward. We do um, pride ourselves in being able to offer over 100 different activities a month for seniors, and then we have Freedom Dining that Laura will tell you more about, but Atlas Senior Living, if you want to look them up, um, that is our parent company, and they're out of Birmingham, Alabama, so I encourage y'all to look that up to get more information, but we are located off of Veterans Parkway and Williams Road um, in Old Town. Come out and see us. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous, and then Laura can tell you a little bit more about why we need this license. Good afternoon now. Um, thank you for having us. Um, Freedom Dining was something that um, Legacy, I was tasked by Atlas um, in 2017 in Lexington, Kentucky. And what I was able to do was come up with an 
idea that w made senior living absolutely someplace where family members wanted to come. Not an obligation, they wanted to come in, and I got to see it come to fruition. Um, with a liquor license, we were able to have parties. There's no gratuity ever involved in any of our things, but we have a restaurant, we have a cafe, and we have a sports bar. And I got to see, you know, I always say, I always had my parents in mind who were in their late 70s who have grown up with having choice in dining. Well, Legacy Reserve has allowed that to happen. All day dining, they can eat whenever they want, um, wherever they want, according to the way that they want to do it. So the liquor license, when I went to Kentucky and got it, there was a way for me to work that out so we can have common areas and be able to serve alcohol in the restaurant, the bar, and the cafe at different times. Um, when I went to pursue that here, there's no box to check. I, I was out of that box. <laughs> so I'm asking you today to make a box for me um, for senior living facilities. It is on the cutting edge, I know, um, but is this something that I think our, our world needs more of? More family <laughs> together. And more alcoholic beverage life. No. <laughs> well, Mayor, based on what the city attorney has advised us, I make a motion that we go ahead and pass this incorporate it into the UDO. All right. So motion a second to approve, uh, approve this ordinance. All in, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? It passes. Thank and you I, very much. And I'd like to welcome Laura. You're from Kentucky, right? I am. I just relocated here. She's from here. Kentucky. She's, uh, I think, Walker, uh, Councilor Garrett is your representative okay, now. I, so I, this is the guy you need to see. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then Carrie Joe, because I've known Carrie Joe for a long time. Carrie Joe used to uh, look out for our kids at uh, the children's home. So uh, she, you got a good teammate there. She'll do a good job. I know you. that. We have a fantastic team, and we're building it, and we're just thrilled to get in. So we're, we're getting close. New construction is always fun. So. Thank, Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That item has passed. Mayor, next item is an ordinance that can be voted on today, extending the state of emergency in Columbus through September 10, and this is consistent with uh, the governor's executive orders. There's a motion to approve and a second by Councilor House. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? It passes. All right. And lastly, we've got a, an ordinance providing for the demolition of certain structures. Can we get these put up on the screen? First property up is uh, 1420 26th Street, Dominique Overton, owner. If anybody is present in the audience on these properties, please raise your hand. Are there any pictures on here? Yes, sir. Okay. You can go to the next one. 2327 Hurd Street, uh, Ezra Jordan, Kara Betty Lunsford, owners, anybody present? All right. There's additional pictures of Hurd Street. And 3314 Urban Avenue, Lily B. Williamson, Kara Clarence Williamson, Anybody present? Okay. 2810 Peabody Avenue, Israel Torres, owner. Anybody here? Okay. And then the last property, 6526 Dorsey Drive, Curtis Lark, owner. Anybody present? Mr. Pruitt, that covers these, and they will be voted on in two weeks. 
<clears throat> unless you've got an urgent necessity for a vote today. No, sir. Okay. Um, it's fine to wait two weeks, and this is the first yeah. group um, since I got in the position that we're going to bring forward. We still do have some funding. Um, you know, we had the million dollars last year. We still have some of that left over in addition to additional funding we got this year. So uh, we're going to continue to work on the list and, and bring them back to you often. And if I could, it's not related to demolitions. Um, I just want to kind of lift up Mr. Pruitt for the job he did. We had a, um, you know, we've been working for over a year on uh, trying to get the owners of the Ralston to provide quality and safe living conditions and have been unsuccessful. So we initiated what was a lengthy process in relocating those residents. Uh, and because of some safety concerns, they had to discontinue service, uh, electrical and water service to that, to that facility because the two don't mix and they were beginning to because of some leaks in there. Um, and still wet behind the ears and fresh in his new job, um, I rode by at about 8 o'clock, 8.30 that morning and Ryan was out there. So I stopped, got in the way for a little while, and I left. On the way home at, at about 5.15, Ryan was still out there and did a magnificent job by all accounts uh, of facilitating a very difficult situation with the, have to thank the sheriff for uh, her folks who actually did a sweep through the building to make sure that nobody was in the building when the services were discontinued. Ryan was in charge of all that. And uh, I just wanted to tell the city manager, it's, it's nice to know right away that you made the right choice. But thank you, Ryan, for your, for your work on that. Thank you. And I also need to give credit to uh, Joey Sturkin, he's our property maintenance coordinator and inspector, so he's the one that, that writes up the inspections and reports, and so I couldn't do what I need to do without him, so. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you, Mr. Pruitt. You did a great job on that this week. Uh, Councillor Crabb? Where did you, where were we able to place them all? They've been working on relocating the residents with vouchers from the, we had actually a, a third party company that came in from HUD and worked with the local housing authority. And they just found them different uh, places and residences around the, uh, around the, the by cities actually. <clears throat> Some actually had family in other communities and they wanted to get closer so they took that opportunity to move forward. Uh, but but um, we did have Pat Frey on site uh, because there were a few that just didn't want to leave and we were concerned that there wouldn't be enough time to find them permanent ho housing so we had we had somebody on site to help with the uh, emergency housing in, in in the interim but um but yeah to my knowledge there were there were i think it, as of the the date that the service was discontinued there were about five or six still in a hotel somewhere but all the others uh I think it was almost 200 people had, had found permanent permanent housing. Councilor Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, due to the delay of the ordinance that Councilor Barnes and Councilor Allen have proposed, uh, I know we're, we're going to have a lot of hard work going on over the next few weeks. And uh, I have, as you are aware, because you've been working with me on my non-discrimination ordinance that J.C. Jenkins and uh, the assistant city attorneys worked very hard on for 13 months. I would like to delay that vote for 30 days. The reason being, I don't want, I want to be able to focus on working with Councilor Barnes and, and Councilor Allens and on getting this addressed first. And then I know there were some other councilors who had concerns and I've already talked to the Superior Court judges and the Office of Dispute Resolution about possible ways that they might be able to assist us. Uh, with that legislation and participating in it. Uh, some recommendations came from other counselors that I think we might be able to incorporate, but uh, I would like to delay that to uh, for 30 days, I believe. Mr. C. Attorney, did you say that'd be the first business meeting in September? That's right. I don't have the exact date. It'd be mid-September. And I want to get this out to the Chamber and Development Authority as well for input. And that is a motion. Yeah, thank All you. right, seconded by Councilor Barnes. Any discussion on the delay of the NDO ordinance? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a critical ordinance, and I, I, I think the fact that it's moving forward, we knew there would be a lot of peeling back of the layers and discussing. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, much like the earlier compromise or, or um, creating an infrastructure for compromise. I think it's a, it's, it's a good thing to continue to have dialogue about. So, good deal. 
And Mayor, just one more thing publicly. I wanted to, um, on behalf of our office, thank Councilor Valerie Thompson for her service during these past months. Uh, she jumped in with her feet in the fire on legislation and a pandemic, and we appreciate her service. Thank you. Abs absolutely. And we will uh, we'll miss her anyway, so we'll drag her back, and then we'll, we'll have an excuse to give her, uh, present a resolution or something. That's all we had. All right. We'll move on to the uh, public agenda. We've got uh, Ms. Teresa Elamin. Hang on, lost my place here. Uh, representing the Southern Anti Racism Network regarding public safety. Ms. Elamin. You give your name and your address, and then we'll start your uh, five minutes once you once you do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Teresa Alamine, 3911 Steam Mill Road. And I say ditto on uh, Council Member Valerie Thompson jumping in, and I'll just say I'll see you at church. I love the outdoor church. So I'll see you at church. Um, I just want to say that uh, this has been an important civic uh, engagement lesson, but not exactly in a good way. Uh, I kept thinking, this is not what democracy looks like. Uh, when you have a first reading that is continued and then continued some more on a very hot button issue in the community. I kept thinking of things, Council Member Barnes, like justice delayed is justice denied. After hearing about the deaths of people in police custody, my heart was breaking for those families. So I would urge you, uh, Council Member Thomas, to show courage, courage. Because that's the one thing that I think we expect is political courage from the people we elect when it comes to difficult decisions, especially as it relates to public safety. My main purpose here, before the hearings, and I got to say so much then, uh, was to talk about um, the Public Safety Advisory Commission and about community policing as it relates to the budget, Madam Budget Chair, because you have a difficult uh, time coming up, as I understood the plan, Madam budget chair, uh, is that in September, uh, you would settle the question on the budget. Trust that will not be delayed, uh, because the question on what the budget really is needs to be settled. Uh, as I understand it, 38 percent of your budget is for public safety, maybe even specifically just the police department. Well, 38 percent is a big chunk. And what we have seen through this process, which is continuing and continuing, is that public safety is a community priority. But not just because, Mr. Davis, uh, the Columbus Police Department is the primary law enforcement agency. They are the ones who go out and arrest people and do things. Yes, we have the jail and they have their problems with people engaging in inappropriate behavior towards people who are in the jail. We have that. We have all the arrests that take place by the Muscogee County School District Police Department. This is a police state if I ever saw one. When I came here and learned there were three police agencies, I thought, my goodness, why do they need all of that? 
Well, you have to begin to put money, Mr. Huff, in the community policing you say you believe in. So you have to begin to shift some of that money from the police department into some real citizens, real citizens operation. We're not just random uh, people out here, uh, council member uh, Crab. I say bureaucrats and politicians are a problem for grassroots democracy. I'd like to think that most of you who are elected would not function as bureaucrats and politicians. I'd like to think you would like to avoid that because what we really want to see from you is some real engagement for the citizens. Democracy from the bottom up. You have had hours of public hearings. That's a lot of hearing. You've heard from the community all over, and overwhelmingly, the community is for subpoena power, if you were listening, if you were listening. So I say, let's get ready for the budget, because unfunded mandates are not really that good. So you got to figure out a way to fund some things that lift up the citizens. So when you talk about the budget, think of public safety as public citizen input and do the things that involve more community policing and less chokeholds and other things that the police unions will fight Ms. for. Ms. Elamine, Five minutes is up. I, actually, I am so sorry. You actually, did let okay. me go. I, you were on a roll. I, I gave you 40 extra seconds by, by I appreciate action. it. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I will see you next time. Thank you, ma'am. Hope you were listening, Madam Budget Chair. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager, you want to hit you light? Sure. Thank you. Your agenda, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to go to number two on my agenda. Number one was the appointment of the Public Works Director. And number two, I've got uh, Georgia Department of Transportation providing clear guide and regional integrated transportation information system access to the traffic engineering division. Um, ClearGuide analyzes large amounts of complex transportation data to produce real-time and historical visualizations uh, that help identify problem areas before traffic congestion worsens. And so we want to take advantage of this, and we are asking your approval to acknowledge, sign, and execute the data usage agreement, and to also join the I-95 Quarter Coalition as an affiliate member uh, by the Georgia Department of Transportation at no additional cost to the city. Motion approved by the Mayor Pro, Pro Tem. Second from Councilor House. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Anybody opposed? Passes, sir. Next, I've got a street acceptance uh, portion of Hollow yeah. Pan Drive, Longleaf Pan Drive, uh, and Pan Chase Drive in uh, Section 17 Garrett Pines. Um, Approval is requested to accept. Uh, the street has been improved to meet the requirements. Motion approved by the Mayor Pro Tem. Second by Councilor House. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed. That passes. I've got uh, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, Fiscal Year 20, Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Grant. It's $96,350. No local match required. It's for our public safety. Motion to approve by Mayor Pro Tem. And second by Councilor House. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Got an adult drug felony uh, court grant. It's $350,000 or the amount accepted uh, or approved. Uh, was, I want you to go ahead and tell us about that, but, but there was a motion by Councilor Huff and second by Mayor Pro Tem. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? You would continue, sir. Sure. I'm sorry. Again, it's a $350,000 grant, 
uh, with a catch match that is satisfied with current uh, salary and benefits uh, to the current case manager of $36,000. Uh, and um, but it's uh, from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for the operations of the Muscogee County Adult Felony Drug Court, um, and um, the requested grant includes amount. Um, uh, the amount includes both operating and personnel costs that may be adjusted to conform with current or future policies. And so we will be coming back to you, Mayor and Council with um, some uh, amended or revised policies regarding how we pay uh, employees who receive multiple grants in a single agencies um, so that um, their pay is consistent with our CCG merit system. So we'll be coming back to you on, on that. Uh, and so I have purchases. Uh, first, I've got ammunition and munitions for public safety. Uh, it's $191,077.40 is the estimated annual contract. Uh, we're asking your approval as for all of the various public safety agencies. Motion to approve A. Uh, and I second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Anybody opposed? I've got a. There's a motion second to approve items B, C, D, and E. Anybody want one pulled for discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? And so, all right, that passed. Mr. City Manager, if you would just run through those, please. Sure. Uh, B was a refuse uh, truck cabin chassis replacement uh, for public works, is $111,866.60. Uh, C is an annual subscription for Sheriff's Office Online Training. It's $30,504.80. Uh, D, uh, storage facility rental payment for the Sheriff's Office, $32,700. Uh, payment to River Mill Storage. And E, uh, I've got replacement park benches and trash receptacles for historic district. And uh, Mayor, we've uh, and council, uh, this is about the third time we've done the support in the historic district uh, as they work to uh, replace benches and receptacles in the historic district. It's really something the city should be doing, but uh, private citizens step up, raise money to do things, and then they'll ask us to help out. And I, I know that they spoke to you, Councilor Thomas, about this, and so. Um, we are bringing it, we brought it to you for your approval. You've done it before and we wanted to do it again. Uh, and we appreciate it and I know that the historic district appreciates uh, the city's support. So that's what that is. And um, with that, Mayor, I've got a number of updates. Uh, and um, the first update uh, is advocacy through art, uh, public arts initiative to support racial justice uh, Hannah Israel, Najee Dorsey, Sharika Day, and Becca Sajak. Um, I believe uh, I'll call Deputy City Manager Hodge to the to the mic, but I believe they are here. Uh, Becca Sajak, she's coming. Uh, oh, they were upstairs. Okay, uh, but. Um, And I believe there's a PowerPoint that um, they have. Yes, thank you. Sorry, we are a few seconds late. Um, hi, I'm uh, Rebecca Zajac. I am uh, part of the Dragonfly Trail System, um, which we work with you guys on all the time. But I'm actually um, here today uh, just as a on my personal note of um, wanting to see more public art in Columbus. So um, I have with me Hannah Israel and Shrika Day, and we'll be giving a short presentation. <clears throat> in response to the killing of George Floyd and the protests to support racial justice, many of us were trying to figure out how to process what our peaceful response would be, as well as what was within our capabilities. The three of us here today represent a much larger group from the community that decided uniting through art and lifting up the work of our local 
black and brown artists would be our response. And advocacy through art was formed. Over the past three months, we have been tirelessly working to source funding, identify partners, and secure necessary approvals from for four public art initiatives, which Hannah will walk you through today. In short, uh, we have worked with city leadership, Pam and her team have been great, to identify a wall on city property to erect a mural, and we are here today to receive your feedback and secure an approval for that space. And Hannah uh, will come talk you through the projects we're looking to do. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, City Council members, Mayor Henderson. Uh, it's an honor and thank you for giving us an oppor opportunity to share information about our proposal as advocacy for the arts um, and social justice. Uh, we are here to present a proposal for a mural and other art initiatives uh, for change in Columbus, Georgia. My name again is Hannah Israel. I'm a faculty at Columbus State University and an arts advocate. Um, as an educator, I believe in the power art has played a role in social justice, education, community building, social activism, and social movements. It provides a universal language that gives us voice to individuals and communities which can be accessible across social boundaries. Who are we? Our group consists of volunteers from our community who are advocates and leaders, CSU students, alumni, faculty, local artists, art enthusiasts, and friends from different backgrounds that have identified a need for unity in our community. We are the right group to take on this initiative because we share the common goal of celebrating cultural and racial differences through art. Collectively, we all have experience within the community of managing large-scale projects and initiatives that bring awareness to the need for representation and justice. We envision this working committee as a true collaboration between multiple community-focused entities, such as CSU, we Cannot Walk Alone Artist Group, Columbus 2025, Columbus Chamber of Commerce, City of Columbus, Black Art in America, the Columbus site, Kids, Kids um, Per Nurse, the Dragonfly Trails, Turnaround Columbus, and the Do Good Fund. I want to share an experience of why I'm standing here in front of you and why this means so much to me. In 2007, I made a 12-hour trip from Columbus, Georgia to Washington, D.C. with a group of women from all race to join others for the Women's March. As we were walking hand in hand along the streets of the nation's capital, I was fortunate to be swaying with several women singing, We Shall Not Be Moved. I say, as I turned to the woman next to me and said, You have such a beautiful voice, ma'am. She said, I have been singing this song for more than 60 years. She continued to tell me that she walked beside her mother, John Lewis, Dr. King, among others, in the 60s, and she can't believe she was still walking for justice, and it's in 2017. At that moment, tears poured in her eyes. And at that moment, her burden became my burden, and her walk became my walk. Her story lit a fire inside me, a fire that others like in the group here with me and the ones who are not here has inside them. How do we use this fire as educators, artists, and advocates? How do we share our ideas for peace and unity without being controversial? As artists, we need to know our subjects and our environment. We need to get the government involved in what we are doing. We need to get our community to be part of it. As Dr. King said from an excerpt of his, I had a dream speech, which was the speech that the women heard as a 10-year-old girl in August 28, 1963. 
We cannot walk alone, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. As a community, we cannot turn back. For Hector Arroyola, Jarvis Likes, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Tamir Rice, and so many others. We can only walk ahead for them so that others will be freed from the same fate that they had which shock, horrified, and enraged the world. Our, subject, our project, Advocacy Through Art, aims to propose murals and, up, and utilize series of other thought-provoking public art initiatives to create dialogue and action around racial justice issues while activating underutilized public spaces in our community. By utilizing public spaces, we create a place to share cultural experiences with others that build connection and unity. In addition, we seek to improve equitable access to, to the arts by focusing our efforts in areas devoid of public art, as well as intentionally commissioning artists that more accurate, accurately reflect the racial makeup of our community. Together, we cannot walk alone group, Black Art in America, Kidspreneur, Columbus State University, and community planners came up with a series of public art initiatives. The first of this initiative is a public art mural. The, fish, the vision for this project is to commission local black and brown artists to create a mural supporting the idea of social justice and community healing. Similar to many other cities who use the message of Black Lives Matter, healing and changes in social justice. We are asking to use a wall on the corner of Fifth and Taubaton Road to create a mural. This high traffic but accessible wall sits prominently at the confluence of several neighborhoods and across the street from Piedmont Columbus Regional. A second project, We Cannot Walk Alone Public Art Display, it's an exhibition uh, by artists who support and end racial injustice and police brutality. We had a call for submission to anyone in the community to submit digital artworks of photographs that creatively express their experiences in helping amplify the voices of marginalized areas. We received over 100 of these submissions. You can use the clicker to show them. Oh, I'm so, oh I can. Here we go. Okay. Okay. The exhibition will be displayed in an online gallery and as a public art installation on the River Walk. I'm not sure if you noticed, um, about sometime in April, we had an exhibition at the River Walk of six feet apart, um, which are uh, works by students from Columbus State University. Our third initiative is a mobile art container. A central goal of advocacy through the art is to improve access to art in underserved communities. To accomplish this, we will use a shipping container that's been converted into a gallery space. This, gal this contain art container will be placed in several locations around Columbus throughout the year. Local and regional international artists will host free public art events an art inter intervention and exhibition to create a truly immersive arts experience. In addition, the exterior facade of the shipping container will be painted so that when programming is not taking place, the shipping container will serve as a public sculpture. Our final initiative is a Unity Film event. This program will feature a screening of the stories we can tell by local artist Sammy Saxon with the help of another local artist, Tony Pettis. The stories we can tell is about people from our community. Their stories about oppression and race. The film block will also document, will also feature documentary films about social justice and civil rights. We are still searching for an appropriate venue. In closing, Art for social change is art with a vision and intention. It is an artistic and creative cultural practice 
that may operate in traditional, not in non-traditional mediums. The notion of social justice, justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privilege within a society, can be expressed and expressed and advocated in myriad ways. Individuals may protest, discuss, and raise awareness. All of this may ultimately change legislation. But what really changes attitudes is art. Public art, specifically community murals, have been proven many times to serve as voices for those who wish to be heard and a platform for those who wish to listen. We need your approval and support to move forward. Thank you. And thank you. Anybody else have any comments, Sharika? I have, we have a last speaker, Sharika Day. I'm gonna ask her something. Uh, Sharika, just before you get started, Mayor Pro Tem had a question. I'll, I'll wait if she finishes. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Sharika Day, and um, I'm a resident in the community. I'm also a strong art advocate. Um, I work at AFLAC. Um, I also work with the kidpreneurs under Minor in Business. Um, the main purpose to teach them about entrepreneurship and also to take their hobbies and turn those into um, businesses. And I do work a lot with kids that have talents as far as artists. And one thing that I want to emphasize to them is the fact that our community supports artists as they grow up. Um, we have the Rainey McCullers School of the Arts, and I do have a couple of students that go there. And so my whole purpose for them is to see that um, as they move through their school career and eventually move to um, full-time jobs or careers, they have the option to pursue art as a hobby, uh, or not as a hobby, I'm sorry, as a career. Um, a lot of times what, what happens is um, artists are not um, given their, that platform where they can take their passion and really run with it. Um, a lot of times they're having to work, you know, and then what they really enjoy doing is um, viewed as a hobby. And so I've had a lot of artist friends that have been in the Columbus area that live here that have um, truly are really good at what they do. But what they're trying to do is turn that, um, to get that, their passion embraced and for the community to, to accept that. And so with this project, the reason why I jumped on board was because I saw this as an opportunity to take our artists in, to give them an option, um, because we want to collaborate, obviously, with different artists in the community, to give them an opportunity to show what they can do, and also to show that the community embraces who they are and what their talents are about. And I feel like this will be one of those um, starting points for that. Um, we do recognize that what we're trying to represent and put out in the community, I think Hannah mentioned that um, it could be controversial. And so we're taking all that into consideration as we sat in the meeting and listened to a lot of the stories that were going on. Um, we do recognize that we don't want to put anything out there that would offend anybody, but we also want to have that platform so that people whose voices are not necessarily always heard have the opportunity to have their voices heard and to be represented. And we feel like we have the, the starting point for that. Um, we want to, um, as Hannah mentioned, move forward with this in different phases. But eventually, we would love for the city to see this as an opportunity to embrace our artists and maybe move forward with other projects that they could actually pursue. Um, we love what has been done with the uptown area. I always speak highly of that because I feel like that area is high trafficked, um, it's vibrant, it's, it's colorful, people are attracted to go down there. And so we would love to see that same energy expanded beyond the uptown area so that we can see art represented in other spaces. And again, this gives us the chance to do that and also to embrace and see like somebody that looks like me or someone that ha that you know, looks like my nephew up somewhere in Columbus, the power that that would bring um, anybody that sees that. And then also connecting um, with Columbus 2025. I'm aware that there are different branches um, of that initiative, one of them being vibrant and connected um, communities. 
And so with that, we also feel like what we're working on gives that platform, gives that opportunity for our community to continue to be connected as well as vibrant and then showing um, the black and brown community that they are embraced and accepted um, and that our community is ready for that. Um, we're, we're eager about this project because we know that um, with everything going on right now, this is the perfect time and opportunity for us to embrace that. Um, and so again, as was mentioned, we're just looking for um, approval. We have a spot in mind that we would love to move forward on. And so we would just um, love to have you all um, take our project into consideration and, and approve it. So that's all. Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, I'm sorry. You cut yourself off. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple of questions. Um, it, it concerns me with not your advocacy group, but what do we do with others that come up and want to do the same or similar things? Uh, we're opening a door here, and we're setting a precedent, as I understand it, for others to come in and, and uh, exercise their right to free speech. What I would like to ask specifically of you is uh, what's the size of the display and how often will that rotate with between other artworks? For the specific mural spot, do you remember the square footage? It's 450 square feet. 4,000. 4, 4,000. 4,050 square feet. Um, and just like any mural uh, that is erected, you can paint over it at any point in time. If the city decides to go in a different direction after five or 10 years or a year, um, or, it, or you know the paint fades or something like that. But ultimately, the, the wall that we're asking for, which can I, um, if you guys would bring up the presentation, I'll just uh, page through to the wall so everybody's on the same page. Um, you know, the wall is the ownership of the city of Columbus, so ultimately that's up to your um, to, to your decision. And I will say we uh, reached out to the city leadership two months ago um, because we thought it was, instead of deciding to do this on a private wall, we really wanted to do it on um, in a public space. And so we reached out to the city two months ago to get this conversation going um, and make sure that we were taking adequate steps and proper steps of approval to get to this point because um, we knew that we were kind of the first group to be doing this. Um, and so we've been working with um, city leadership to make sure that we're following whatever guidelines that they put out for us. We've also reached, we've also reached out to Ronald McDonald House in Piedmont. I apologize. We're having difficulty with our systems up here. Um, when my mic's on, I can't hear you because I get an echo. So I'm going to turn my mic on off again. Would you give me the dimensions again of the, the artwork? Sure. It's 4,050 square feet at the corner of 5th and Tobleton. And that's the um, and that's the mural wall. And we have been working, uh, or started conversations with the Ronald McDonald House and their executive director, as well as Piedmont Columbus and their leadership team, um, to make sure that we're sharing the uh, design when once we have it and that we get their feedback, um, because it is in a very prominent location that um, can be associated with both of those organizations. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, the, the size of the, I see the size now, it kind of makes sense uh, regarding the, the 4,000 square feet. The size really concerned me when you first said that, but in looking at it, 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 it doesn't, it gives you a different uh, perspective. Will this be one large piece or is it gonna be divided up into different artworks? I think we envision that it'll be one large piece because the design will be primarily led um, by the artists that are commissioned to do this. Uh, once we see that design, we'll, oh, sorry. Um, 
we envision it to be one large piece. We are commissioning, like I said, local black and brown artists to design it. So we're going to let them um, take that space and design what they see should fit there. But we, we assume it's going to be one large consistent piece. Cycle again, so. Rotation cycle. Say that again, oh, repeat what sorry. you said. Um, our vision for it is that it'll be one large piece. Uh, the, there's um, local artists that we're hiring, commissioning to design this mural. And so given the themes that um, our community, our, our working group is interested in, we'll see what they come up with. Um, but yes, one large mural that uh, spans that entire space. apologize for the back and forth um, so you, you put up a piece of art how long will that be there or will it be divided or, or just any artist can go up and paint theirs after a certain period of time or how does it work how do you rotate um, since the wall is the ownership of the city of Columbus that's actually up to to the city um, what we see with most murals is that their lifespan, depending on the materials you use, is somewhere between 10 and 15 years before the paint gets faded. Um, but of course, if two years or five years or seven years from now, um, that there is a reason to change that, that's up to the city. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so the intent of the of your group is to put up a piece of art that will be there for several years. Uh, I, I guess Correct. I'm, I'm confused on, you said there were several artists involved and you, they were going to be able to individually display their artwork. So how is that going to work? It'll be all part of one piece. It'll all fit into one another, be a concept that they do, and each artist will do a portion of it. Well, that's what I asked earlier, and that's not what I heard. Um, just, sorry, this, it's for clarification purposes, our public, there's four public arts initiatives. One is an outdoor art exhibition that has 16 different pieces of work, which are primarily um, digital illustrations or photography. Those will be um, put up in an outdoor installation along the river walk. So that's one project. A uh, second project is the mobile art container, which we'll have painted on the outside, and then that will go to different neighborhoods, and we'll have um, experiential learning with artists in underserved neighborhoods. So that's project two. Project three is the film event. And then the one that we're actually coming to you guys for approval is for the mural. And that mural will have multiple artists working on a design, but it'll be one consistent piece. So I know, it's, I know it's not the clearest that we're doing four projects, but we're only coming here for one approval of, for one of the four projects. And I apologize, but we did want to show you guys how this one mural is part of a larger um, constellation of projects. I, I, I guess my concern is the timeline that it'll be there opening the door for others to come in and want to do similar things and cause controversy in the city. Um, it, and then the, du the duration of it being there. I mean, if, if somebody else comes in and wants to put something there, or are we locked in with you? If there's another art group that comes in, or I mean, how do, do they come in and want to petition us to put something at that particular location? I mean, it, you see, you see the how it gets wrapped around the axle pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm real concerned about this. And um, in most cases, in public art, could you take um, your mask off, please? Oh, sorry. In most cases, um, with public art, this if it goes through the city, you could um, ask us to have it at a certain period of time. We don't own the wall. We don't own the wall. We're just trying to let other people express the things they want to express. 
it is a good time to do that, especially with the intentions that we are uh, and initiatives that we are we presented before you. Um, in, in, and in other respects, um, the Uptown Columbus, I was part of um, the group who initiated the sculptures in the downtown area. And that really was a remarkable moment in, in, in the cityscapes and really elevated the, and connected people in a cultural, in a different cultural way. And we had um, painted a Hans mural in 2015. Um, it's been there for over, um, you know, a, a 10 years now, and it still looks vibrant as ever. We haven't had anyone say, can we paint over that building? Um, and I know that there's constructions going on now, but they might have other ideas in the wall. But for the moment that it's been there, it's impacted our community in many different ways. And most of the time, it is a positive way. Controversy also brings other things that are good. It brings conversation. And that's the kind of thing we would like to get from people. Because conversation starts communication. And that's, that sometimes is the lack that we have within each other. And art really makes a difference. It brings different issues in front of us that some of us might not want, want to talk about. And this is, this is why that location is such a prominent location, to display something very important such as this. I was just going to add, um, too, I don't know that it will be, maybe for your office it may be, overwhelming um, is the, the vibe that I'm getting from your, your questions. But I just feel like if we start this, um, the different doors that this opens up for art to be um, installed in the community, why is that a bad thing? Um, I, I think it's time for Columbus to start doing that. You've got a lot of other big cities that have really embraced um, the arts. They have an arts district. They have spots all, all over town that people gravitate to just to come for the arts. So I think this could be a big thing and a good thing for Columbus to start um, appreciating and making those um, spots available in Columbus. I mean, it could be, I'm just putting this out there, that maybe there should be an arts committee or, or something in the, within the city that, that starts to really um, show that we, we're ready to take that on. Because um, like I said, we have various, you've got Columbus State, you've got um, Rainy McCullers, you have these other um, institutions that are about teaching art and the importance of art and the influence art has in the community and making that into a career. So why couldn't we start showing that that is exactly what Columbus wants to do and embrace that and give those opportunities to, to the artists that are looking for that? So I, I see it as a positive. I understand it may, it may open up doors to where everybody is flocking in because they're ready, but just look at what it does for the, the plus side of a community. Well, unfortunately, we, we have to live with both sides. Yeah. Uh, we, we're not, we, I, don't take my questions as anti-art. Right. I'm not anti-art. My wife paints and, and uh, so I, I, my mother paints. They got plenty of pictures out there if anybody's interested in any of those. <laughs> but it, it, it just concerns me the Pandora box we're opening when we start allowing this. I would like to propose that we allow this to go forward on a 12-month schedule and then revisit it after that period of time. I, I was just going to add, um, it can, is it reverberating? Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to add, um, if the city is, would be willing, we, we have uh, lots of resources of um, how other communities have done this, or, and we would be happy to maybe put something together so that it could, there could a year from now be an actual um, board that maybe oversees public art in Columbus or something. But I think we would be happy to at least present something to you guys in the interim um, and working with the, uh, culture, is it the Columbus Arts Alliance as well, who does get some city funding, um, like maybe 
the two groups could come together and figure out something that we could present to council where we do have something that's more formalized so you don't have to worry about us year after year coming up and you know um, asking for permission to use a space well and, and let me just <clears throat> say that um, we they approached I think they sent the initial email to the mayor and city manager and staff uh, back on about uh, mid-June uh, June 19th to be exact and um, and they had a number of options I, I tell you when uh, staff uh, first approached uh, me about because um, I wanted a better understanding of what they were looking to try and accomplish and and you see in their PowerPoint they show you uh, some of the other communities who have uh, painted streets and uh, I think that was one of the initial options. And um, I um, did indicate I didn't think that we were ready to paint a street at this time. And um, then they came back with uh, the wall. And um, I thought they should come and share it with you. And if you are supportive after your questions will have been answered at this meeting of a wall, uh, we will come back at the next council meeting uh, with a, a memorandum of understanding. And if you want to limit it to um, 12 months, uh, then um, that's we can do a memorandum of understanding with that understanding that it would be for 12 months. And, uh, and of course, we could give them the option to renew, to continue with that same wall if it's in good shape and there are no issues or concerns and of course if they uh, if we want to uh, if they want to consider something uh, a change in the wall to something different uh, then it would have to come back to council for review and approval well i listen i, I understand where mayor pro tem's coming from but i gotta tell you i get a little excited about what this may represent i think public art can be a good thing all the studies seem to indicate that it gives communities a sense of community and a sense of place, and it draws an, an attention to areas. I would love to see uh, this maybe take place, but as the city manager has pointed out, it's, it's still our wall. So if if we and, and art is is the the idea of art is to stretch people's appreciation, let them see things that maybe they wouldn't have painted themselves, but find the find the beauty in it. And it also helps deliver, you know, it helps helps address a, a, a societal uh, conversation that may not be easy to begin. Uh, so I, I think it could be positive. I, I, I think that um, we can, we still control it so that we can, if, if frankly, and I don't mean this ugly, but if it gets up and we don't like it after 12 months, we paint over it. It's our wall, right? But what I envision, I think what might be really neat is not even every seven to 10 years, but every three years, two years, you get a new wave of artists coming through the, the art school at CSU, I promise you there'll be a new topic at that time mm -hmm. and, and let them have, have the freedom to try to, you know, paint over it and just redo it. And that could be a focal point for the community eventually. So um, I think it's a great idea. I do think the devil's in the details. We need to make sure that we've got something that is really promoting unification of the community and, have, and, and sparking those conversations that we're all looking for a way to start having. So uh, I'm at, we've got a couple other counselors. I'm sorry. I, I just I, I understand the concerns, but I, I think this could be a really good thing for that for that area. Councillor Crabb. Thank you. I like this idea also. However, the creative part in me loves this idea. The logical part in me wants a memorandum of understanding. Um, Okay, so from a financial standpoint, I don't want the city to pay for it. <laughs> um, and then also from the, just the protection of the city and the to kind of prevent any possible um, controversy that we would have to deal with, I would probably want to see the artwork maybe give us two or three options to choose from, um, and council has final approval. Those are two things that that would make me feel a little bit better of putting my stamp of approval on this. 
All right, Councilor Thomas. Um, the first thought that came to my mind was, uh, I've heard several of you folks say, the city owns that wall. Um, Tobleton Road is a state road. Uh, if, you, if you're going north on Fifth Avenue um, toward Hamilton Road, that intersection is Hamilton Road and Tobleton Road, which are both state um, roads. And I would just want to make sure that we're not doing anything um, that, that the state has approved this if necessary. I don't know if it's necessary or not, but that, that intersection was um, redesigned and rebuilt uh, by the state of Georgia not by Columbus. And so um, have we have we checked with them? Is it okay with the state for us to do this? Well, Who and, owns that wall? All of those questions, Mr. City well, Manager. Yeah, and of course I've been told by staff that it's our wall. And so I, 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 I'm going to assume, and but we'll verify again, that staff checked out and verified that it's our wall before they told me that it's our wall. And so, um, um, and, and, and also, you know, I did ask uh, them to check with uh, surrounding properties like the McDonald House in Piedmont, um, and I know that's in the works, but uh, that was one requirement that I gave them to um, get some feedback from uh, area uh, businesses uh, or those around there, because you'll see it from uh, John B. Amos, you'll see it from the entryway to Piedmont, and um, and and uh, and then the McDonald House. So they are working. They've made contact with them, and I think they're wa uh, waiting to get that feedback. And so I am getting the note that our city engineer uh, said we check with the state, and uh, and it's our wall. So, um, but. Um, but again, uh, they came about mid-June, um, and and I consider uh, they are young, uh, millennial, uh, diverse, ethnic, racial group of people working together, um, trying to do something. And 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 as I said, their initial project was they wanted to do a street much like the streets that you saw in Charlotte that they had on the on the uh, PowerPoint, if you'll show those again. Uh, I know you've seen them, but um, I, um, I just, um, that's, that's something I, I just didn't think we were. One, one question, if I may. Um, so f this is one part of the process, one, one of the four components of the project that you guys are talking about. Are you gonna come back and, and discuss or I don't know that there'd be any permission that needed to be given because it, it would be more private enterprise. But uh, but I, are, are y'all going to come back and just kind of brief counsel when you get ready for the next component? Um, most of the other projects will happen on um, private property, and we've gotten approval for all of those so far. But if we choose um, to have the art container move to a public space, we would absolutely come back here okay. and ask and for approval. Um, and we also, it, this project, all four of these projects are completely funded by the community um, and we have the funding needed to, to do all four of these. And then um, I just wanted to mention in the MOU, we we ha and they made it clear to us before we came to council that um, we would be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep if anything were to happen to it. So we're um, prepared for that. Hannah has worked very hard. So with I, I think what threw me was the Riverwalk comment about uh, putting some of those on the Riverwalk. Yep, um, that's going to go on the retain tentatively going on the retaining wall um, of W.C. Bradley's property where we had six okay. feet under. So we're working uh, with Pace. Um, who supports the project? We just have to get one more final approval that'll come this week. Gotcha. That's that was my confusion. So, thank you. All right. So, what's the uh, what is the desire of council? Well, Mayor, obviously we were not trying to get a vote today. All right. That's my my misunderstanding. And, I thought uh, you were looking for approval today. No, no I uh, will come back at the next meeting uh, with a memorandum of understanding. 
uh, that will have, um, you know, a time and what you can and can't do and so forth about the wall as kind of mentioned by Councilor Crabb to lay out the details. And um, it will indicate that, you know, we need to see the design before and approve before it goes on. And just a memorandum of understanding. Okay. And so we'll bring that back at the next meeting and, and then right. ask you for a vote at that time. All right. Well, ladies, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Huff. Quick question. Is Najee Dorsey being one of the painters? Uh, yes, he's actually part of our planning committee. Um, Black Art in America is supporting the projects as well. Uh, and so him and his wife will be uh, part of the artist group. And they're helping us also source some of their contacts regionally okay. to help out. Yeah, I got a chance to meet him at the museum. And I think he has some artwork hanging in the uh, museum right now. Yeah, he's an incredible artist. Okay. And we're lucky to have him in Columbus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to call uh, the finance director up. We've got a couple of departments, or the court at least, an elected official, two elected officials, that is, uh, probate court and sheriff's office for updates regarding uh, related to their budgets. Good afternoon. So, um, as the city manager mentioned, um, we have the um, probate court as well as the sheriff's office um, here today pursuant to ordinance 13-39. Um, for the probate court, um, well, in pursuant to ordinance 13-39, it says that uh, any department or elected office, um, if they are uh, projected or uh, expect to exceed their budget appropriations, they must come before this council and, and request additional appropriations. And so for the, for the probate court, um, due to, um, you know, some unexpected expenses re related to the guardian, guardian ad litem, um, expenses for the court. Um, the judge um, needs about $4,200 in additional appropriations. Um, he has submitted um, his listing of expenditures um, to, that he's requesting um, reimbursement for that are related to COVID. And we will include that information in the packet that we send up to the state as part of the reimbursement request. But right now, the uh, additional appropriations needed at this time is about $4,200. So the request for council will be additional appropriations for probate court in the amount of um, $4,200. Is there a motion and a second? OK, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. That's approved. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Judge Mark D'Antonio for his um, perseverance, his endurance, his commitment for staying here through it's 3 o'clock, actually, uh, but he's here. Uh, did you have something you want to say they've approved the $4,200, they may rescind it if you talk. I, I, I sat here all day. <laughs> um, actually, I enjoyed sitting here because I, I thought about the budget last Turn them, I, I, well, well, I, they, they'll turn it on for you. Okay. God, look at my hair. Um, I sat here all day. I actually enjoyed sitting and watching what I really do believe is local democracy in progress. Um, because I sat here all day, I think you guys are going to have to listen to me for a minute or two, if that's okay. Um, I want to thank you all for being, uh, for the opportunity to be here. I actually, believe it or not, support the ordinance that requires department heads and elected officials to appear um, in cases where there might be an overrun of our budget. Um, as Ms. Alexander said, 4,200 is the high number. I've been aggressive in how I think we can get reimbursements for some of that related to COVID-19 in the CARES Act. So really, without quibbling, it's somewhere between 36 and 4,200. Um, out of a budget of 563,500, uh, I think it's important, uh, really, but I think actually the role of council and city government is uh, the management to allocate scarce re tax resources among uh, various competing interests to serve the public good. Uh, even though the amount I'm talking about is 0.7 or 0.8% of one-tenth of my budget and 
If you break it down into reserve days, it's about 12 minutes. Uh, I think Council's duty to shine uh, daylight on budgets and make sure valuable resources are spent correctly is a public good. I want to assure you that the probate court's small budget overrun was used for essential functions that serve the public good. Um, guardian ad litems uh, fees, and there was a temp employee issue. Um, I need to allow regular, um, well, the temp employee was related to allowing regular staff to devote resources to the training needed to bring our case management software up to speed and up and running. And right now we are using, we're complete with the Tyler Odyssey project and using it. Um, but for having a little bit of time for the, I needed to put the resources of my staff into the training needed to make the system that the city knows all about and has spent a lot of money on work properly. Guardian ad litem fees are fees paid to persons whose job it is to fight for the best interest of people who's with severe mental illnesses or adult or minor guardianship, children, in other words, vulnerable people. Often guardian ad litems need uh, uh, to argue and fight for vulnerable individuals um, that do not have adequate family support to make those kind of arguments on those folks' behalfs. Uh, between, January, um, between January and March, we used uh, um, we used the temp employees between January and March. I'm also going to talk about the guardian ad litem stuff. Um, with the guardian ad litem fees, I have to have somebody that is being held at West Central Georgia Regional Hospital or the Bradley Center or is in outpatient commitment either while in the jail or with New Horizons or American Works, I have to make sure that their interests are represented. Um, so I had to make sure, I have no real choice but to appoint guardian ad litems and to give them an incentive to want to advocate for people. Um, based upon, um, well, as I said, that's why I had to do that. I do want to say as to the temp employee stuff based upon uh, beginning in May 18th, when we got back to work, I was able to, and I am able to now, conduct hearings uh, virtually with, uh, and paperlessly because my staff, while we were only doing essential functions in March through May, was able to scan all of the documents so I can now have a court hearing on my laptop at my home. Or I thought about, since I had a 3 o'clock hearing, I thought about maybe trying to do it here. Uh, my associate judge is covering it. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, I, I do sort of want to give you all also a little bit of an update about what's going on with the probate court because I have a feeling some of you are getting calls about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, in addition to Tyler Odyssey, the city purchased a different product called Tyler Eagle to manage my license, uh, my license software, basically. It's been much glitchier than Tyler Odyssey. Um, the reason, though, why we are moving forward with this Tyler Eagle product is it allows people that are applying for marriage licenses or gun permits to begin the process online. And that's something that's invaluable right now because it limits the amount of time the individual applying for the gun permit actually has to be in the office. And once we get through this pandemic, It'll also lead to more efficiency in terms of me being able to process people quicker. Um, having said that, uh, given the safety requirements for making sure my staff and applicants are, are safe, I've limited gun permit applications to 14 a day. Um, that's one every half hour that allows us not to have people bumping into each other. It allows people to clean up. As of yesterday, we're doing it on an appointment basis. My first available appointment is in January. I hate that. Uh, it's not acceptable, and I'm trying to figure out ways of perhaps trying to figure out how to process weapons carry renewals without folks actually having to physically come into the building. At 14 a day for 50 weeks a year, that's about 3,500 gun permits. That's the number we did in 2019. So I assume demand is up. Um, 
I'm using technology and everything I can to make it more efficient, but I thought that if anything, constituents might be upset about the fact that we are, what, four months out in terms of appointments. Um, when, as I said, but when the pandemic ends, hopefully we'll be able to move this forward quickly. I'm skipping most of what I had written out here, so that's why I'm <laughs> bouncing around a little bit. Figure brevity is the soul of wit at this point. Yes. Uh, well, anyway, while the, let me also tell you a couple other things about it. While the statewide public health emergency remains in place, um, gun permits do not expire on the day they say they expire through a governor's executive order, they last 120 more days. Um, I am committed to making sure no one that has a gun permit, uh, gun permit will expire, even if it means that I'm doing their gun permits at lunchtime. Um, in conclusion, uh, I accept them. Uh, um, I accepted, by the way, the mayor's proposal for the 2020 budget without challenging anything on it. In fact, um, before the pandemic this year, for when we were talking about the 2021 budget, I was thinking about asking for a 1 to 2 percent increase in my budget because I figured council and everyone else has enough on their plate. I abandoned my request for an increase in budget in FY 2021. So I think it's possible you're going to see me back here around this time next year for that 1 percent or so. I will tell you that I will, I didn't, as I said, want to quibble over under $5,000 in terms of everything else y'all had going on. I will tell you on the 2022 budget comes up, you will see me probably quibbling for that 1% or so. Again, thank you all for the opportunity to speak, uh, and I appreciate you all having me, and I do appreciate everything y'all are doing. Judge, thank you for what you're doing under adverse conditions. We appreciate it. Take care. <clears throat> And so the last um, office um, here today is the uh, sheriff's office. Again, pursuant to ordinance 13-39, um, there was an unexpected increase um, really in the last quarter for um, the outside inmate medical expenses, uh, resulting in the, the need of an additional $60,000 in uh, a, a budgeted appropriations. Um, just. Um, so you have some comparatives. Um, last year, the outside inmate medical costs uh, was over the budgeted amount, but still contained within the sheriff's um, budget, and that was about 238,000. Um, this year's outside medical inmate um, costs uh, were about $390,000. So it was about 230,000 over the budgeted amount. So um, the sheriff is in need of additional appropriations of about $60,000. Motion by uh, Councillor House, second by Councillor Crabb. Uh, any further discussion? Councillor uh, Thomas. Uh, Ms. Alexander, is this um, FY20 or? 20. It's 20. FY20. Last year's. Yes, ma'am. Budget. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And I do anticipate uh, that these overruns will be covered by other departmental um, budgets. So um, from a fund balance perspective, uh, there should be any negative impacts to the fund balance. In all likelihood, these overages will be co covered by departments that have stayed well below their um, FY20 budgets. Very good. There is a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Say aye. Anybody opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Sheriff, thank you. Sorry you had to wait so long. No. I promise I will be very, very brief. I, I just want to say I really appreciate everyone here and all the job that you've done, city manager, mayor, everyone. I've sat through the whole marathon session as well, and, and I really appreciate your diligence and the prayer over it that, that you're each led to do the right things, and, and I really believe that from each of you, and I just want to say I appreciate it. Just uh, wanted to touch on this for one second. We had, uh, as Miss Angelica said about $230,000 over in outside medical costs. Um, I remember one specific inmate with stage four breast cancer. These things cost money and, and unfortunately, you know, you just can't always foresee those type of things in the future. And medication costs rose this year. I think that to be prudent, that should be considered 
going forward as far as medical costs and things like that. But, but I appreciate your efforts, and I appreciate all that you've done for the sheriff's office. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, with that, <clears throat> Mayor and Council, uh, Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin will come with the final two uh, presentations. Uh, one will be brief. It's on. Um, I'm sorry, Councillor Thomas. Before we leave this, um, if I may, um, as the budget chair, I've had conversations with the city manager and with the finance director. Um, as you will recall, we had said we will come back the last um, council meeting in September, which is a work session and we will come back as the budget committee. And our uh, focus at that time will be on clearing up the um, ad delete list. It will not be, and please hear this, it will not be to add additional items to the budget. We'd said we'd come back in September because that would give us an opportunity to see where we ended last fiscal year and the first couple of months of the new fiscal year. I've asked uh, Ms. Alexander if she would send the counselors um, the copy of the ad delete list as it remained uh, when we finished up our budget. We will come back in September, the last um, business meeting in September, I think it's the 28th or 9th, um, to finish up that budget um, add delete list and then we had said we would come back in January that's mid-year mid-budget that's what we typically do if there are changes that need to be made to the budget and we had originally said we would come back in March to see if there were other things because of all of the uh, nuances of the of this year's um, fiscal year budget um, I'm inclined at this point not to do that, not to come back in March because um, at that point the mayor and the city manager um, and the department heads will be um, getting their budget for next fiscal year started and so forth. And I don't want us to um, overlap that and confuse that. So the last business meeting, the fifth business meeting of September, we will uh, have on the work agenda uh, as the city manager and I've discussed um, the ad delete list and that's that's all no no new uh, items at this point but and Miss Alexander will send you the ad delete list as it um, was finalized during the budget process I don't know Mr. City Manager if I think I've covered all of that, you all of, that we had talked with yes, about. Yes, you have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon again. Uh, I am here to just to share with you a, little pro, a new program that we're very excited to be able to uh, launch here. It's the CCG Quality Control Program. Uh, and uh, before I do, I can tell you that years ago, uh, the city manager and I would hire um, uh, checkers. These were silent checkers that we would put on metro buses uh, that would be the eyes and ears of us because we could not get on every route, every bus. So we would hire uh, these individuals who were from other transit systems. They had been bus operators and they knew what to look for and they would bring us back a report card on just how our system was doing. Well, this particular program is very similar to that. It's very similar in that uh, the, uh, if we can get the uh, presentation put up, please. But this program is very similar to, no, wrong one, quality control. Okay, this program, as they go ahead and get the technology up, uh, the 
G CCG uh, quality control team is designed to serve as quality control checkers for city services, facilities, amenities, city streets, city neighborhoods, uh, to ensure that what the city departments don't catch as they are out and about during their day-to-day -day business, this team will catch. Uh, the overview uh, in terms of this team, the, each member of the quality control team will ride wanna, hmm? yes just go ahead with it okay each member will ride the city streets on the weekends and turn in on the spot work orders through our 311 our Q alert system uh, portal for handling uh, they will also identify violations by citizens, businesses, property owners, such as the placement of illegal signage on the rights of way, selling on the rights of way without a permit, littering, illegal dumping, and much more. Now, they'll look at those things, they see that, and they will turn in those work orders to the appropriate department. Once it goes into the Q Alert system, that department will receive that so that they will then be able to go out and have uh, you know, that instant report of what they need to do come Monday morning in terms of uh, getting things going. The criteria and the requirements for uh, this program for these employees would be employees must be selected uh, by the department head and provided or they may must receive approval by their department head to be a part of this program and in good standing within the department. They may be full-time or permanent part-time employees. Uh, now this weekend work uh, cannot take the place of their regularly scheduled CCG work. So it cannot interfere with what they are paid to do on a day-to-day -day basis. We are looking for 10 team members to be a part of this program. And you will see why it's going to be important uh, for us to launch this program uh, right now because the next presentation is going to be talking about waste collection pickup. Uh, and this is going to certainly uh, be a part of that and to help with that. We will be looking to bring on eight people or ten people uh, and they will work uh, during the month and so we'll have two per weekend. Two individuals will work per weekend in various parts of the city uh, and they will do that uh, and then, of course, on the fifth weekend, they will work as needed. And so that's why we have 10, those 10, the, the additional two uh, that will work either on the fifth weekend and or be there in the event one of the other eight cannot work their particular weekend. So you'll have a person that will be able to rotate and stand in, uh, giving everybody an opportunity uh, to work this program. Um, the additional uh, requirements will be that we, of course, will provide these individuals with a cell phone and or an iPad to perform their required weekend work. And because we're only getting a set of that, they will be able to check out, uh, of course, this equipment the weekend or that Friday prior to uh, working their particular weekend, keeping in mind that each of them are working only one weekend per month. We will make pool cars available to them. Uh, if a pool car is not uh, available to them, then they will be able to utilize uh, at the uh, approval of their department, one of the departmental vehicles in order for them to do this weekend work. We're also going to equip, equip them with uh, shirts, CCG shirts, uh, and that must be worn while they're doing their weekend work because we want people to be able to readily identify who they are and who they represent. What we are asking of each of these in terms of deliverables, each of the quality control specialists, they're required to turn in not less than 10 work orders per hour or 60 per day. 120 per weekend within their designated work hour. We are not going to bring them on just to ride the city. The intent is for you to ride the city and if you to, to look for things. That means if you're going throughout city facilities, look uh, for anything that needs uh, to be taken care of. If that's high weeds, if that's uh, trash, if 
whatever it is, we need to know. Let us know what that is so that um, uh, we can get that work order in and get it taken care of. Uh, we are also going to be pulling management reports through our Q Alert system uh, to see exactly what has been turned in to ensure that each team member is doing their part in providing uh, and meeting the criteria of 60 work orders per day or 120 per weekend. And they will again remain in the rotation when they continue to meet the deliverables that we have outlined. So it's a great program that we're looking to launch and the hours will be um, well, we'll talk, but the, but the team members will rotate, as I indicated, and it will be Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Now, the annual program cost will be uh, annually less than $30,000. And as you can see, we will be paying each of them uh, $300 for the weekend, uh, which is $600 for two individuals for the weekend, but 300 individually. Uh, and then you see what the monthly cost is for 8 to 10, uh, because again, 10 will not be working in the entire month, but uh, 2 only on, as an ad needed, on an as-needed basis. Uh, the equipment cost, uh, and then of course we have the shirts, which comes all to less than uh, $30,000 annually, and the funding source for this will be the general fund contingency. What is the return on investment? What are we getting out of uh, launching this program to assist with um, just keeping our city uh, clean like it should be? This is a proactive approach to address the community cleanliness issues that we continue to hear not only from you each and every day, but from our citizens as well. It's an aggressive monitoring uh, method to identify and report areas of concern. It's a fresh set of eyes looking at issues from a citizen's standpoint. Again, having Big Brother watching out seven days a week. It also will see, we will also see an improved cleanliness level in the overall, uh, in our overall community in our neighborhoods and provide a quicker response and resolution by departments in getting matters taken care of. So that is the quality control program that we look to um, uh, to implement. Uh, at this point, we will, uh, you know, now go out. It will be an application process that we put out to uh, employees. Uh, they would have to apply. Then we will select those 10 candidates that will work with us and serve on the, very, on the inaugural uh, quality control program that the city has put out is putting out. And this is going to help us uh, to do those things that we know that um, in the next presentation you'll hear about and to make those things happen a little better. Yeah, Questions? I just, I just want to thank the city manager for putting this together. We talk a lot about some of the things and we see a lot of the emails from, from counselors uh, and we hear from, from the public. Uh, and we constantly talk about the need to try to really inspect what we expect and it's, it's, I mean, we're the largest city area-wise in the state of Georgia, 221 square miles. And, I mean, I, I understand what the citizens mean when they say it's not their job to let us know, but, but sometimes they'll hit a pothole and they'll keep on going. And these individuals, this is, this is the city manager, deputy city manager's way to try to start addressing these. It's just a, just a great, great idea, and I commend, commend you all for, for kicking it off. Councilor Huff? Great presentation. My only question is, can we help them find their 60 for the weekend? Yeah, you absolutely can. Yeah. Well, you're doing that now, so. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to know if we'd be able to have some type of contact and information or something. If we see something, we can call them over the weekend. Yeah, we, we well. can make sure we publish the cell number because it'll be a phone that will rotate from one to the other mm -hmm. each weekend. Uh, but certainly, I, you know, I, I, I hope that you uh, will, we expect them to ride every district every weekend. Uh, but if you got something uh, particular, uh, uh, you know, in particular that you would like for them to check out that's happening on the weekend. That's because, what I'm saying, because out riding. Weekend, yeah. you did, then you should let them, let us know. Okay. Uh, but, but they're... As Deputy City Manager Goodwin may have indicated, and the mayor, you know, 
and I'll use this as an example. You, you know, you ride down a street, and in the middle of a, um, on a main through fare, uh, there's a, a bumper from a car that was in an accident laying on the side of the road. Yeah. And you pass there a whole week and yeah. two weeks, yeah. and that bumper is still there because yeah. it's not on, in front of someone's house to be picked up. It's uh, in an area where I think maybe the garbage truck driver or a pick, uh, or one of our flatbeds think, well, it's not in front of someone's house, so I don't pick it up. They just keep riding Pretty past close. it. Well, this team is to go out, and when they see that, uh, they're to make something happen. I, and, and I've experienced with the deputy city manager, I talked to her about a, a bumper of a car that was in the middle of nowhere. And you know people are riding, our people are riding past it every day. Well, you tell them, but, you know, we, our teams have a tendency to be reactive and that they're going to do what we, the work orders say they should be going to do. I don't think that makes sense, but because when they're short staff and they, they, they're doing what they got to get to, it, it's like I, I expect a special enforcement officer to put, ride down the street and the wheat and the grass is overgrown by 18 inches to go ahead and stop and ride it up. But that's not what I got time to do. I've got 30 work orders. And they're not going to pay attention. These quality control people, when they ride past the 18 inches, they're going to ride it up. That's what they're expected to do. So they're going to be doing something that other employees are reactive to filling work orders and it's just like and I'll move on but if there's a junk ve vehicle in a driveway and the special enforcement officer is riding past it he has 35 40 work orders I'm not here for that car I'm here for my work orders I don't have time for that these people are supposed to ride down the street and see it and then they take a picture they put it in the queue alert and we're to go out and enforce it. That's the difference. So I wanted to be just kind of clear about part of what they're expected to do. Any questions about this? Doesn't appear to be. Okay. So we'll move on to the next topic of uh, waste management. Okay. The next topic, as uh, city managers indicated, is the waste and recycling collection update. If we can go ahead and uh, go to that presentation. Uh, and uh, let, let me start out with this just by saying that we have some great people who work in our public works department. Men and women, they do a, a, an awesome job. They have a hard task ahead of them. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, that, that's the, within the entire city government, the number one complaint is trash pickup. It's, 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 it's trash pickup. And, and, uh, and so this is something that they have to hear on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's not a whole lot that they can do uh, because of the constraints that they are under. So let me just start off by saying that currently we are two days behind uh, in yard waste pickup. Uh, Thursday routes have been completed. Today, on this day, we are working on Friday's routes. Uh, and so we're still, we're working to complete Friday's routes and have not yet got to the Monday's routes. Uh, we're not behind on household garbage or recycling. It's yard waste, inert materials that we are currently behind in. The normal work schedule for uh, our team is four 10-hour days per week. Uh, in the spring and summer, uh, of 2019 and uh, of course in this year, we had major storms that came through that hit our community. Uh, and we had in, in spring and summer of 2019, we had multiple storms that hit that uh, where we had to issue moratoriums uh, on tree for fee. And so there was a lot of storm damage that our folk had to deal with. Uh, and, and that continues even in 2019, although the moratorium has been lifted 
Some of our community residents are still putting things out as a result of that storm that they did not get to, could not get to, could not afford to, to get, get to, and now they perhaps are starting some of that. And so you see some of that debris out there, and they're able to start that now because of COVID, because they're at home. Many of them are at home with nothing else to do, and so now this is the cleanup period. And so they are cleaning. Even in April of 2020, we had uh, storms, uh, and so we are dealing with that on top of the multiple storms that we had in, uh, in, in 2019. And our teams have been working six days a week. They're typically off on Wednesdays. Wednesday is that day that they come, they bring the vehicles in for maintenance and just to kind of uh, take care of those kinds of matters. Well, they've not been able to do that because of uh, being behind, because of the storms, because of COVID. Uh, and we'll go through why some of these things are taking place. Um, and additional tonnage is being produced by the brush and the trees due to the storm, summer growth, they're pruning, uh, throwing things out, the grass clippings, more waste because people are at home. Some of the delays that we have uh, in getting and taking care of these things is our resources, which means our trucks, our grab ball repairs, aging fleets. We average about 20 garbage trucks down each and every day, down, that we don't have access to uh, because of the they're old, they are in need of serious repairs, and some we can't get parts to, but those are some things that we have to deal with. It is reality. Uh, we have an average of four to six of our grab all trucks down at any given time, and that's what we need to pick up the, the, the large loads of, of inert materials. Uh, and so uh, the, yard, the yard waste, that, that's that grab all that we use. We have employee absences and vacancies and vacations and illnesses, personal issues, and absolutely we've had several out as a result of COVID. We've had positives. We had those who've had to self-quarantine uh, because of them coming in contact with someone who was positive. And so that has been also an issue that we've had to deal with. Uh, inmate labor shortage. Uh, we know that the, the prison, uh, they're short, they have some empty beds right now, and so we're not able to get, particularly on a Friday, we have more of the issues uh, and not being able to get the number of inmates that we need in order to uh, take care of our, um, our services. Uh, we have, again, not only the shortage of the beds, which means they don't have enough inmates, but Fridays uh, in particular, you have more inmates that stay in uh, who are Muslim that take, of course, their 12 o'clock uh, prayer, and so they will not come out. Uh, we've had issues just uh, this past Friday, we were so short that we had to attempt to get inmates from our recycling center but the inmates refused. They would not get on the back of a garbage truck. So we have to go and pull those from the landfill. Uh, and of course, we've got to have them at the landfill as well in order to uh, take care of when those garbage trucks come in and to uh, take care of, of the mounds and, and the landfill. And so those are some of the constraints that they're working under. They're still doing what they have to do and they're trying, doing their best to make it happen. Um, right now, uh, we have 14 yard waste routes and 27 uh, household garbage routes. We have 10 bulk waste routes, and we always pull from those two to help subsidize for the household garbage pickup because uh, above all, that's the very first thing that we've got to take care of. Household garbage has to be taken care of. Uh, and the other things, of course, we do take care of, but number one is taking care of the household garbage. Uh, we, of course, as a result of some COVID constraints, we had to um, and stop picking up uh, the yard waste and the green bulk uh, back in April and um, uh, in May and, and, and June, and we kind of went back to taking care of it um, uh, as, as our numbers started decreasing at that time. And so we started back with the 
um, with the yard waste pickup on April the 27th, and then of course the non-green bulk on June the 1st. What we're focusing on right now uh, is making sure that we are able to, on every Wednesday and Saturday, we have our trucks that are out there uh, making sure that, that any left any household garbage that perhaps was not picked up or yard waste, recycling, bulk items uh, are picked up. And so that, those are the specific items, of course, all of our pickups that we're, we're looking at. Now, what we had been doing is asking for volunteer drivers to come in on Wednesdays and on Saturdays to assist with this. And what we were getting were just six to eight uh, drivers or 14 to 16 inmates that were actually coming in. Then, of course, the supervisor who would ride the route to see what was uh, missed or what was needing to be picked up and would alert the drivers. Well, as of uh, this week, I have mandated to them that it's not, we're no longer asking for volunteers. I need all drivers to come in starting Wednesday. That means all 27 of our drivers, all our trucks should be out there on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. Absolutely, we know that this is a burden for our employees uh, because everybody wants uh, the opportunity to have their day off. But the one thing that we cannot have is for our community to be in the position that it is in right now where there is stuff all over the place and continues to increase and for it to just kind of uh, pile up and then we're waiting uh, just doing the regular. And so we had to do something a little bit more aggressive. And so starting tomorrow, uh, you will see our full force out uh, and on Saturdays until we get it taken care of. Uh, and so that means, uh, again, all of the collection you should see, it should, should, should uh, be taken care of a little quicker. And then, of course, with this new program that we are going to be implementing on the quality control officers uh, or um, specialists that will be out there, they will assist us with um, getting some things called in that were perhaps typically missed. Uh, and um, so we're looking to get that started very soon as well. Some of the concerns that we have in terms of integrated waste uh, are, of course, we know, you know, that the garbage fee does not, call, does not cover the actual cost of services. That's something that we've got to deal with as a, uh, as a body. Uh, it's the inability to purchase or replace capital outlay equipment that is very, very much needed. We have, for instance, um, our grab-all truck. The oldest grab-all that we have is a 2005 that has 238,730 miles on it. Those are the kinds of uh, vehicles that we're dealing with day in and day out, and one of the reasons we can't keep them up. We do have uh, new. They have a, a few new as well. But again, when you think about the grab balls, the grab ball, grab ball is just like a, a small bus at Metro. It, it, the the, uh, the life, useful life is only seven years. And so we don't get a whole lot of use out of those. Once they start going down, they really start going down. Um, so those are, um, again, some of the concerns that we have. Uh, the North Columbus subdivisions continue to grow, increase, recycling participation continues to grow, and then, of course, the increase in um, green and non-green bulk tonnage. Other things are staff safety, which means just longer days, six days a week leads to driver exhaustion. They, they get tired. Uh, we do have a high driver turnover. Uh, inmate participation is down, as uh, reasons that I've indicated. Inmate requests to return to the prison by mid-afternoon just because of the high temperatures. And when they say they're sick or they got to go back, then that's someone that we don't have on the back of the truck to even finish that route out. And again, inmate exhaustion in the heat and then in the winter cold. So that's all the time and that's continuous. Some of the collection alternatives that we have right now, we do have several vendors uh, on contract 
uh, that uh, we are going to be looking at right now. We call on them for when we have storms and things such as that um, for emergency services. We're going to be contacting those so that they, we can get them now to assist us with yard waste. That's the big issue that we have. It's not recycling, it's not household garbage, but it's yard waste uh, that we have to augment. And so we're going to be uh, reaching out to those individuals, those companies, uh, and because this would absolutely be uh, a COVID expense just because of the number of people that we've had uh, that are out, um, as a, uh, that has, has been out over time as a result of COVID. And so we'll be looking at that. Uh, but that's what we're looking at to help us to augment those services. Again, some of the concerns and the solutions that we have uh, is, of course, because funding is not available, we've already mentioned that there are certain things that we cannot do, uh, but replacement of equipment for the landfill, the collections, the recycling center, uh, the uh, recycling center operations beyond uh, FY23. Of course, uh, that's when the contract comes up for renewal. Right now, the equipment belongs to Pratt, uh, and we've got to make some decisions on where we go from there. Uh, landfill closure, post closure, post closure cost. Uh, we just we we're not um, adequately funding that, and we know that. And again, the division growth does not match the uh, growth of the collection areas that continues. Some of the solutions is to look at options for um, sizing services to the garbage fee limitations. Not suggesting that, just throwing that out. Uh, increase the fees to match the current services and or implement a delicate balance of adjusting services and the fees. The residential housing growth, uh, if you look at this chart um, from 2015 to 2020, uh, the number of households that we have to service uh, and, um, and the growth of those uh, over, over time. You look in the last column, our, uh, our waste equipment operators, that number has not changed since uh, 2015 or even earlier, so 74. Uh, is what we have consistently been at. But of course, uh, over the last six years, as indicated on this chart, our households have increased by 555. Uh, again, these are new houses, new services uh, uh, that has an impact on uh, our resources and the services that we provide with the same few individuals. At this time, I'm going to call on Kyle McGee, the Assistant Director of Public Works, and he's going to walk you through uh, the current condition of our fleet and, um, and some other items here. Kyle? All right. Thank you, Deputy City Manager Ms. Goodwin. Um, one thing that uh, Ms. Goodwin mentioned at the beginning really caught me, and that was uh, the fact that waste collection receives the most complaints out of any other area area in the city and i've always attributed that to we 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 approach five or each home in the city five different times a week so more interaction with the citizen does more complaints but today i'm looking at it differently we consistently get the most complaints so i see the need for the greatest attention that we need to address and make this right. So um, picking up where she left off, I want to give the current condition of our fleet. As a broader picture, we'll get into the whole fleet and then we'll break it down individually by waste types. So we have 74 trucks. That includes garbage trucks, recycling trucks, yard waste trucks, and our grab all trucks. Um, as of last week, when we uh, assembled this presentation, we had 26 of those trucks that were unoperable. They were down for repair. The age of our fleet, um, we have 11 trucks over nine years old, or over nine years old, and those range from 10 years old to 15 years old. Um, as Ms. Goodwin stated, the, average, the optimal age for a truck when you need to start replacing it before it starts costing you more money uh, is seven years. We need to get rid of these trucks and get them out of our fleet after seven years. Um, our household garbage and recycling trucks, you may notice these pictures of these um, uh, crane carrier 
low entry bodies um, or or and the high uh, bodies and the crane carrier chassis. Most of these household garbage trucks were purchased in 2017, uh, part of that 29 truck emergency purchase that was done mid-year. Now these trucks, um, we don't have an issue with these trucks. They're they're pretty good, but get right now we have 10 of these trucks that are down. That's not to say they're aging. That's just to show you a newer truck still is down for repair because you have blinkers, you have hydraulic hoses, and those are seem like quick fixes, but when it take when you take it to a shop, it sits in line before it's even diagnosed. So the amount of strain we're putting on our um, our our shop is we've exceeded the capacity to keep up. And um, so this is an example of the new trucks. They still need work too. Our recycled trucks here, they're, um, they've probably got the, the, the worst end of the fleet right now, but they're, um, we have, I think, 11 out of 14 that are of age and are deemed for replacement at the moment. Uh, we have nine spare trucks. We need spares for when something goes in for an oil change or repair. We need to be able to jump in a truck and cover that route that day. So as a total fleet, we have 74 trucks and we had 26 deadline. We need 65 working trucks each day to pick up household garbage, recycling, yard waste, and bulk waste. So. If we have 74 trucks, 26 are on the deadline, we have nine spares, we're still 17 trucks short to complete our route um, in an effective manner. This is just an example of the spares. They're in bad shape, but we need them. I mean, you see them, they're duct taped together, but as long as it starts and it's safe, we're, we're getting out there and using it. Um, these, uh, we have a thermometer here in the picture shows we got several AC issues with these trucks and um, it's very dangerous when you get out there at this time of year with, when you have AC issues um, which leaves you with an option you can not do your job you can fail to pick up the garbage or you can turn your truck in and get the AC charged up so it'll last another day and then you'll have to get it charged up the next day. So these, and we've always encouraged our staff, we, we, we want to be on the safe side. We want to do what's right. But you can understand that there's that temptation out there, that when you're pushed to the limit, that you may take shortcuts here and there. And we don't want to put our staff in that position. Our grab all trucks, also known as knuckle boom trucks, to be clear, I'm sure everybody's familiar, but these, these are brush trucks. These are to get limbs and yard trimmings from the side of the road. They're different than our, um, our forestry knuckle boom trucks. They look very similar, but those are more robust to handle trees and things like that. We are forced to use these trucks to load trees when we have tree for fee situations and storms. They're not really designed for, for that. They're designed for limbs and, and that sort of thing. So they, they do take a lot of abuse. We have 12 of these trucks um, for the month of June and July. We were operating about six out of these 12 each day. And that's not just bulk yard waste. That's also bulk, uh, we call it non-green bulk. So your appliances and your furniture and your white goods and that sort of thing. These trucks cover the, the whole city. So that was only six of these covering the entire city. Uh, it would be ideal to have 14. Uh, so to break it down by waste type, you know, we have, um, we've mentioned we need to replace these trucks every seven years. Um, we have 12 of these garbage trucks that are not functional that are not ready to go we have 30 of the trucks 27 we run daily we have three spares 
ideally for growth in the city that we've experienced based on the, the table that you saw with the 500 additional homes that was added um, in the last three years. That's, a, that's another route. So when we say that, um, you know, we service 15 to 16,000 homes per day per waste type, that's 500 per truck. And we've added 500, so theoretically we need five, we need an each truck, uh, an additional truck for each waste type. Excuse me. So yeah, ideally, right now we would need 36 trucks. That would give two spares per 10 and we have a fleet of 10 trucks, and that way we would not uh, suffer any downtime. Um, recycling trucks, we have, uh, we, have, we have 12 trucks, and um, we need 14. Keep in mind that the three, I'm gonna go back, when we, when we started recycling and we increased our single stream recycling, we kind of stole three trucks and drivers from household garbage to put them on that recycling. And you see right here, our need is for three more. So nothing has really changed over the years. I mean, the need for it is still there. And so, uh, we have uh, four of these deadline. Uh, we need 18 trucks. That's for growth. Right now, we can't support expansion of our recycling program without additional trucks to pick up the recycling. So that's the situation we're in right now. Yard waste trucks, um, five. And just keep in mind when for the last few months, the, the trucks and the inmates that we talked about and the personnel issues and, and, and so many factors have just kind of led up to this point that we have taken yard waste personnel and trucks daily and recycled personnel and trucks and put those on garbage to finish garbage. So these, these are, and, and we've done that daily just to make that 27 uh, a full route. So uh, there's the more details on that. We, we need a, uh, additional trucks there. Bulk waste. Um, we have uh, 12 trucks. We need two more. And that's what I have on the condition of the fleet. I can answer any questions or... Chair, uh, when you mention shortcuts, not to put you on the spot, but uh, you mean we don't want to create a, an environment where they may miss the street sort of accidentally on purpose, or? No. No, what I'm saying is getting in a truck that's probably unsafe. Or, no, I get that. Or, okay. But I, just, I, I misunderstood. I thought you said you didn't want to create an environment where they had to make decisions on maybe taking shortcuts. I don't know if you meant the equipment or the actual pickup on the routes. I, I mean, putting themselves and, and the inmates in jeopardy by pushing them so far because we are struggling. That's what I meant by that. Well, you do a great job with a pretty outdated fleet, so we appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Crabb? Um, <clears throat> okay, so if I understand correctly, we have three divisions, the household garbage, the yard waste, and the recycling. Um, which I'm, I'm trying to think that maybe, um, have we looked into privatizing one or more of these divisions? Yes, I believe we did a, a proposal back in 2015 to look at the feasibility of privatizing collections for all, right. all collections. And I don't know why that study was done. I think it was just uh, as an option to compare our current system. Um, but yeah, I don't think it was anywhere close to what we do it for, so. Well, well, I, I understand that, but is, is it possible that 
by privatizing one of them, it would give us enough um, flexibility that the other two could thrive? Well, and, I, and let me just say, I, I've got staff looking at privatizing services right now um, for a number of reasons, and the mayor has talked about it a number of times. You know, we don't know that inmates are always going to be available uh, going forward. So and they're not reliable. Uh, yeah, and so we are looking at. Are you looking at it by each cap category? Household waste, yard waste. <clears throat> but but we are looking right what, now, and we've had discussion over the last couple of weeks about how we might contract that out. And in part, we want to because of. COVID-19 and how it has diminished our, our workforce that they're not at work. Um, other communities that I've talked to, other city managers, they are using um, additional resources, outside resources, because of COVID-19, and it is going to be a COVID-19 expense. And I think you just heard Deputy City Manager Goodwin mention that. But in addition to that, we want to determine the cost uh, of private service for a number of reasons. Um, we know that it may not always be there, but we want to know if the private sector, if, if, if we tr a transition from inmates to the private sector, what it would cost citizens. And then uh, we also uh, want to know, I've got them looking at if we transition from inmates to uh, the types of garbage trucks where it only requires a driver and it has the, um, like they do oh, yeah. in Phoenix City. Right. Yeah, that they don't have people in the back of the truck assisting. So we're looking at it several different ways. Okay. I just, I just see, well, people are still complaining that they can only get one so we pick up and I see with privatizing they'd have a choice. I know it probably couldn't be um, you know, as it's going to cost more for Absolutely. the citizens. Mm -hmm. um, but we're at a point where I think we're, you know, if we showed the citizens their two options, that maybe they would accept the fact that they we have to go up a little bit on. Um, our costs to them, and it's better than going to privatization. Yes. But um, at the same time, I think we have to present that to them. Yeah. So we will be coming back to you with those presentations. Okay. Thank tell, you, Mayor. Tell. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I wanted to. Uh, let the city manager and, and Ms. Goodwin know uh, Kyle and I have exchanged emails a couple of times about different areas not being picked up, whatever. Um, this, this gentleman emailed me last night following up uh, about a little after 9 o'clock, uh, following up on an email. So he is working hard. And my hat's off to you, Kyle. You do a phenomenal job, uh, great presentation, and I appreciate all you and your staff do to help help of the city and help us uh, when we respond to you for help. So thank you very much. And, and, and uh, Mayor, I will say too, uh, explain how, cause just like these quality control people that we're talking about working weekends, I know at Metro Transit they have what they call line supervisors and they are riding around and they're, they, they check to see if uh, the bus driver is where he or she is supposed to be on time or you can't be ahead of schedule but you can be behind schedule and if a bus breaks down they're riding around in vans and they'll stop and if there are only a few people they'll pick them up off the bus and get them to the next destination. So do you have something like quality control line supervisors that are riding streets and saying if they've missed something and being proactive at all? We do. We have our, our, each route has a supervisor, and that responsibility of that supervisor is to go around, follow that route, make sure 
each household is serviced. And also we have what we call a watch list. So if you have any special needs and um, we have, I, I know you're not gonna believe this, but we have customers that complain every single week. So we have them on the list to make sure that we uh, have taken care of them especially. They go around and, and they do that, but um, you know, they, they ensure that we can get done whatever we can get done in a day. Uh, if we don't, if the resources aren't there, obviously we can't, you know, ensure that we finish the route. But it is, it's their job to do everything we can to finish at so, the end of the day. So when a citizen calls in and say that they've missed my garbage last week and this week, and it goes to 311 and it goes out to you, what is the line supervisor doing about it? Um, they may contact with the citizen personally by phone or they'll show up and, and talk to the citizen face to face. Um, depending on the issue, we, we always want to get the facts. We want to give the citizen the benefit of the doubt, obviously, but well, we want to get the facts yeah. so we can better service their and, request. And, and I will say to the mayor and council, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't know how stretched line supervisors are, but, but, but I want to get to making it a policy that if a citizen calls in and say they missed picking up my garbage, that line supervisor is to go to that citizen's house and, and then figure out why they missed. Because when I get an email from a council member saying that they missed picking up my garbage two, three weeks in a row, and I've talked to 311 and, and, and somehow it didn't get resolved, that's concerning to the council member and it's concerning obviously to me and I know it is to you. So, you know, we'll talk more, but. but if I may. Sure. Um, we, we're working on a proposal right now. We're calling it a mobility technology package that we're, we're looking to outfit these trucks with cameras, front facing and rear facing, real time GPS that will answer those questions. Were we at did we go by the house? Was the can on the street? So we can we can have that real time fact checking um, to hold the citizens accountable as our drivers and inmates, and we'll have it all there um, at uh, at the hands of 311 and our staff to verify that what everybody's saying, us and the citizens, is is what happened. Yeah. So and I know there are situations, right and uh, you know it's just like in every area of work we've got and, and and we're citizens we've got good ones and we've got not so good when we got good employees we got bad employees Absolutely. Uh, and we figure it out but we know this has been tested that someone may call in and say you missed my garbage when they know that they put the trash out as they saw the garbage can the garbage truck turning the corner leaving the neighborhood mm -hmm. and so we have to deal with that and so we give them the benefit of the doubt we typically send a smaller pickup out and we get their trash or whatever mm -hmm. rather than go back. Right. So, but Mayor, we've got some things we got to work on. We need to get better. Uh, we've got to have better equipment. We've got to invest, but we've got to look at our options as um, Councilor Crabb has talked about and options that we might make available to citizens. But we uh, wanted to just kind of give you an update on the condition of equipment, the problems we're facing, uh, but the solution to trying to deal with uh, the, the current immediate issue, and that is working six days a week and, and um, just trying to stay caught up. But when you've got old equipment and you're working six days a week, you're making it worse on your old equipment. Well, you just it, it's important, I think, that council have an opportunity to see and that the public has an opportunity to see the stress and the strain that's being placed not only on our equipment, uh, but also on our personnel. Yes. And we can't continue at that pace for forever. That's right. And we're going to run into some problems. Yes. And you were just talking about the health of your employees. That's going to really become a critical issue if we don't alleviate some of that pressure. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Huff, I'm sorry. Senator Quick question. Um, are we still cutting the wood into four feet sizes to be picked up? when they clean up in their yards? Yes, if it is a tree for fee, it would need to be in four foot sections. Okay, yeah, I, I had a call yesterday on someone that had 
limbs to fall and they had some time to clean up and everything and they were saying that they were trying to tell them they needed to be charged for it but they've been told one time cut them up put them on the street next time they said they were going to be billed well well and, and we want to be clear if it is a tree that they cut down no it's, it's the limbs yeah if it's limbs that's fine we'll pick limbs up but okay but, but if you cut a tree down then it'll then, be then, then it's tree for fee okay yes unless we have a moratorium and we're out picking okay. up everything okay yes thank you uh, I think that's all the questions. And uh, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my agenda. I will say that we are working to um, get the legislative agenda list ready. We typically have our hometown connection around October. And so I wanted to just say to council members, if you've got some things that you want on the legislative agenda, uh, please go ahead and, and, and send those to Tiasha Johnson or to me. Um, and uh, we'll be following up with you regarding the legislative agenda each council meeting. All right. Thank you, sir. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I, too, wanted to thank Councilor Thompson on behalf of the clerk's office for your service to the community and as a member of council. So just thank you so much for what you have done and what you will continue to do in the community. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, for the clerk's office, for the clerk's agenda, item number one, are minutes of various board to be received? Motion to minutes be received. Is there a second? All right, second by Councilor House. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? That approved. Item two are board appointments. We have council appointments that are ready for confirmation on the Commission on International Relations and Cultural Liaison Encounters. Ms. Samantha Wooden was nominated to fill an unexpired term. She There's may be confirmed. Motion to confirm. Is there a second? Motion to second to confirm. Uh, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? It's confirmed. We have some upcoming board appointments. Animal Control Advisory Board, Board of Honor, Columbus Zion Works Convention and Trade Center Authority, Public Safety Advisory Commission, and the Uptown Facade Board. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, before I entertain a motion to adjourn, let me say once again to Councilor Thompson what a pleasure it's been and how grateful this community is that you have served. Would you like to say anything? Hit your button in the middle. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say that it has indeed been a pleasure and uh, I have literally learned so much and I do want to thank uh, the counselors, city manager, deputy city managers, and especially Tiasha Johnson for always answering the call uh, when I called her, especially about trash pickup. Uh, Mayor Henderson, thank you so much. I do want to say this, sitting on the outside looking in is totally different from sitting uh, on this council, and I want to say to the council that you all do an excellent job uh, considering uh, the community that we live in, and I do want to say to each of you, thank you so much for this opportunity to serve, and this is not the last you have seen of me. Well, thank, thank you, you for you. serving with so much class and dignity. We appreciate everything that you've done. Councilor Huff. And to Councilor Thompson, I can't see you over the screen. But thank you so much for your service. Uh, sometimes you uh, take this ride through life and you never know where you're going to end up. So we, we go back to high school days and uh, having the little rivalries between Hardaway and Kendrick and uh, all around town. And we've spoken over the years on different subject matters, but it's been a pleasure being in the same room, working with you. Wish you nothing but the best. Anything I can do to help, please let me know. And uh, now you can go out and have the people not to be so hard on us, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Councilor Allen. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just want to echo the comments, Valerie. Uh, thank you for uh, your professionalism and the, uh, the way you handle yourself here. You, you really you lifted us up, uh, gave a, improved our image to the public, and I appreciate the way you. I really enjoyed your prayers, uh, so thank you for that. Councilor Thomas. 
And, and uh, Councillor Thompson, I do want to say too, thank you so much, as Councillor Allen said, for your prayers. And just because you're not going to be sitting around this group uh, from now on, don't take us off your prayer list. Keep us right there and uh, uh, do that. And I would also say, um, I think that the councillor will agree with me that if you're in that district and you have not already voted, you have until 7 o'clock tonight to cast that vote for, uh, for your choice of councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, ma'am. Councillor Crabb? I'm going to miss you, girl. <laughs> Mr. City Manager. Uh, Mayor, I'd just like to join you and members of council, the clerk and city attorney to uh, say thank you to uh, Councilor Thompson. Uh, we indeed are going to miss you. I too will miss uh, your prayers. I'm with uh, Councilor Thomas, continue to pray for me. I need it. And um, we know that you're going to continue to do uh, great work uh, in the ministry and in the community. And so thank you for willing to, your willingness to give your time to, uh, in this civic uh, kind of way to serve the citizens of Columbus. Councilor House. Thank you for putting up with us and for helping us. We appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you elsewhere around the community. You, know, you always wonder if these words are sincere. This council has been here six hours and they're still taking up time to say thank you. They're sincere. <laughs> All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor, let's adjourn. <laughs>